The easy peasy way to quit pornography. Painlessly quit porn immediately without willpower or any sense of deprivation or sacrifice. This book is a rewritten adaptation of another book on addiction, Alan Carr's Easy Way to Stop Smoking, published in 1985. While every addiction and individual addict is different, the spirit of Carr's original work lives on in this book on pornography, that being the removal of fear. Regardless of what addiction you may be struggling with, the advice given here is invaluable to anyone who wants to retain true control over their mind and body. The purpose of this book is not to berate, dismiss, or patronize the user. On the contrary, it enlightens and inspires you to think critically about your addiction, in a way that seems rather natural after reading. Addiction is fear, a fear that drives the user to ignore the very reality of their addicted state. So by opening up this book, you've already taken an important step in at least considering the possibility that you may be addicted. Most of all, however, quitting is easy. The information about to be dispensed will only make you realize that sooner. In just a few chapters, you'll be excited to finally be free. Chapter 1. Introduction. Do not jump chapters. This open source book will enable you to stop using pornography immediately, painlessly, and permanently without willpower or any sense of deprivation or sacrifice. It won't place any judgment, embarrassment, or pressure to undergo painful measures. In fact, there's absolutely no need to cut down or reduce your usage whilst reading. Doing so is actually detrimental. You might be apprehensive about the very thought, or one of the millions actively attempting to quit. If so, perhaps what you've already read goes against everything you've ever been told, but ask yourself if what you've been told has worked. If it had, you wouldn't be reading this book at all. Perhaps you identify with the following questions. Do you spend far more time viewing porn than you originally intended? Are you unsuccessful in efforts to stop or limit your consumption of pornography? Has time spent viewing pornography interfered with or taken precedence over professional or personal commitments, hobbies, or relationships in your life? Do you go out of your way to keep your pornography consumption secret, like deleting your browser history or lying about viewing it? Has viewing pornography caused significant problems in intimate relationships? Do you experience a cycle of arousal and enjoyment before and during pornography consumption, followed by feelings of shame, guilt, and remorse after? Do you spend significant amounts of time thinking about pornography, even when not watching it? And has viewing pornography caused any other negative consequences in your personal or professional life, like missing work, poor performance, neglected relationships, or financial problems? If you're a porn user that depends on it for masturbation or sex at all and for any reason, all you need to do is read on. If you're here for a loved one, all you need to do is persuade them to read this book. But if unable to persuade them, read the book yourself. Understanding the method assists getting the message across and preventing your children from starting. Don't be fooled by the fact they don't have access to it now. All do before getting hooked. About the book. This book is a rewrite of a rewrite of Alan Carr's easy way to stop smoking for pornography. It's free and open source and licensed under the Creative Commons. Its success rests on the foundation that you do not jump chapters. When opening a combination lock, you have to put the numbers just in the right order. Addiction isn't any different. Personally, the original Google Sites version that wasn't written by the hack author Squared changed my life. If you're anything like most people, you discovered pornography when relatively young and have used it ever since. Until stumbling across the overwhelming yet somewhat censored literature warning of the dangers. Like myself, you've probably succeeded with streaks of various lengths, but have always eventually succumbed to illusory urges. I'm pleased to report this method works entirely different and has been the only method that has worked. Or perhaps you've been linked this book by a concerned party and are skeptical. Firstly, thank you for at least looking at it. This will be expanded upon shortly, but please briefly recall the first time you looked at pornography. Did you expect that you'd return to it for the rest of your life? According to my own informal studies on the matter, which includes pestering friends to read this book, Easy Peasy is equally as effective for the casual porn user as it is for the heavily addicted. It's not terribly long, with high chances of large gains, so I beg you to continue reading. The method described in this hack book is instantaneous, equally as effective for the heavy and casual user alike, causes no bad withdrawal pangs, needs no willpower, requires no shock treatment, aids, or gimmicks, won't cause you to replace the addiction with other addictions like overeating, smoking, or drinking, and most importantly, permanent. 
You might find that impossible to believe, but this sentiment is echoed by many people. And what follows is a set of quotes testifying the sentiment. I was addicted for 10 years. Those 10 years, I was crippled with depression, doubt, anxiety, and fear of my secret getting out. After every session, I hated myself, and after every porn died, I was back down the water slide in no time. However, this book helped me stop. I was always on the defensive against porn in the past. Now, after reading this book twice, I am on the offensive. Porn has no control over me and feels like a sad joke now. And that was posted by username Deep Newt. Here's another quote. A few days ago, I turned 20 years old. For the first time in a very long time, I spent my birthday free from the porn trap. And it's all thanks to this book that I haphazardly stumbled upon only a few months ago. Before that, I had spent so much time trying to quit through traditional means, and I experienced so much inner turmoil and labeled myself permanently as an addict. The book solved all of that for me, where I previously feared I had no control over myself, even when I had unknowingly already beaten the little monster, I could now find pride in realizing I don't need to be an addict anymore. I don't really have a reason for saying this, I just feel like I needed to put this down somewhere other than inside my head because it means so much to me. If you're reading this and are thinking about reading or recommending the book, take it from me that it works better than any other method out there. My biggest tip is to take notes, which sounds funny, but it really helped me solidify certain ideas. And that was posted by username suspicious underscore web underscore 4594. Section 1.1, warning. If you're expecting this book to scare you into quitting using various health issues users risk, which include sexual dysfunction, porn-induced erectile dysfunction, unreliable arousal, loss of interest in real sex partners, brain hyperfrontality, and the blinding accusation that it's a filthy, disgusting habit and that you are stupid, spineless, weak-willed jellyfish, you'll be sorely disappointed. Those tactics never help me to quit, and if they were going to help you, you'd have quit already. Conventional methods of quitting advocate using willpower, or porn diet substitution methods, like using once every n days and cutting down consumption. Some sites list peer-reviewed research about neurotransmitters and neuroplasticity, and while these sites are informative, many are aware of the health risks and choose to do nothing, though such material is typically avoided. Ultimately, they are equally ineffective because they don't actually remove the reasons for using porn. Turning something into a forbidden fruit is not how you treat addiction. This method, referred to as easy peasy, works differently. Some of the things about to be said might be difficult to believe, but by the time you finish the book, you'll not only believe them, you'll wonder how you could have ever been brainwashed into believing otherwise. There's a common misconception that we choose to watch pornography. Porn addicts, yes, addicts. No more choose to watch pornography than alcoholics choose to become alcoholics, than heroin addicts choose to become heroin addicts. It's true that we choose to boot up the laptop or smartphone, fire up the browser, and visit our favorite online harem. Occasionally, I choose to go to the cinema, but I certainly didn't choose to spend my whole life in a cinema theater. Originally, curiosity and human nature took me there. But I wouldn't have started had I known I'd become addicted, causing the decline in my health, happiness, and relationships. If only I'd heard about sexual dysfunction on my first visit to that porn site. Take a moment to reflect. Did you ever make the positive decision that you must or need pornography to masturbate, or that you should or must or need porn-induced fantasies to spice up sex with your wife or husband, or that at certain times in your life you couldn't enjoy a good night's sleep or perhaps even pass an evening after a hard day at work without surfing for pornography, or that you couldn't concentrate or handle stress without it? At what stage in your life did you decide that you needed porn, that you needed permanently, feeling insecure, even panic-stricken without pornography, without your online harem. Like every other pornography user, you've been lured into the most sinister and subtle trap that man and nature have ever combined to devise. There's not a person alive, whether a user themselves or not, that likes the thought of their children using pornography to cope or for pleasure. This means that all addicts wish they'd never started. That's unsurprising. No one needs pornography to enjoy life or cope with stress before they get hooked. At the same time, all users wish to continue to use. After all, nobody forces us to launch our browsers in cognito mode. Whether they understand the reason or not, it's only users that decide to knock on the doors of their online harems. If there were a magic button the user could press to wake up the following morning as if they'd never accessed their first tube site, the only addicts tomorrow would be young people still experimenting. The only thing that prevents us from quitting is fear. 
Fear caused by the belief that we'll have to survive an indeterminate period of misery, deprivation, and unsatisfied craving in order to be free from pornography. These fears spawn from irrational beliefs, both learned and acquired, which include masturbation or sex leading to orgasm is the only and most important thing in life. Porn is safer than real life sex because porn can't reject me. Porn is educative and useful. I'm entitled to a superior sexual experience. And more is always better. These irrational beliefs spawn irrational consequences when acted upon, which include worshipping and obsessing when a perfect 10 out of 10 beautiful person is found, perceiving yourself as a loser if you miss out on sex as if it's the most important thing in the human experience, holding out for a perfect 10, being excessively judgmental and critical of prospective wives or husbands, forcing yourself to have sex whether you want it or not, it's a fear that a night all by yourself will be miserable, spent fighting uncontrollable impulses. Fear that the night before exams will be a night from hell without pornography. Fear that we'll never be able to concentrate, handle stress, or be as confident without our little crutch, and that our personality and character will change. But most of all, fear that once an addict, always an addict. That we'll never be completely free, spending the rest of our lives craving the occasional porn-induced orgasm at odd times. If, as I did, you've already tried all the conventional ways to quit and have been through the misery and torture of the willpower method, you'll not only be affected by that fear, you'll be convinced that you can never quit. If you're apprehensive, panic-stricken, or feel that the time is not right for you to quit, let me assure you that your apprehension and panic is not relieved by the pornography, it's actually caused by it. You didn't decide to fall into the porn trap, but like all traps, it's designed to keep you captured. Ask yourself, when you first viewed those porn pictures and videos, did you decide to come back to view them as long as you live? Okay, so when will you quit? Tomorrow? Next year? Stop kidding yourself. The trap is designed to hold you for life. Why else do you think that all these other addicts don't quit before it kills their lives? I've referred to a magic button before. Easy peasy works just like that magic button. Now, let me make it quite clear, this method isn't magic, but for myself and others who found it so easy and enjoyable to quit, it sure feels like it. The warning is as follows. This is a chicken and egg situation. Every addict wants to quit and every addict can find it easy and enjoyable to quit. It's only fear that prevents users from attempting to quit. The single greatest gain you can have is to be rid of that fear, but you won't be free until you complete the book. On the contrary, your fear may actually increase as you continue reading, which might prevent you from finishing it. Take this comment from one woman. I've just finished reading Easy Peasy. I know that it's only been four days, but I feel so great. I know that I'll never need to use pornography again. I first started to read your book about five months ago. I got halfway through and then I panicked. I knew that if I went on reading, I would have to stop. Wasn't I silly? You didn't decide to fall into the trap, but be clear in your mind. You won't escape from it unless you make the affirmative decision to do so. You may already be straining at the leash to quit, or you may be apprehensive about the very thought, but either way, please bear in mind, you have nothing to lose. If at the end of the book you decide that you wish to continue to use porn for masturbation or sex, there's nothing to prevent you from doing so. You don't even have to cut down or stop using porn while reading the book, and remember, there is no shock treatment. On the contrary, I only have good news for you. Can you imagine how Andy Dufrance felt when he finally escaped from Shawshank Prison? That's how I felt when I escaped from the porn trap, and that's how the ex-users who've used Easy Peasy feel. By the end of the book, that's how you'll feel. Go for it. And finally, everyone can find it easy and enjoyable to quit, including you. All you have to do is read the rest of the book with an open mind. The more you understand, the easier it'll be. Even if you don't understand a single word, at least you can follow the instructions and you'll find it easy. Most importantly, you won't go through life moping for porn or feeling deprived, and by the end of the book, you, the only mystery you'll have will be why you did it for so long. With Easy Peasy, there are only two ways you can fail. The first way is a failure to carry out instructions. Some will find it annoying that the book is so dogmatic about certain recommendations, like not cutting down or using substitutes. I certainly don't deny that there are many who have succeeded in stopping using such ruses, but they succeeded in spite of and not because of them. Some people can make love standing on a hammock, but it isn't the easiest way. 
The numbers for opening the traps lock are in this book, but they need to be used in the correct order, going from one chapter to the next, and not skipping chapters. Secondly, we have the failure to understand. Don't take anything for granted. Question not only what you're being told in this book, but your own views and what society has told you about sex, internet pornography, and addiction. For example, those who believe that addiction is just a habit, ask yourself why other habits, some of which are enjoyable, are easy to break, while the habit that feels awful, costs energy, time, and virility is so difficult to break. Those that believe you enjoy pornography, ask yourself why other things that are infinitely more enjoyable you can take or leave. Why do you have to have porn? Panic setting in if you don't. Easy Peasy is about to give you the knowledge on how easy and enjoyable it is to quit pornography. Like many others, one of my greatest triumphs in life has been escaping the porn trap. There's no need to feel depressed. On the contrary, you're about to accomplish something that every user on the planet would love to achieve. Freedom. And remember, do not skip chapters. And some terms before we begin. The acronym PMO stands for the cycle of porn, masturbation, and orgasm. And the term online harem refers to websites hosting high-speed internet pornography. Section 1.2. Tips for reading and final minor notes. Don't read this book like a normal book. It's very short and you should be able to finish it within a couple of hours. Most people benefit from highlighting or taking notes and usually recommend rereading it a few times to fully solidify the lessons. Why the hack book? Well, because Alan Carr has long since passed away and the institution whose forums don't list internet pornography as one of the addictions they provide treatment for. I don't gain monetarily or otherwise. Throughout this book, myself, which is referring to the hack author squared, hack author, and Alan Carr will appear transparently in order to provide you with a unique, compelling method to easily and painlessly quit. And just a quick reminder, do not jump chapters. I'd wish you luck, but as you'll soon come to learn, you don't need it. Chapter 2. The Easy Method This book's objective is directing you into a new frame of mind. In contrast to the usual method of stopping, whereby you start off with the feeling of climbing Mount Everest and spend the next few weeks craving and feeling deprived, with this method you start right away with a feeling of elation, as if cured of a terrible disease. From then on, the further you go through life, the more you look at this period of time and wonder how you ever used any porn in the first place. You look at other porn users with pity as opposed to envy. Provided that you're not someone who had never become addicted, like if you're reading for someone else, or you've already quit, or are in the fasting days of a porn diet, it's essential to keep using pornography until you finish the book completely. Now, that may appear to be a contradiction, and this instruction to continue masturbating to pornography causes more objection than any other instruction, but as you read further, your desire to use it will gradually be reduced. And take this instruction seriously. Attempting to quit early right now will not benefit you. Many don't finish the book because they feel they have to give something up. Some of them even deliberately only read one line per day in order to postpone this evil event. Look at it this way. What have you got to lose? If you don't stop at the end of the book, you're no worse off than you are now. It's by definition a Pascal's wager, a bet taken where you have nothing to lose and high chances of large gains from winning. Incidentally, if you haven't watched pornography for a few days or weeks, but aren't sure whether you're a porn user, ex-user, or a non-user, then don't use pornography to masturbate whilst reading. In fact, you're already a non-user, but we have to let your brain catch up with your body. By the end of the book, you'll be a happy non-user. Easy Peasy is the complete opposite of the normal method, where one lists the considerable disadvantages of pornography and says, if only I can go long enough without pornography. Eventually the desire will go and I can enjoy life again, free of slavery. Now that is a logical way to go about it, with thousands stopping every day using that method. However, it's very difficult to succeed for the following reasons. First of all, stopping PMO, which is the cycle of pornography, masturbation, and orgasm, isn't the real problem. Every time you finish your session, you've stopped using it. You may have powerful reasons on the first day of your once and for porn diet to say, I don't want to use porn or even masturbate anymore. All users do, and their reasons are more powerful than you can possibly imagine. The real problem is day 2, 10, or 10,000, where in a weak moment you'll have just one peak and want another, and suddenly you're an addict again. Then, awareness of the health risks generates more fear, making it more difficult to stop. 
If you tell a user it's destroying their virility, and the first thing they'll do is reach out for something to search their dopamine, a cigarette, alcohol, or even firing up the browser to search for pornography. And all reasons for stopping actually make it harder. This is due to two reasons. First, we're continually being forced to give up our little friend or some prop, vice, or pleasure, whichever way the user perceives it. Second, these create a blind. We don't masturbate for the reasons we should stop. The real question is, why do we want or need to do it? With Easy Peasy, we initially forget the reasons we'd like to stop, face the porn problem, and ask ourselves the following questions. Number one, what is porn doing for me? Number two, am I actually enjoying it? And number three, do I really need to go through life sabotaging my mind and body? The beautiful truth is that all pornography does absolutely nothing for you whatsoever. Let me make this quite clear. It's not that the disadvantages of using pornography outweigh the advantages. It's that there are zero advantages to looking at pornography. Most users find it necessary to rationalize why they use it, but the reasons they come up with are all fallacies and illusions. First, we'll remove these fallacies and illusions. In fact, you'll soon realize there is nothing to give up. Not only that, but there are marvelous, positive gains from being a non-PMOer, with well-being and happiness only two of these gains. Once illusions that life will never be quite as enjoyable without porn are removed, realizing that not only is life just as enjoyable without it, but infinitely more so, and once feelings of being deprived or missing out are eradicated, we'll go back to reconsider increased well-being and happiness, and the dozens of other reasons for quitting pornography. These realizations will become positive additional aids to help you achieve what you really desire, enjoying your life free from the slavery of porn addiction. Chapter 3. Why is it difficult to stop? All users feel something evil has possessed them. In the early days, it's a simple question of, I will stop, just not today. Eventually, we progress to believing that we haven't got enough willpower to stop, or that there's something inherent in pornography that we must have in order to enjoy life. Porn addiction is like clawing our way out of a slippery pit. As we near the top, we see the sunshine, but we find ourselves sliding back down as our mood dips. Eventually, we open our browser and, as we masturbate, we feel awful. Ask a user, if you could go back to the time before you became hooked, with the knowledge that you have now, would you have started using pornography? No way, would be the reply. Ask the confirmed user, someone who defends internet pornography and doesn't believe it causes injury to the brain or downregulation of dopamine receptors, do you encourage your children to use pornography? No way, is again the reply. Porn is an extraordinary enigma. As said previously, the problem isn't explaining why it's easy to stop, it's explaining why it's difficult to stop. The real problem is explaining why anyone does it after getting insights on neurological damage. Part of the reason we start is because of all the other tens of millions already into it, yet all of these people wish they'd never started in the first place, telling us it's like living life in second year. We don't quite believe they're not enjoying it, as we associate it with freedom of being sex-educated and work hard to become hooked ourselves. We then spend the rest of our lives telling others not to do it and trying to kick the habit ourselves, often thinking we're unique in this. We also spend a significant proportion of our time feeling hopeless and miserable. Educating ourselves with a super normal makes us prefer and long for these cold images, even when warm, real ones are available. Through the constant surge and fall of dopamine induced by the PMO cycle, we sentence ourselves to a lifetime of isolation, irritability, anger, stress, fatigue, and sexual dysfunction. Using pornography with its absence of the best parts of sex and connection, we end up feeling miserable and guilty. In fact, reading about internet pornography's addictive and destructive capabilities here and on other sites makes us even more nervous and hopeless. What sort of hobby is it that when you're doing it, you wish you weren't, and when you aren't, you crave it. Users despise themselves every time they read about hyperfrontality and desensitization, every time they use behind their trusting wife or husband's back, and every time they can't bring themselves to exercise after a daytime session. An otherwise intelligent and rational human being spends all their days in contempt. But worst of all, what do users get from having to endure life with these awful black shadows at the back of their mind? Absolutely nothing. You might be thinking, that's all very well, I know this, but once you're hooked on these things, it's very difficult to stop. Okay, but why? Why is it difficult? Some say it's because of the powerful withdrawal symptoms. But as is soon come to learn, the actual withdrawal symptoms are very mild, in fact. 
And this is evident when you consider that many PMOers have lived and died without realizing they were addicts. Some say internet pornography is free, and hence humankind should claim this biological bonanza, but this is untrue. It's addictive and acts just like any other drug. Ask a user that swears they only enjoy erotica like Playboy magazines if they've ever crossed the line to unsafe porn. And if they're completely honest, they would confess the many times they'd rationalize crossing that line, rather than not using anything at all. Enjoyment has nothing to do with it either. I enjoy crayfish, but I never got to the point where I had to have crayfish every day. With other things in life, we enjoy them while we're doing them, but we don't sit around feeling deprived when we're not. Some say, it's educational. Okay, so how has it made you grow as a person? Oh, it's sexual satisfaction. So why does it isolate you and make you feel insatiable cravings? Oh, it's a feeling of release. Release from the stresses of real life? Okay, maybe for an hour before it all comes crashing back on you? And what stresses has it actually solved? Oh, it helps me sleep. So why can others sleep just fine without it? Many believe that pornography relieves boredom. But boredom is just a frame of mind. Porn will habituate you to novelty seeking in no time, causing you to become increasingly bored until you finally participate in that wild goose chase for just the right clip, becoming increasingly wired to seek anything that evokes novelty, strong emotion, and eventually, outrageous shock value. Some say they only do it because they're friends and everyone they know does it. If so, pray that your friends don't start cutting their heads off to cure a headache. Most users who think about it come to conclude that it's just a habit. This is not really an explanation, but having discounted all the usual, rational ones, it appears to be the only remaining excuse. Unfortunately, it's equally illogical. Every day of our lives, we change habits, some of them very enjoyable. We've been brainwashed to believe that PMO is a habit and that habits are difficult to break. But are habits really difficult to break? Drivers in the US are in the habit of driving on the right-hand side of the road, yet when traveling overseas, they break that habit with hardly any aggravation whatsoever. And when you get a new job, you take on a different routine, so your habits change. These may take some getting used to, but it's nothing like breaking a lifelong struggle with pornography addiction. We make and break habits every day of our lives, so why do we find it difficult to break a habit that makes us feel deprived when we don't have it, guilty when we do, and one that we would love to break anyway, when all we have to do is stop doing it? The answer is that porn isn't habit, it's addiction. That's why it appears to be so difficult to give up. Most users don't understand addiction and believe that they get some genuine pleasure or crutch from pornography. They believe that they're making a genuine sacrifice if they quit. The beautiful truth is that once you understand the true nature of porn addiction and the reasons why you use it, you'll stop doing it, just like that. Within three weeks, the only mystery will be why you found it necessary to use porn in the first place in as long for as you have, and why you can't persuade other users how nice it is not to be a PMOer. Section 3.1 The Sinister Trap Internet pornography is a subtle and sinister trap that man and nature have combined to devise. Some of us are even warned about the dangers, but we can't believe how we aren't enjoying it. But what gets us into it in the first place? Well, typically, it's free samples from amateurs and professionals who share. That's how the trap is sprung. If instead it warned us of the dangers of what we're getting into before even making the first peek, then the alarm bells would scream. But these bells don't scream. Perhaps it's the shocking nature of many clips that reassures our young minds that we'll never become hooked, thinking that because we don't enjoy them, we can stop whenever we want to. Or maybe the seeming innocence of soft material doesn't trigger any alarm bells, much like a skillful weavings that a con artist can play to direct our mind. As intelligent human beings, we'd then understand why half the adult population was systematically addicted to something cutting down our very potential to perform what we're viewing. Curiosity brings us closer to the doorstep of addiction, but we don't dare to click on the thumbnails we're glancing at, fearing they'll make us ill or send us down into a perilous and immoral pathway. And if we accidentally clicked on one, often our only desire is to get away from the page as soon as possible, while at the same time, desperately curious even more. Once the process has started, we are trapped. From now on, we spend the rest of our lives trying to understand why we do it, telling our children not to start, and at odd times, trying to escape ourselves. The trap is designed in such a way that we try and stop only due to an incident, whether sexual dysfunction, loss of a career or relationship, shortage of drive, or just plain feeling like a leper. As soon as we stop, we have more stress due to withdrawal pangs, and with the method we relied on to remove that stress now unavailable. Our resolve for quitting then proves to be shaky. 
After a few days of torture, we convince ourselves that we've picked the wrong time to quit, deciding that we'll wait for periods without stress, which, upon arriving, removes our reason for initially stopping. Of course, that period will never arrive fully, and we begin to believe that our lives tend to become more and more stressful. We leave the protection of our parents, the stresses of work introduced, homemaking, mortgages, buying shelter, and raising children. These begin to crowd our lives. But that's an illusion. The most stressful parts of any creature's life are actually early childhood and adolescence. We tend to confuse responsibility with stress. A user's life, like a drug addict's, automatically becomes more stressful because pornography doesn't relax or relieve stress, as some try to make us believe. It's just the reverse, causing us to become more stressed as we continue using, with every guilt-laden late-night aftermath piling more straw onto the camel's back. Even users who kick the habit, as most do one or more times throughout their lives, can lead perfectly happy, normal lives, yet suddenly become hooked again. Wandering into the pornographic maze, our minds become hazy, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to escape. Many do succeed, only to fall into the sinister trap at a later date. Solving the problem of porn addiction is a riddle. It is complex and difficult, but once you see the answer, it's simple and fun, and you wonder why you didn't think of that. Easy Peasy contains all the solutions to this puzzle, leading you out of the maze, never wandering in it again. All you have to do is follow every instruction to the letter. However, if you take a wrong turn by jumping chapters, or blaze through the book at lightning speed without carefully making a deliberate effort on your first time reading, then the rest of the instructions are pointless. Anyone can find it easy to stop, but we must first establish the facts. No, not facts designed to scare you, there's already more than enough information out there. If that was going to stop you, you'd have already stopped. But why do we find it difficult to stop? Answering this question requires us to know the real reason we're still using pornography, which boils down to two factors. These are nature and internet pornography, and societal brainwashing. Porn users are intelligent, rational human beings. They know they're taking enormous future risks, so they spend lots of time rationalizing their habit. But porn users in their hearts know they're fools, knowing they had no need to use porn before becoming hooked. Most remember that their first peak was a mix of revulsion and novel curiosity. Then they specialize in locating, filtering, and bookmarking sites, working hard to become hooked. Most annoyingly, in these people there's a sense that non-addicts, which includes most women, older guys, and people living in countries where high-speed internet pornography is unavailable, huh, aren't missing out on anything and finding the situation laughable. By dismantling these factors in the next chapters, you too will understand the sinister trap. Chapter 4. Nature Internet pornography works through hijacking natural reward mechanisms designed to keep you reproducing for as long as possible. Internet porn's instant and highly accessible form keeps the brain's reward mechanism producing dopamine for significantly longer than normally possible. Scientifically, this is called the Coolidge effect, which you might already be aware of. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter associated with feelings of wanting, with actual pleasure produced by opioids. More dopamine, more opioids, and more action. Without dopamine, actions like eating don't feel pleasurable and are completed, with high fat and sugar foods producing the highest chemical release. Dopamine is also released in response to novelty. With a seemingly infinite amount of pornography available, this floods the limbic system, which is your reward circuit, so the first time you see porn, you act, orgasming and triggering another flood of opioids. Incentivized to get as much dopamine as possible, the brain stores this as a script for easy recall and strengthens neural pathways through the release of a chemical called delta Fos B. Now the brain cells call up these pathways in response to cues like sexy commercials, alone time, stress, or even just feeling a little down and suddenly you're ready to take a ride on the water slide. Every time this is repeated, more delta Fos B is released, so the water slide is greased, alive, and easier to ride down the next time. The limbic system is a self-correcting system to trim the number of dopamine and opioid receptors when frequent and daily flooding of the dopamine is detected. Unfortunately, these receptors are also needed to keep us motivated to handle daily life stresses. Nominal amounts of dopamine produced by natural rewards simply don't compare to pornography and aren't as efficiently absorbed by the decreased receptors, leading you to feel more stressed and irritated than normal. This process is known as desensitization. In this cycle, you've crossed the red line and triggered emotions like guilt, disgust, embarrassment, anxiety, and fear. 
which in turn raise dopamine levels even higher and cause the brain to misinterpret these feelings as sexual arousal. As time passes, not only is the brain desensitized to previous clips it's seen, but also similar genres and shock level. The lower motivation triggers feelings of lower satisfaction, as your brain engages in constant rating, pushing you to find clips to satisfy the hunger. So you seek more novelty, clicking on the amateurish, shock-inducing clip on the homepage you confidently said you wouldn't on your first visit. And here's a quote by Khalil Gibran: "For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed." A fleeting feeling of security is all that's needed to get through a rough spot in life. But will your desensitized brain be able to catch that drop of distressor that a non-user's brain is able to use? Dopamine flooding acts like a quick-acting drug, failing quickly and inducing withdrawal pangs. Many users have the illusion these pangs are the terrible trauma they suffer when trying or being forced to stop. In fact, they're primarily mental, since the user is feeling deprived of their pleasure or prop. Section 4.1. The little monster. The actual chemical withdrawal from pornography is so subtle that most users have lived and died without even realizing they were drug addicts. Many users have a fear of drugs, yet that's exactly what they are: drug addicts. Fortunately, it's an easy drug to kick, but you first need to accept that you are indeed addicted. Withdrawal from pornography doesn't cause any physical pain and is merely an empty, restless feeling of something missing, which is why many believe it's something to do with sexual desire. Prolonged, this feeling becomes nervousness, insecurity, agitation, low confidence, and irritability. It's like a hunger for poison. Within seconds of engaging in a session, dopamine is supplied and the craving ends, resulting in a feeling of fulfillment as you whiz down the water slide. In the early days, withdrawal pangs and their subsequent relief are so slight we're unaware of them. When we become regular users, we believe it's because we've come to enjoyment or gotten into the habit. The truth being that we're already hooked, but we don't realize it. The little monster is already in our brains, so every once in a while we take trips down the water slide to feed it. All users begin seeking pornography for irrational reasons. The only reason why anybody continues using pornography, whether they're a casual or heavy user, is to feed that little monster. The whole conundrum is a series of cruel and confusing punishments. But perhaps the most pathetic aspect is a sense of enjoyment a user gets from a session, trying to get back to the sense of peace, tranquility, and confidence their body had before becoming hooked in the first place. Section 4.2: The Annoying Alarm. Do you know that feeling when a neighbor's home alarm has been ringing all day, or some other small, minor, persistent aggravation, then the noise suddenly stops? And marvelous feelings of peace and tranquility wash over you. This isn't really peace, but the ending of an aggravation. Before starting the next session, our bodies are complete, but then we begin forcing our brains to pump dopamine. And when we're done and it begins to leave, we suffer withdrawal pangs. These pangs aren't physical pain; they're merely empty feelings. We aren't even aware they exist, but it's like a dripping tap inside our bodies. Our rational minds don't understand it, but they don't need to. All we know is that we want pornography, and when we masturbate, the craving goes. However, the satisfaction is fleeting because in order to relieve the craving, more and more pornography is required. As soon as you orgasm, the craving starts again, and the trap continues to hold you. It's a feedback loop, unless you break it. The pornographic trap is similar to wearing tight shoes just to obtain the pleasure of taking them off. There are three primary reasons why users can't see it this way. However, number one, from birth we've been subjected to massive amounts of brainwashing, telling us that internet pornography is simply another modern development that replaced the print version of porn. This fallacy is packaged with the truth that masturbation isn't inherently naturally harmful. So why shouldn't we believe them? Second, because physical dopamine withdrawal involves no actual pain, merely an empty, insecure feeling inseparable from hunger and normal stress, this feeling manifests into a pornographic session, as those are the very times we tend to seek internet porn. We tend to regard this feeling as normal. And third, the primary reason users fail to see internet pornography in its true light is due to it working back to front. It's when you're not consuming that you suffer the empty feeling. Because the process of getting hooked is incredibly subtle and gradual in the early days, the empty feeling is regarded as normal and so isn't blamed on the previous session. The moment the browser is fired up and you begin your session, you get an immediate boost and become less nervous or more relaxed. So internet pornography magically gets the credit. 
This back-to-front reverse process makes all drugs difficult to kick. Imagine the state of panic of a heroin addict without any heroin. Now picture their utter joy when they can finally plunge a needle into their vein. People who aren't addicted to heroin don't suffer that panicked feeling. And the heroin doesn't relieve the feeling, it causes it. Similarly, non-users don't suffer empty feelings of needing internet pornography or panic when they're offline. Non-users can't understand how users possibly obtain pleasure from two-dimensional videos with muted sounds and abnormal body proportions. Eventually, users can't understand either. We talk about internet pornography being relaxing or satisfying, but how can you be satisfied unless you were dissatisfied in the first place? A non-user doesn't suffer from this unsatisfied state, completely relaxed after a no-sex state, while the user isn't until they've satisfied their little monster. Section 4.3 A Pleasure or a Crutch An important reminder. The main reason that users find it difficult to quit is due to the belief they're giving up a genuine pleasure or crutch. It is essential to understand that you're giving up absolutely nothing whatsoever. The best way to understand the subtleties of the porn trap is comparing it with eating. The habit of regular meals causes us to not feel hungry in between, only aware of hunger if the meal is delayed. There is no physical pain, just an empty, insecure feeling recognized as hunger. The process of satisfying our hunger is a very pleasant experience. Pornography appears to be almost identical, but it's not. Like hunger, there's no physical pain and the reward mechanisms behave in similar ways, but it's this similarity to eating that tricks the user into believing there's a genuine pleasure or crutch in pornography. Although eating and pornography appear to be very similar, in reality, they're exact opposites. First, you eat to survive and energize your life, whereas porn dims and cuts you down. Second, food genuinely tastes good and eating can be a genuinely pleasant experience that we enjoy throughout our lives. Pornography involves self-sabotaging the happiness receptors and thus destroys your chances to cope and feel happy. And finally, eating doesn't create hunger and genuinely relieves hunger, whereas the first porn session starts the craving for dopamine and each subsequent session. Far from relieving it, it ensures suffering for the rest of your life. Is eating a habit? If you think so, try breaking it completely. To describe eating as habit would be like describing breathing as habit. Both are essential to survival. It's true that people have the habit of satisfying their hunger at different times of varying types of food, but eating itself isn't a habit, and neither is pornography. The only reason a user fires up their browser is trying to end the empty feelings that the previous session created at different times with varying, escalating genres. On the internet, pornography is freely referred to as habit, and for convenience, easy peasy may refer to it as habit. However, be constantly aware that this porn is not habit. It's drug addiction. When we start to use pornography, we have to force ourselves to cope with it. Before we know it, we're escalating into increasingly bizarre and shocking pornography. The thrill is in the hunting, not the killing, with dopamine rapidly leaving the body after orgasm, explaining why users wish to edge, which means to delay orgasm, through flicking between multiple browser windows and tabs. Section 4.4 Crossing the Red Line as with any other drug, the body tends to develop immunity to the effects of the same old clips, our brain wanting more or something else. After short periods of watching the same clip, it ceases to completely relieve the withdrawal pangs the previous session created. There's a tug of war occurring in this porn paradise. You want to stay on the safe side of your red line, but your brain is asking you to click on the forbidden fruit clip. You feel better after engaging in this porn session, but you're more nervous and less relaxed than someone who'd never started, even though you're living in a supposed porn paradise. This position is even more ridiculous than wearing tight shoes because as you go through life, an ever-increasing amount of discomfort remains after taking the shoes off. Because the user knows the little monster has to be fed, they themselves decide the time, which tends to be on four types of occasions or a combination of them. First, we have boredom, or concentration, which are two complete opposites. And then we have stress and relaxation, which again are two complete opposites. Now what magic drug can suddenly reverse the very effect it had minutes before? The truth is that pornography neither relieves boredom and stress, nor promotes concentration and relaxation. If you think about it, what other types of occasions are there in our lives that do that, bar sleep? 
If you have ideas of toning down to other types of realistic or soft genres of pornography, please note that the content of this book applies to all pornography — print, webcams, pay-per-view, live shows, etc. The human body is the most sophisticated object on the planet, but no species, even the lowest amoeba or worm, survives without knowing the difference between food and poison. Through natural selection, our minds and bodies have developed techniques for rewarding actions that multiply and sustain humanity. They're not prepared for supernormal stimuli that are bigger, brighter, and edgier than anything found in nature, since even the most muted two-dimensional image causes us to become aroused. But repeatedly look at the same image, and you won't be. In real life, checks and balances ensure you do something else. But internet pornography has no such limiter, causing you to spend the rest of your life in a virtual harem. It is a fallacy that physically and mentally weak people become users, the lucky ones being those who found their first instance repulsive and are cursed for life. Alternatively, they aren't mentally prepared to go through the severe learning process of fighting to get themselves hooked, or fears of getting caught or not being technical enough to operate browser privacy settings. Perhaps the most tragic part of the whole business relates to teenagers, who are skilled in finding material and covering their tracks, and they're starting an increasing number. Enjoying internet pornography is an illusion, jumping from genre to genre, merely keeping our novelty monkey within the red line of safe pornography genres in order to get our dopamine fix. Like heroin addicts, all they're really enjoying is the ritual of relieving those pangs. Section 4.5 the high from the dance around the red line. Even with the one clip that's lingered on, users constantly teach themselves to filter out the bad and ugly portions of porn clips. Even if it's solo, they still filter on the body parts that appeal to them the most. In fact, some take pleasure in this dance around the red line, finding excuses to declare they like the soft stuff and are unaddicted to supernormal stimuli. But ask a user who believes they stick to a certain actor or genre, if you cannot get your normal brand of pornography and can only obtain an unsafe genre, do you stop masturbating? No way! A user will masturbate to anything. Escalating genres, differences in sex orientation, look-alike performers, dangerous settings, shocking relationships, anything to sate the little monster. To begin with, they taste awful, but given enough time, you'll learn to enjoy them. Users will seek empty fulfillment after having real sex, after a long workday, after fevers, after colds, after the flu, sore throats, and even during admittance in hospitals. Enjoyment has nothing to do with it. If sex is wanted, it makes no sense to be with your laptop. Some users find it alarming to realize that they're drug addicts and believe this will make it even more difficult to stop. In fact, this is good news for two important reasons. First, the reason why most continue using is because although we know that the disadvantages far outweigh the advantages, which don't even exist, we believe there's something in pornography that we actually enjoy, or that it acts like some sort of prop. We're under the illusion that after we stop, there will be a void, and that certain situations in our lives will never be quite the same. In fact, pornography not only provides nothing, but it actually subtracts. And second, although internet pornography is the most powerful trigger for novelty and sex-based dopamine flooding, because of the speed you become hooked, you're never badly hooked. The actual withdrawal pangs are so mild that most users have lived and died without realizing they've suffered them. Why is it then that many users find it so difficult to stop, going through months of torture and spending the rest of their lives pining for it at odd times? The answer is the second reason, brainwashing. The neurotransmitter addiction, the nature, is easy to cope with, with most users going for days without their online pornography, on business trips or travel, unaffected by withdrawal pangs. Their little monster is safe in the knowledge you'll open your laptop as soon as you return to your hotel room. You can survive your obnoxious client and your megalomaniac manager knowing the fix is there for your taking. Section 4.6 The Smoker's Analogy A good analogy is that of the cigarette smoker. If they went 10 hours of a day without a cigarette, they'd be tearing their hair out. But many smokers will buy a new car and refrain from smoking in it. They'll visit theaters, supermarkets, churches, and being unable to smoke there causes them no problems. Even on trains and airplanes, there have been no riots. Smokers are almost pleased for someone or something to stop them smoking. Users will actually refrain from using internet pornography in their parents' home during family gatherings and other events with little discomfort. In fact, 
Most uses have extended periods during which they abstain without effort. The neurological little monster is easy to cope with even when you're still addicted. There are millions of users who remain casual users all their lives, and they're just as addicted as the heavy user. There are even heavy users who have kicked the addiction but have an occasional peak, greasing the water slide to be ridden down at the next dip in mood. As said previously, the actual porn addiction isn't the main problem. It's simply acting as a catalyst to keeping our minds confused over the real problem, the brainwashing. Don't think the bad effects of internet pornography are exaggerated, however. If anything, they're sadly understated. Occasionally, rumors circulate that the neural pathways created are there for life, with the right mix of chance and stimulus sending you down the life-ruining water slide again, but these are untrue. Our brains and bodies are miraculous machines, recovering within a matter of weeks. It's never too late to stop. A quick browse of online communities will show you people of all ages changing their and their wife or husband's lives. As with anything, some do take it to the next level, practicing things like semen retention and caretza, and through differentiation of the sensory and propagative sides of sex, make their wives or husbands happier than ever before. It may be consolation to lifelong and heavy users that it's just as easy for them to stop as casual users, and in a peculiar way, it is easier. The further it drags you down, the greater the relief. When I stopped, I went straight to zero and didn't have a single bad pang. In fact, the process is actually enjoyable, even during the withdrawal period. But first, we must remove the brainwashing. Chapter 5. Brainwashing This is the second reason we start using. Understanding this brainwashing fully required us to first examine the powerful effects of supernormal stimulus, or the nature. Our brains simply aren't prepared for the creation of an online harem, allowing us to flick between more potential mates in 15 minutes than our ancestors had in several lifetimes. There's been much misguided advice in the past, one example being that masturbation led to blindness. This, along with other scare tactics, clearly overdid it. Misconceptions such as these were right to be overthrown, but the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater. From our earliest years, our subconscious minds are bombarded with sexual messages and imagery, magazines and advertisements loaded with innuendo. Some pop videos are extremely suggestive, but don't despair. Make it a game to identify what components they're using. Is it shock value, novelty, color, size, taboo, nostalgia, etc.? Such a game can even be taught to preteens as a way to educate them. At its core, the message propagated by these commercials and media is the most precious thing on this earth, my last thought and action will be orgasm. Is that exaggeration? Watch any TV or movie plot and you'll see the mix-up of the sensory, touch, smell, voice, and propagative, orgasmic parts of sex. The impact of this doesn't register on our conscious, but the subconscious has time to absorb it. Section 5.1 Scientific Reasoning There is publicity the other way. Sexual dysfunction scares, loss of motivation, preferring virtual porn to real girls, yourbrainonporn.com, and various internet subcultures. But these movements don't actually stop people from using. Logically speaking, they should, but the simple fact is they don't. Even the health risks listed on studies on yourbrain.porn.com aren't enough to stop an adolescent from starting. Ironically, the most powerful force in this confusion is the user themselves. It is a fallacy that users are weak-willed or physically weak people. You actually have to be physically strong in order to cope with an addiction after you know it exists. Perhaps the most painful aspect is that they place themselves as unsuccessful losers and insufferable introverts. It's likely that a friend could be more interesting in person if they hadn't put themselves down for seeking self-pleasure in their addiction. Here's an illustration of the porn trap. We begin with the brainwashing. A little monster narrates to us and says, Go on, you deserve it. Everyone does it. It's natural. You only get one life. You love it. Then the user proceeds to PMO and the monster says, You did it again, idiot. You have no self-control. Then, the user's dopamine drops, and the monster cries out to us, Feed me! And then, the user gets the urge to PMO. And the monster replies, You know how this goes. Just get on with it. You can stop after this last one. And then we return back to the brainwashing, and the cycle repeats over and over and over again. That's the trap. Section 5.2 Problems Using Willpower Users quitting using the willpower method blame their own lack of willpower and ruin their peace and happiness by doing so. 
It's one thing to fail in self-discipline, and another to self-loathe. After all, there's no law that requires you to be hard all the time before sexual activity, properly aroused and able to satisfy your wife or husband. We're working on an addiction, not a habit, and at no point do you argue with yourself to stop a habit like golfing, but to do the same with porn addiction is normalized. Why? Constant exposure to a super normal stimulus rewires your brain, so building a resistance to this brainwashing is critical, as if buying a car from a second-hand car dealer, nodding politely but not believing a word the man is saying. So don't believe that you must have as much sex as you can, all of it being exceptionally good, using pornography in its absence. Don't play the safe porn game either. Your little monster invented that game to lure you. Is amateur pornography certified by some kind of authority? Porn sites actually gather data from their users and use it to cater to their needs. And if they see an uptick in any category, they'll focus on it and get content out ASAP. Don't be fooled by educational intent or safe female marketed clips. Start asking yourself, why am I doing it? Do I really need to? No, of course you don't. Most users swear that they only watch static and soft pornography and therefore are fine, when in actuality they're straining at the leash, fighting with their willpower to resist temptations. If done too often and for too long, this depletes their willpower considerably, and they begin failing in other life projects where willpower is of great value, like exercise, dieting, etc. Failure in these areas makes them feel miserable and guilty, cascading into using pornography again. If this isn't done, they'll just vent their anger and depression onto loved ones. Once you become addicted to internet pornography, the brainwashing is increased. Your subconscious mind knows the little monster has to be fed, blocking everything else. It's fear that keeps people from quitting. Fear of that empty, insecure feeling they get when they stop flooding their brains with dopamine. Just because you're unaware of it doesn't mean it's not there. You don't have to understand it any more than a cat needs to understand where the hot water pipes are. The cat just knows that if it sits in a certain spot, it feels warm. Section 5.3. Passivity. The passivity of our minds and dependence on authority leading to brainwashing is the primary difficulty of giving up pornography. Our upbringing in society, reinforced by the brainwashing of our own addiction and combined with the most powerful, our friends, relatives, and colleagues. The phrase, giving up, is a classic example of the brainwashing, implying genuine sacrifice. The beautiful truth is there's nothing to give up. On the contrary, you'll be freeing yourself from a terrible disease and achieving marvelous positive gains. We'll begin by removing this brainwashing now, starting with no longer referring to giving up, but to stopping, quitting, or perhaps the true position, escaping. The only thing that persuades us to use initially is other people doing it and feeling that we're missing out. We work hard to become hooked, yet we never find what they've been missing. Every time we see another clip, it reassures us that there must be something in it, otherwise people wouldn't be doing it and the business wouldn't be so big. Even when they kick the habit, the ex-user feels they're being deprived when a discussion on a sexy entertainer, singer, or even a porn star comes up during parties or social functions. They think to themselves, they must be good if all my friends talk about them, right? Do they have free pictures online? They feel safe again, they'll just have one peek tonight and before they know it, they're hooked again. The brainwashing is extremely powerful and you need to be aware of its effects. Technology continues to grow and the future will bring exponentially faster sites and access methods. The porn industry is investing millions in virtual reality so that it will become the next best thing. We don't know where we're going, unequipped to deal with present technology or what is to come. We're about to remove this brainwashing. It isn't the non-user who's being deprived, but the user who is forfeiting a lifetime of health energy, wealth, peace of mind, confidence, courage, self-respect, happiness, and perhaps most importantly, freedom. What do they gain from these considerable sacrifices? Absolutely nothing. Apart from the illusion of trying to get back to the state of peace, tranquility, and confidence that the non-user always enjoys. Section 5.4, Withdrawal Pangs. As explained earlier, users believe they use porn for enjoyment, relaxation, or some sort of education. The actual reason is relief of withdrawal pangs. Our subconscious minds begin to learn that internet pornography and masturbation at certain times tends to be pleasurable. As we become increasingly hooked on the drug, the greater the need to relieve the withdrawal pangs becomes and the further the subtle trap drags you down. 
This process happens so slowly that you aren't even aware of it. Most young users don't realize they're addicted until attempting to stop, and even then, many won't admit it. Take this conversation a therapist had with hundreds of teenagers. The therapist asks, you realize that internet pornography is a drug, and the only reason why you're using it is that you can't stop. And the patient responds, Nonsense! I enjoy it. If I didn't, I would stop. So the therapist replies, Just stop for a week to prove to me that you can if you want to. And the patient replies, No need. I enjoy it. If I wanted to stop, I would. Then the therapist replies, Just stop for a week and prove to yourself that you aren't hooked. And so the patient says, What's the point? I enjoy it. As already stated, users tend to relieve their withdrawal pangs at times of stress, boredom, concentration, or combinations of these. In the following chapters, we'll target these aspects of the brainwashing. Chapter 6. Brainwashing Aspects The porn trap's big monster is bred through the culmination of many aspects, including societal forces, media portrayals, peers, and the user's own internal narrative. Failure to deconstruct these fallacies whilst using the willpower method eventually leads to feelings of deprivation, leading the user back into the trap. Deconstruction of the imagined value of porn is crucial for success and allows you to see where you're being robbed. Of importance to note is the link between brainwashing and fear. It's fear of feeling future withdrawal pangs that creates the pangs. Fear is the pang itself. Think about when you've had withdrawal symptoms like sweaty palms, shortness of breath, sleeping problems, and an inability to think straight. Now think of similar situations when you've had those feelings. Job interviews, nerves around an attractive person, public speaking, etc. These are the same anxious feeling that fear causes. Simply put, how could a physical drug still hook people months after stopping? It must be mentally correct. Section 6.1 Stress not only great tragedies in life, but also minor stresses drive users into the forbidden, unsafe area previously excluded. Stresses include socializing, phone calls, anxieties of the housewife with young children, and many others. Let's take phone calls as an example, particularly for a business person. Most calls aren't from satisfied customers or your boss congratulating you. There's some sort of aggravation. Coming home to mundane family life of kids screaming and their wife or husband's emotional demands causes the user, if they aren't already doing so, to fantasize about the relief of pornography promised that night. They unconsciously suffer withdrawal pangs, de-stressors weaken and unprepared for additional aggravation. Partially relieving the pangs at the same time as normal stress, the total is reduced and the user gets a temporary boost. The boost isn't an illusion. The user does genuinely feel better than before but they're more tense than they would be as a non-user. Now we're going to look at an example. The example isn't designed to shock you, easy peasy promises no such treatment, but is to emphasize that pornography destroys your nerves rather than relaxing them. Try to imagine getting to the stage where you're unable to be aroused, even with a very sexy and attractive partner. For a moment, pause and try to visualize life where a very lovely and charming person has to compete and fail with the virtual porn stars occupying your harem to get your attention. Imagine the frame of mind of a person who, when issued with that warning, continues using and dies without ever having real sex with this charming and willing person. It's easy to dismiss these people as weirdos or lunatics, but stories like these aren't fakes. This is what the awful novelty of the porn trap does to your brain. The more you go through life, the more courage is sapped and the more you're deluded into believing that pornography is doing the opposite. Have you ever been overtaken by panic when out of the blue the Wi-Fi stops working or is too slow? Non-users don't suffer from that, as internet pornography causes that feeling. As you go through life, it systematically destroys your nerve and courage, leaving Delta Phi speed to form powerful neural water slides in its wake, progressively destroying your ability to say no. By the stage where virility has been killed, the user believes pornography is their new partner and is unable to face life without it. Internet pornography is not relieving your nerves, it's slowly destroying them. One of the great gains of breaking the addiction is the return of your natural confidence and self-assurance. There's no need to rate yourself on your ability to satisfy someone sexually. This isn't freedom. But this freedom cannot be obtained by continuing to grease the dopamine water slide in ways that undercut your happiness and libido by repeating the same destructive behavior. Section 6.2 Boredom 
If you're like many people, as soon as you climb into bed, you're already on your favorite porn site, probably already forgetting until reminded. It's become second nature. Similarly, porn relieving boredom is another fallacy because boredom is a frame of mind, occurring when you've been deprived for a long time or are trying to cut down. The actual situation is this. When you're addicted to the supernormal pull of internet pornography and then try to abstain, it feels like there's something missing. If you have something to occupy your mind that isn't stressful, you can go for long periods of time without being bothered by the absence of the drug. However, when you're bored, there's nothing to take your mind off it, so you feed the monster. When you're indulging yourself and not trying to stop or cut down, even firing up private browsing becomes subconscious. The ritual is automatic. If the user tries to remember sessions during the last week, they're only able to remember a small proportion of them, like the very last one, or the session after a long abstinence. The truth being that pornography increases boredom indirectly, because orgasms make you feel lethargic and instead of undertaking an energetic activity, users tend to prefer lounging around, bored, and relieving their withdrawal pangs. Countering the brainwashing is important because users tend to view pornography when bored, our brains wired to interpret pornography as interesting. Similarly, we've also been brainwashed into believing that sex, even bad sex, aids relaxation. Now, it's a fact that when sad or under stress, couples want to have sex. In the absence of discrimination between tantric and propagative sex, watch how quickly you want to get away from each other after the mandatory orgasm is achieved. If the couple had just decided to hug, speak, or cuddle and go to sleep, they'd have felt relieved. Section 6.3 Concentration Masturbation and sex do not help concentration. When you're trying to concentrate, you automatically try to avoid distractions. Therefore, when a user wants to concentrate, they don't even think, automatically opening the browser, feeding the little monster, and partially ending the craving. They get on with the matter at hand, already forgetting that they viewed pornography. After years of dopamine flooding, the neurological changes affect abilities like accessing information, planning, and impulse control. You're also driven to provide novelty for the next session, as the same stuff no longer generates enough dopamine and opioids. So you'll have to roam the internet streets for novelty, fighting the pull to cross the line towards shocking material, which in turn generates more stress and leaves you unfulfilled after finishing. Concentration is also adversely affected as the dopamine receptors are cold due to natural tolerance to the large surges, reducing the benefit of smaller dopamine boosts from natural de-stressors. Your concentration and inspiration will be greatly boosted as the process is reduced. For many, it's the concentration aspect that prevents them from succeeding with the willpower method. They could put up with the irritability and bad temper, but the failure to concentrate on something difficult once their crutch is removed ruins many. The loss of concentration that users suffer when trying to escape isn't due to the absence of sex, let alone porn. You have mental blocks when you're addicted to something, and when you have a mental block, what do you do? You fire up the browser, which doesn't cure the block. So then what do you do? You do what you have to do, getting on with it just like non-users do. When you're a user, nothing is blamed on the cause. Users never have sexual dysfunction, just occasional downtime. The moment you stop using, everything that goes wrong is blamed on the reason you stopped. Now when you have a mental block, instead of just getting on with it, you begin to say, if only I could check my harem now, it would solve all my problems. You then begin to question your decision to quit and escape from the slavery. If you believe that pornography is a genuine aid to concentration, worrying about it will guarantee that you'll be unable to concentrate. Doubt, not the physical withdrawal pangs, creates the problem. Always remember, it's the user who suffers pangs, not non-users. Section 6.4 Relaxation Most users think that porn helps them to relax. It doesn't. The frantic search to get the fix in those dark alleys of the internet and the internal struggle of straining at the leash to cross the red line certainly doesn't sound like a very relaxing activity. As night rolls in after a trip to a new place or a long day, we sit down to relax, relieving our hunger, thirst, and are completely satisfied. The user is not, as they have another hunger to satisfy. Users think of pornography as the icing on the cake, but in actuality it's the little monster that needs feeding. The truth is, the addict can never be completely relaxed, and going through life, it gets exponentially worse. Take one online comment from an ex-user. I really believe that I had an evil demon in my makeup. I now know that I had. However, it wasn't some inherent flaw in my character, but the little porn monster that was creating the problem. During those times, I thought I had all the problems in the world. But when I look back on my life, I wonder where all the great stress was. In everything else in my life, I was in control. The only thing controlling me was the porn slavery.
Every time I hear porn addicts trying to justify their addiction, their message is, oh, it helps me to relax. Take the online account of a dad whose six-year-old son wanted to share his bed in the night after a scary movie, but the dad would refuse so that he could have his session in edge for hours. Here's another smoking analogy. A couple of years ago, adoption authorities threatened to prevent smokers from adopting children. A man rang up, irate. You're completely wrong, he said. I can remember when I was a child. If I had a conscientious matter to raise with my mother, I would wait until she lit a cigarette because she was more relaxed then. Why couldn't this man talk to his mother when she wasn't smoking a cigarette? Why are some users so stressed when they're not getting their fix, even after real sex? One story online details a man working in the advertising field having many beautiful women open for dates at any time, but he lost interest in taking them out for dinner because internet pornography was far easier, involved no restaurant spending, and had no possibility of a no from his date at the end of an evening. Why be bothered when his little monster keeps him craving the low-risk, high-reward scheme at his fingertips upon reaching home? Why are non-users completely relaxed then? Why are users not able to relax without a fix for a day or two? Read about the experience of a user taking the abstinence oath, and you'll notice the struggle with temptations. They're clearly not relaxed at all, when no longer allowed to have the only pleasure they are entitled to enjoy. They've forgotten what it's like to be completely relaxed, ignoring all the other wonderful pleasures of life. Porn can be likened to a fly being caught in a pitcher plant. To begin with, the fly is eating the nectar, but at some imperceptible stage, the plant begins to eat the fly. Isn't it time you climbed out of that plant? Section 6.5 Energy Most users are aware of the progressive effects that porn's novelty and escalation seeking has on their brain's reward and sexual systems. However, they aren't aware of the effect it has on their energy level. One of the porn trap subtleties is that the effects it has upon us, both physically and mentally, happen so gradually and imperceptibly that we remain unaware of them and instead regard them as normal. The effect is similar to that of bad eating habits. We look at people who are grossly overweight and wonder how they could have possibly allowed themselves to reach that state. But suppose that it happened overnight. You went to bed trim, rippling with muscles and not an ounce of fat in your body, and awoke to find yourself fat, bloated, and pot-bellied. Instead of waking up feeling fully rested and full of energy, you feel miserable, lethargic, and barely able to open your eyes. You would be panic-stricken, wondering what awful disease you had contracted overnight, and yet the disease is exactly the same. The fact it took you 20 years to arrive there is relevant. Pornography is just like that. If it were possible to immediately transfer your mind and body to give you a direct comparison to how you'd feel having stopped pornography for just three weeks, that's all it would take to convince you. You'd be asking yourself, would it really feel this good? Or what that really amounts to? Had I really sunk that low? You wouldn't just feel healthier with more energy, but sporting far more confidence and a heightened ability to concentrate. Lack of energy, tiredness, and everything related to it is nicely swept under the rug of getting older. Friends and colleagues who also live sedentary lifestyles further compound the normalization of this behavior. The belief that energy is the exclusive prerogative of children and teenagers and that old age begins in your 20s is another symptom of the brainwashing, as is being unaware of eating and exercise habits as a result of the compounding effects of dopamine desensitization. Shortly after stopping pornography, the foggy, muggy feeling will leave you. The point being, with pornography, you're always debiting your energy and, in that process, tampering with the chemistry of your limbic system. Unlike quitting smoking, where the return of your physical and mental health is only gradual, quitting pornography gives you excellent results from day one. Killing the little monster and closing the water slides takes a little bit of time, but recovering your reward center is nothing like the slow slide into the pit. If you're going through the trauma of the willpower method, any health or energy gains will be obliterated by the depression you'll be going through. Unfortunately, it's not possible for Easy Peasy to immediately transfer you into your mind in three weeks time, but you can. You know instinctively that what you're being told is correct. All you need to do is use your imagination. Section 6.6 .6, Social Night Sessions This is misinformation that seems to make sense, but doesn't. In order to control your appetite, will you eat at home before leaving to go to a restaurant or party? This is what you're doing with sessions before social nights, looking tired and not up to your best. The widespread adoption of pick-up techniques has introduced pressure to perform, pick up, and score. Attempting to drown your butterflies with pornography and substances will only make the problem worse in the long run.
Personally, I like a bit of anxiety to keep me focused and engaged, and tiring yourself out mentally and physically with orgasm isn't going to help. Social night porn is occasioned by two or more of our usual reasons for pleasure or prop seeking, social functions at their core being both stressful and relaxing. This might appear to be a contradiction, but any form of socialization can be stressful, even with friends, wanting to be yourself and completely relaxed. There's many occasions that have multiple factors present at one time. Take driving as an example, since after all, your life is at stake. Stressful, with concentration required for a sustained period of time. You need not be aware of these factors, your subconscious already receiving the message. By the same token, when finding yourself stuck in traffic jams or bored on long highway drives, the promise of a session upon reaching home occupies your mind. Another good example is going on a first date, your mind throwing out questions about the person you're about to meet. Then, if your enthusiasm starts to fade upon meeting the person in the flesh, you'll start to feel too relaxed, then guilty for feeling this way. The tug of war has started. I want sex or get me out of here as soon as possible, priming you for post-date pornography. Even if the date went well and hours later you're back at their place, no matter which way it goes, you won't be satisfied if your only goal is seeking orgasm. At other times, you drive home alone, your only thought being your online harem instead of congratulating yourself for your efforts. You can bet that someone in this position will have a session upon reaching home, and it's often after nights like these, the ones where you awake to feel uneasy emptiness, that you'll miss the most when you contemplate stopping pornography. We think that life will never be quite as enjoyable again. In fact, it's the same principle at work. The sessions simply provide relief from the withdrawal pangs, at some times having greater needs than others, greasing the water slide for the next cue. Make this clear, it's not internet pornography and harem dwellers that are special but it's the occasion. Once the need for pornography is removed, such occasions will become more enjoyable and stressful situations less stressful. Once you get rid of the brainwashing, you break the porn trap cycle and you reach freedom. Chapter seven, what am I giving up? Absolutely nothing. Pornography is difficult to give up because of the fear of being deprived of our pleasure or prop. The fear that certain pleasant situations will never be quite the same again. Fear you'll be left unable to cope with stressful situations. In other words, it's the effects of brainwashing deluding us into believing that sex, and by extension orgasm, is a must for all human beings. Even further, it's the belief that there's something inherent in internet pornography that we need, and that when we stop using we'll be denying ourselves and creating a void. Make this clear in your mind. Pornography doesn't fill a void, it creates one. Our bodies are the most sophisticated objects on the planet. Whether you believe in intelligent design, natural selection, or a combination of both, our bodies are thousands of times more effective than man. We're unable to create the smallest living cell or the miracles of eyesight, reproduction, and various interlinked systems that are present in our bodies or brains. If this creator or process had intended us to handle supernormal stimulus, we'd have been provided with different reward systems. Our bodies are provided with the fail-safe warning devices, and we ignore these at our own peril. Section 7.1. There's nothing to give up. Once you purge the little monster from your body and the brainwashing, or the big monster from your mind, you'll neither want to masturbate often nor use internet pornography for it. There are many knowns and unknowns when it comes to addiction, with many in the medical community having no concept of questioning or determining someone as a porn addict. A lot of reported symptoms are wrongly tagged under other causes. It's not that users are generally stupid people, it's just that they're miserable without pornography. They're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Either they're abstaining and being miserable because they can't use pornography, or they're miserable because they're guilty and begin despising themselves because of their use. When they get symptoms like low back pain or sexual dysfunction, their minds are torn between accepting responsibility and just looking the other way. Here's another smoking analogy. All of us have seen smokers who develop excuses to sneak off for a crafty puff, and there we see the true addiction in action. Addicts clearly don't do this for enjoyment. Instead, they do it because they're miserable without it. For many, their first sexual experience ended in an orgasm, so they acquired the belief that they can't enjoy sex without one. For men, pornography is even marketed as an aid towards sex, sometimes even as an education in confidence during the act. This is nonsense. The conditioning of supernormal stimulus only succeeds in bringing it down. Not only is there nothing to give up, but massive positive gains to be had. 
when users contemplate quitting. They tend to concentrate on health and virility. Now, these are valid and important reasons, but I personally believe the greatest gains are actually psychological. First, we have the return of your confidence and courage. Then we have the freedom from the slavery. And finally, we have no longer having awful black shadows at the back of our mind and despising ourselves. Section 7.2 Section 7.2 Void The Void The Beautiful Void Imagine having a cold sore or a rash on your face. So you go to the pharmacist and he gives you a free ointment to try. You put the ointment on and it disappears immediately. A week later it reappears, so you go back to the pharmacist and ask if they have any more ointment. The pharmacist says, sure, keep the tube, you might need it later. You apply the ointment and hey presto, the sore disappears once again. But every time the sore returns, it gets larger and more painful, with the interval getting shorter and shorter. Eventually, the sore covers your whole face and it's excruciatingly painful, and it's returning every half hour. Now you know the ointment will remove it temporarily, but you're very worried. Will the sore eventually spread over to your whole body? Will the interval disappear completely? You go to your doctor and they can't cure it, so you try other things, but nothing helps apart from this ointment. By now you're completely dependent on the ointment, never going out without ensuring that you have a tube on you. If you go abroad, you make sure you take several tubes with you. In addition to your worries about health, the pharmacist is charging you hundreds of dollars a tube. You have no choice but to pay up. You stumble across an article discussing this and find out it's not just happening to you. Many people all around the world are suffering from the same problem. In fact, the medical community has discovered that the ointment doesn't actually cure the sore and instead only takes it beneath the surface of the skin. It's the ointment that causes the sore to grow. So all you have to do to get rid of the sore is to stop using the ointment and it'll disappear in due course. Now, after hearing this, would you continue to use the ointment? Would it take willpower to not use the ointment? If you didn't believe the article, there might be a few days of apprehension, but once you realize the sore was beginning to get better, the need or desire to use the ointment would go. Would you be miserable? Of course you wouldn't. You had an awful problem, which you thought was incurable, but now you've found the solution. Even if it took a year for the sore to go away, each day as it improved, you'd think about how marvelous you felt. This is the magic of quitting pornography. The sore isn't the body pains, lack of normal lust, flagging arousal, fading penetration, the wasted time spent on two-dimensional images, feelings of infringement on entitlement, and despising the people who caught you, or even worse, despising yourself. These are all in addition to the sore. The sore makes us close our minds to all these things. It's the panic feeling of wanting a fix. Non-users don't suffer from that feeling. The worst thing we suffer is fear. The greatest gain being rid of that fear. It's caused by your first session, further strengthened and caused by each subsequent one. Some users are happy blinded by their cunning little monsters to go through this same nightmare, putting up phony arguments to try and justify their stupidity. But it's truly so nice to be free. Chapter 8 Saving Time Usually when users try stopping, the main reasons given are health, religion, and partner stigma. Part of the brainwashing of this awful drug is the sheer slavery of it. Man has fought hard to abolish slavery in many parts of the world, yet the user spends life suffering self-imposed slavery. They are oblivious to the fact that when they're allowed to use pornography, they wish they were a non-user. The only time that pornography becomes precious is when we're trying to cut down or abstain, or when abstinence is forced on us. It cannot be repeated often enough that brainwashing makes it difficult to stop pornography, so the more we dispel before we start, the easier you'll find it to achieve your goal. Confirmed users who don't believe that pornography has any negative effect on their health, which you know includes porn-induced erectile dysfunction, hyperfrontality, etc., and aren't having a mental tug-of-war, are typically younger or single with an occasional sex partner, thus the internal feedback is lost due to the nature of their youth, or is too infrequent to be observed and registered. A better argument for a younger user is the time spent, rather saying, I can't believe you aren't worried about the time you're spending. Generally, their eyes will light up, feeling disadvantaged if attacked on health grounds or social stigma, but on time, they have an answer. Oh, I can afford it. It's only X hours per week, and I think it's worth it. It's my only vice of pleasure. And then I respond, I still can't believe you're not worried. 
Let's assume a half hour daily average, which includes the physical drain of dopamine withdrawals, which means you'd be spending approximately a full working day every fortnight. And I'm sure you'd agree that half an hour a day is a very conservative estimate. Have you thought about how much time you'll spend in your lifetime? What are you doing in that time? Are you developing real relationships? No. Your favorite porn star doesn't have sympathy for you just because you spent so much time on her videos. You're throwing time away. Not only that, you're actually using that time to ruin your physical health, destroying your nerves and confidence in order to suffer a lifetime of slavery, pain, melancholy, and peevishness. Surely that must worry you, right? Now it's apparent at this point, especially with younger users, that they've never considered it a lifetime addiction. Occasionally, they work out the time they waste in a week, and that's alarming enough. Very occasionally, and only when they think of stopping, they'll estimate what they spend in a year, which is frightening. But over a lifetime is unthinkable. However, because we're in an argument, the confirmed user will impulsively say, I can afford it, it's only so much time a week, pulling an encyclopedia salesman routine on themselves. Would you refuse a job offer which pays your current annual salary and also gives you a month off every year? Any user would sign in a heartbeat and would get busy finding holidays to exotic locations. Figuring out how to spend a full month with no work would be the biggest problem to solve. In every discussion with a confirmed user, and please bear in mind that's not someone like yourself who plans to stop, nobody has ever taken me up on that offer. Why not? Often at this point, a confirmed user will say, look, I'm not really worried about the time aspect. If you're thinking along those lines, ask yourself why you aren't worried. Why in other aspects of your life will you go to great deals of trouble to save a few minutes here and there, but spend thousands of them killing your happiness and hanging the expense? Every other decision you make in your life will be the result of an analytical process of weighing up advantages and disadvantages to arrive at a rational decision. Now it may very well be the wrong decision, but at least it'll be the result of a rational deduction. Whenever any user weighs up the pros and cons of using internet pornography, the answer is a dozen times over. Stop using! You're a mug! Therefore, all users are using not because they want to or decide to, but because they can't stop. They have to use pornography, and so brainwash themselves, keeping their heads in the sand. Confirmed users should keep in mind that the situation will only get exponentially worse, with more studies coming out and more people talking about the ill effects of internet pornography. Today, it's non-medical people discussing the effects. Tomorrow, it'll be on your doctor's list of diagnostic tests. Gone are the days where the user can hide downtime behind work stress in their sex life. Your wife or husband is going to ask why you're on your laptop late at night. The poor user, already feeling wretched, now wants the ground to open up and swallow them. The strange thing is that though many of these users would pay good money for gym memberships and personal trainers to build muscles and look sculpted, there are many people in this group who will benefit from stopping a practice systematically destroying their brain's natural relaxation systems. This is because they're still thinking with the brainwashed mind of the user. Wipe the sand out of your eyes for a moment. Internet pornography is a chain reaction and a chain for life. And if you don't break that chain, you'll remain a user for the rest of your life. Estimate how much time you think you'll spend on pornography for the remainder of your existence. Obviously, the amount will vary from person to person, but let's assume it's a year and a half of work hours. Imagine if there were a check from the lottery for a year and a half of your salary lying on your carpet tomorrow. You'd be dancing with delight. So start dancing. You're about to start receiving those benefits. If you think this is a tricky way of seeing it, you're still kidding yourself. Work out how much time you would have saved if you'd never taken your first peek right at the very start. Shortly, you'll be making the decision to use your final session. Not yet, please remember the instructions. Remaining a non-user by not falling for the trap again. All you have to do to remain a non-user is not using pornography and avoiding just one peek. Remember, if you do, it'll cost you whatever your estimated salary gain will be. If you're mentoring someone for their pornography addiction, tell them that they know someone who refused a job offer that pays their current annual salary and also gives them a full month's worth of paid time off. When asked who that idiot is, tell them, you! It's kind of rude, but sometimes you need to get the point across in a less than polite way. Chapter 9. Health. This is the area where the brainwashing is the greatest with users, particularly the young and single, who think they're aware of the health risks but aren't. Many kid themselves by saying they are prepared to accept the consequences. 
If your internet router had a function that played an alarm tone with a warning when you hit a porn site saying, up until now you've gotten away with it, but if you stay another minute, your head will explode, would you have stayed? If you're in doubt about the answer, try walking up to a cliff, standing on the edge with your eyes closed, and imagine having the choice of either quitting pornography or walking up blindfolded. There's no doubt what your choice would be, but by burying your head in the sand and hoping that you'll wake up one morning and magically not want to watch pornography anymore, you accomplish nothing. Users cannot allow themselves to think of the health risks, because if they do, the addiction's illusory enjoyment goes. This explains why shock treatments are so ineffective in the first stages of quitting. It's only non-users who bring themselves to read about their destructive brain changes. Take this common conversation with users, especially younger ones. I say, why do you want to stop? And the user responds, I read in a pickup artist's blog that it's good to stop for four days to amp myself up. And so I respond, aren't you worried about the health risks? And the user says back, no, I could step under a bus tomorrow. And so I say, but would you deliberately step under a bus? And the user responds, of course not. And I say, do you not bother to look left and right when you cross the road? And the user says, of course I do. Exactly. They go through a lot of trouble not to step under a bus, and even then the odds are thousands to one against it actually happening, yet the user risks the near certainty of being crippled by their addiction and appears to be completely oblivious. Such is the power of the brainwashing. Internet pornography is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Isn't it strange that if we felt there were the slightest fault in an airplane, we wouldn't go up in it, even though the risks are actually a million to one? Yet we take more than one in four certainty with pornography and are apparently oblivious to it? What does the user get out of this? Absolutely nothing. Another common myth is depression or peevishness. Many younger people aren't worried about their health because they don't suffer any of the depression or melancholy. The depression or stress isn't the disease though, it's the symptom. Younger people in general don't feel the irritability or depression created due to their body's natural ability to produce more dopamine. As they age or their lives encounter serious setbacks, their already depleted resources are overworked and they'll experience full-blown symptoms. When older users feel stressed, depressed, or irritated, it's because nature's fail-safe mechanisms are protecting the nervous system from excessive dopamine flooding through trimming receptors. The user also develops other neurological changes to keep them in the rut. Think of it this way. If you had a nice car and allowed it to rust without doing anything about it, that would be pretty stupid it would quickly become an immovable heap of rust, incapable of transporting you anywhere. However, it wouldn't be the end of the world, because it's a car, it's only a question of money. But your body is the vehicle that carries you through life. We all say that our health is our greatest asset. Ask any sick millionaire. Most of us can look back on an illness or accident in our lives where we prayed to get better. By being a porn user, you're not only letting the rust get in and doing nothing about it, you're systematically destroying the one vehicle used to go through your entire life. Wise up. You don't have to do this. Remember, this is doing absolutely nothing for you. Just for a moment, take your head out of the sand and ask yourself that if you knew with certainty that your next session would start a process that would make you utterly unresponsive to someone you deeply love, would you continue using? Speaking to the people this happens to, they certainly didn't expect it would happen to them either. And the worst thing isn't the disease itself, but the knowledge that they've brought it upon themselves. Try to imagine how people who've hit the button feel. For them, the brainwashing has ended. They spend the remainder of their lives thinking, why did I kid myself for so long that I needed to masturbate to internet pornography? If only I had the chance to go back. Stop kidding yourself. You have that chance. It's a chain reaction. If you engage in the next porn session, it'll lead you to the next one and the next. It's already happening to you. Easy Peasy promises no shock treatment, so if you've already decided that you're going to stop, the following won't be shocking for you. If you haven't, skip the remainder of this chapter and come back to it once you've read the rest of the book. <clears throat> volumes upon volumes of research have already been written about the damage internet pornography causes to our sex lives and mental well-being. The trouble is that, until deciding to stop, the user doesn't want to know. Forums and mentor groups are a waste of time because porn puts the blinders on. If inadvertently read, the first thing the user does is open their favorite tube site. 
Porn users tend to think of the happiness, stress, and sex hazard as a hit and miss affair, like stepping on a landmine. But get it into your head, it's already happening. Every single time you open your porn site, you're triggering dopamine flooding and opioids getting to work. The neural water slides are greased and the ride takes you smoothly through the next steps, your brain having already given in to the script. The nervous system is now flooded by dopamine and since it's the umpteenth time, dopamine receptors close up and the little monster uses this slight dip in pleasure compared to the last time to drive you further over the red line to more shocking pornography or behavior in order to release more dopamine. More novelty, more dopamine, and the little monster tells you to keep going. So many pictures and videos in a single session triggers a super normal stimulus, injecting more chemicals into the brain and driving you to continue. The entire time, your receptors are receiving information to shut down in response to the flooding. Orgasm only increases this effect and leads to withdrawal. You're in denial, since the little monster craves its fix with no real pain and discomfort. The threat of having erectile dysfunction terrifies many, which is why they block it from their mind and overshadow it with the fear of stopping. It's not that the fear is greater, but quitting today is immediate. Why look on the negative side? Perhaps it won't happen, having bound to have quit by then anyway. We tend to think of pornography as a tug of war. On one side is fear. It's unhealthy, filthy, and enslaving. And on the other side are the positives. It's my pleasure, my friend, my crutch. It never seems to occur to us that this side is also fear. It's not that we enjoy pornography, it's that we tend to be miserable without it. Heroin addicts deprived of heroin go through misery, but picture the utter joy when they're finally allowed to plunge a needle into their vein and end that terrible craving. Okay, now try to imagine how anyone could actually believe they get pleasure from sticking a hypodermic syringe into a vein. Non-heroin addicts don't suffer that panic feeling, and heroin doesn't relieve the feeling, it causes it. Non-users don't feel miserable if they aren't allowed to use pornography. It's only users that suffer that feeling. Internet pornography doesn't relieve that feeling, it causes it. The fear of the negative consequences doesn't help users quit either, because they liken the feeling to walking through a minefield. If you get away with it, fine, but if you were unlucky, you stepped on a mine and faced the consequences. If you knew the risks and were prepared to take them, what did it have to do with anyone else? Addicts in this state typically develop the following evasive tactics. Oh, you'll eventually get old and lose your sexual prowess anyway. Of course you do, but sexual prowess isn't the point. We're talking about mental slavery here. Even if that's the case, is that a logical reason for deliberately cutting yourself short? Oh, quality of life is more important than just living. Exactly! Are you suggesting that the quality of life of an addict is greater than someone who isn't addicted? Do you really believe that the quality of a user's life is better than non-users? A life spent covering their head in the sand and being miserable certainly doesn't sound like a pleasant one. Oh, I'm single and not planning to settle down in the future, so why not? Even if that preposterous statement were true, is that a logical reason for playing with neurological impulse control mechanisms? Can you possibly conceive of anyone being stupid enough to strip naked whenever they're alone, regardless of how sure they aren't expecting anyone? That's what porn users effectively do. Progressive gunging up of our reward circuits with excessive stimulation and making them incapable of handling normal stresses of life doesn't help in enjoying your life with enthusiasm and vigor. Pornography and masturbation has replaced the natural sexual appetite, like a chocolate bar replacing real food. Unsurprisingly, many doctors and psychologists are now relating various mental health problems to physiological causes. The mainstream medical community has labored that pornography has never been scientifically proven to be the direct cause of the issues reported by self-confessing individuals. But admitting one's sexual inability in public is such a shame-triggering event, so why would anyone do so unless they were really concerned, having found the cause and eliminated it from their own lives? Easy peasy will help you get rid of pornography and become a happy ex-users. No pornography, no porn-aided masturbation, no unnecessary orgasms. The only aid will be the touch, sight, and scent of your wife or husband. Like whole grain bread after a well-developed appetite, you'll no longer want the high fructose corn syrup of internet pornography. There's evidence so overwhelming that it needs no proof. When I bang my thumb with a hammer, it hurts. 
It need not be proven. The stress of internet pornography has flow-on effects onto other aspects of the user's life, predisposing many to turn to drugs like cigarettes and alcohol to cope, and in some instances, even turning the host to consider suicide. Users also suffer illusions that the ill effects of pornography are overstated. The reverse is the case. There is no doubt that internet pornography is the major cause of sexual dysfunction and many other problems. How many divorces do you think have been caused by pornography? There are no reliable ways to know, but searches of online communities suggest the number is growing exponentially. Now, there's an episode of the TV show Friends where the guys who were receiving continuous free pornography on television started to wonder why the pizza delivery girl didn't ask to check out their big bedroom. When you're addicted, you invariably project pornographic fantasies onto real women. Imagine what careless or even accidental exposure on the darker sides of the internet might do to someone already at a tipping point in their life. Fighting against these porn-induced thoughts will be a major drain on their mental health. Effects of the brainwashing makes us tend to think like the man who, having fallen off in a hundred-story building, is quoted saying as he whizzes past the 50th floor, So far, so good. We think that we've gotten away with it so far. One more porn session won't make the difference. See it another way. The habit is a continuous chain for life, and each session creates the need for the next. When you start the habit, you light a fuse. The trouble is, you don't know how long the fuse is. Every time you get into a porn session, you're one step closer to the bomb exploding. How will you know if it's the next one? Section 9.1 Section 9.1 Sinister Black Shadows Users find it very difficult to believe that internet pornography actually causes those insecure feelings when you're out late at night after a conscientious day at work. Non-users don't suffer from that feeling. It's pornography that causes it. Another of the great joys of quitting pornography is the freedom from the sinister black shadows at the back of our minds. All users know they're fools to close their minds from the ill effects of pornography. For most of our lives, it's automatic. The black shadows are always lurking in our subconscious minds, just below the surface. Several of the most marvelous benefits of quitting are conscious, like the ending of the waste of time and the sheer stupidity of making love to a two-dimensional image. The last chapters have dealt with the considerable advantages of being a non-user. But, in the interest of fairness, it's necessary to give a balanced account. Therefore, the next chapter lists the advantages of being a user. <clears throat> chapter 10. Advantages of being a porn user. Chapter 11. The Willpower Method. It's an accepted fact in society that it's very difficult to stop pornography. Books and forums advising you on how to stop usually start off by telling you how hard it is. The truth is that it's ridiculously easy. And while it's understandable to question that statement, first, just consider it. If your aim is to run a mile in four minutes, now that's difficult, and you'll have to undergo years of hard training, and even then possibly being physically incapable of doing it. However, all you have to do to stop pornography is to not watch it and or masturbate anymore. Nobody forces you to masturbate apart from yourself, and unlike food or water, it isn't needed for survival. So if you want to stop doing it, why should it be difficult? In fact, it isn't. It's users who make it difficult for themselves through use of willpower or any method that forces the user to feel like they're making some sort of sacrifice. Let's consider these methods. We don't decide to become users. We merely experiment with porn magazines or websites and because they're awful, that's right, awful, apart from our desired clip, we're convinced that we can stop whenever we want to. At first, we watch those first few clips when we want to and on special occasions. But before we realize it, we're not only visiting those sites regularly and masturbating when we want to, we're masturbating to them daily. Pornography has become part of our lives, ensuring we require an internet connection wherever we go. We then believe we're entitled to love, sex, orgasm, and the stress-relieving properties of pornography. It doesn't seem to occur to us that the same clip and actors don't provide us with the same degree of arousal, and we begin fighting against the red line in order to avoid bad porn. In fact, masturbation and internet pornography neither improves our sex lives nor reduces stress. It's merely that users believe they can't enjoy life or handle stress without it. 
It usually takes a long time to realize that we're hooked, because we suffer from the illusion that users watch pornography because they enjoy it, and not because they need to. When we're not enjoying pornography, which is something we can only do when novelty, shock, or escalation is added, we're under the illusion that we can stop whenever. This is a confidence trap. Oh, I don't enjoy pornography, so I can stop when I want to. Only you never seem to want to stop. It's usually not until we actually try to stop that we realize a problem exists. The first attempts are generally early, triggered by meeting a partner and noticing they aren't quite enough after initial dates. Another common reason is noticing health effects present in daily life. Regardless of reason, the user always waits for a stressful situation, whether health or sex. As soon as they stop, the little monster begins to get hungry. The user then wants something to pump their dopamine, like cigarettes, alcohol, or their favorite, internet pornography, with their harem only a click away. The porn cache is no longer in the basement. It's virtual and accessible from anywhere. If their wife or husband is around or they're with friends, they no longer have access to their virtual harem, making them even more distressed. If the user has come across scientific material or online communities, they'll be having a tug of war in their mind, resisting temptations and feeling deprived. Their way to usually relieve stress is now unavailable, suffering a triple blow. The probable result after this period of torture is compromised. I'll cut down, or I've picked the wrong time, or perhaps I'll just wait until the stress is gone from my life. However, once the stress is actually gone, there's no reason to stop and the user doesn't decide to quit again until the stress comes back. Of course, there's never a right time, because life for most people becomes more stressful. We leave the protection of our parents, entering the world of setting up home, taking on mortgages, having children, and having more responsible jobs. Regardless, the user's life cannot become less stressful, because pornography actually causes stress. The quicker the user passes on to the escalation stage, the more distressed they become and the greater the illusion of dependency grows. In fact, it's an illusion that life becomes more stressful and pornography, or a similar crutch, creates that illusion. This will be discussed in greater detail later, but after these initial failures, the user relies on the possibility that one day they'll wake up and just not want to masturbate or use pornography. This hope is usually kindled by stories heard from other ex-users. Oh, I wasn't serious until I had fading penetration, then I didn't want to use pornography anymore and just stopped masturbating. Don't kid yourself. Probe these rumors and you'll discover they're never quite as simple as they appear. Usually the user has already been preparing to stop and merely uses the incident as a springboard. More often, in the case of people who stop just like that, they've suffered a shock. Perhaps a discovery by their partner, a self-spotting incident, or accessing pornography not of the normal sexual orientation. Or they've had a sexual dysfunction scare themselves. Oh, I won't stop because that's just the sort of person I am. Stop kidding yourself. It won't happen unless you make it happen. Let's consider in greater detail why the willpower method is so difficult. For most of our lives, we adopt the head in the sand, I'll stop tomorrow approach. At odd times, something will trigger off an attempt to stop. It may be concerns about health, virility, or a bout of self-analysis and realizing we don't actually enjoy it. Whatever the reason, we start to weigh up the pros and cons of pornography. Sex is split into tantric, which is like touch, smell, and voice, and propagative, orgasm. This is one of the major keys in opening our mind, and without this important distinction, there will be confusion which leads to failure. On rational assessment, we find out what we've known our entire lives. The conclusion is a thousand times over. Stop watching it! If you were to sit down and give points to the advantages of stopping and compare them to the advantages of pornography, the total point count for stopping would far outweigh any disadvantages. If you employ Pascal's wager, by quitting you're losing almost nothing, with high chances of gains and higher chances of not losing. Although the user knows they'll be better off as a non-user, the belief they're making a sacrifice trips them up. Although an illusion, it's powerful. They don't know why, but the user has the belief that during the good and bad times of life, the sessions appear to help. Even before starting their attempt, societal brainwashing, further reinforced by the brainwashing from their own addiction, is then combined with the even more powerful brainwashing of how difficult it is to give up. Users hear stories of those who've stopped for many months and still desperately crave it, or disgruntled quitters who, having stopped, spend the rest of their lives bemoaning the fact they'd love to have a session. There are tales of users stopping for many months or years, living happy lives, only to have one peek at pornography, and suddenly they're hooked again. 
Users probably know several in the advanced stages of the disease, visibly destroying themselves and clearly not enjoying life, yet continuing to use. Additionally, they probably suffered one or more of those experiences themselves. So instead of starting with the feeling, great, haven't you heard the news? I don't need to watch pornography anymore. They instead start with feelings of doom and gloom, as if trying to climb Everest, and they falsely determine that once the little monster has its hooks on you, you're hooked for life. Many users start the attempt by apologizing to their girlfriends or wives and saying, look, I'm trying to give up pornography, I'll probably be irritable for the next couple of weeks, so try to bear with me. As you can see, most attempts are doomed before they begin. Assuming that the user survives a few days without a session, they're getting back their arousal and are starting to recover. They haven't opened their favorite tube sites and are consequentially getting aroused by normal stimuli they'd previously zoned out at. The reasons they decided to stop in the first place are rapidly disappearing from their thoughts, like seeing a bad road accident while striving. It'll slow you down for a while, but you stomp your foot on the throttle the next time you're late for an appointment. On the other side of the war is the little monster who still hasn't had its fix. There's no physical pain. If you had the same feeling because of a cold, you wouldn't stop working or get depressed. You'd laugh it off. All the user knows is that they want to visit their harem. The little monster knows this and starts up the big brainwashing monster, causing the same person who was a few hours or days earlier listing all the reasons to stop to now desperately search for any excuse to start again. They begin saying things like, Oh, life is too short. A bomb could go off. I could step under a bus tomorrow. I've left it too late. They tell you everything gives you an addiction nowadays. Or, I've picked the wrong time. Or, oh, I should have waited until after Christmas, or after my holidays, or after my tests, or after this stressful event in my life. Or, oh, I can't concentrate. I'm getting irritable and bad-tempered. I can't even do my job properly. Or, oh, my family and friends won't love me. Let's face it, for everyone's sake, I have to start again. I'm a confirmed sex addict. There's no way that I'll ever be happy again without an orgasm. Or they say something like, nobody can survive without sex. Or, I knew this would happen. My brain is sensitized by delta fos B due to changes affected by dopamine surges because of my past excessive porn use. Sensitization can never be removed from the brain. At this stage, the user usually gives in, firing up the browser, the schizophrenia increasing. On one hand, there's the tremendous relief of ending the craving as the little monster finally gets its fix. On the other hand, the orgasm is awful and the user cannot understand why they're doing it. This is why the user thinks they lack willpower. It's not in fact lack of willpower. All they've done is change their mind and made a perfectly rational decision in light of the latest information. What's the point of being healthy or rich if you're miserable? Absolutely none. Far better to have a shorter, enjoyable life than a lengthy, miserable one. Fortunately, this is untrue for the non-user, as life is infinitely more enjoyable without pornography. The misery the user is suffering isn't due to withdrawal pangs, though it's initially triggered by them. The actual agony is the tug of war in the mind caused by doubt and uncertainty. Because the user starts by feeling they're making a sacrifice, they then begin to feel deprived, which is a form of stress. One of these stressful times is when the brain tells them to have a peek, wanting to backtrack as soon as they stop. But because they've stopped, they can't, and this makes them even more depressed and sets the trigger off again. Another factor making quitting so difficult is waiting for something to happen. If your objective is passing a driving test, as soon as you've passed the test, it's certain whether you've achieved your objective. Under the willpower method, the internal narrative is, if I can go long enough without internet pornography, the urge to watch will eventually go. You can see this in practice in online forums where addicts talk about their streaks or days of abstinence. As said above, the agony the user undergoes is mental and caused by uncertainty. Although there's no physical pain, it still has powerful effects. Now miserable and insecure, the user is far from forgetting. Now full of doubts and fears like, how long will the craving last? Will I ever be happy again? Will I ever want to wake up in the morning? How will I ever cope with stress in the future? The user is just sitting there, waiting for things to improve. But while they're still moping, the harem is becoming ever more precious. In fact, something actually is happening, but only unconsciously. If they can survive weeks without opening a browser, the craving for the little monster disappears. However, as stated previously, the pangs of withdrawal from dopamine and opioids are so mild that the user isn't even aware of them. At this time, many users sense they've kicked it and so take a peek to prove it, sending them back down the water slide. Having supplied dopamine to the body, there's now a little voice at the back of their mind saying, you want another one. In fact, they had kicked it but have hooked themselves again. 
As a child, you watched cartoons, and as per neuroscience, you formed neural pathways, delta Fos B, for them. If you wanted to discourage a child from watching, you'd study if those pathways still existed and survey adults on why they don't like to watch their favorite childhood cartoons anymore. For one, there's better entertainment available, and secondly, the cartoons just don't hold the same magic anymore. With the willpower method, you're just denying the child a cartoon, but with easy peasy, you're also making sure they see no value in it. Which is better? The user won't usually get into another session immediately, thinking, I don't want to get hooked again, and allows a safe period of hours, days, or even weeks to pass. The ex-user can then say, well, I didn't get hooked, so I can safely have another session. They've fallen back into the same trap as when they first started, and are already on the slippery slope. Users who succeed using the willpower method tend to find it long and difficult, because the primary problem is the brainwashing. Long after the physical addiction has died, the user is still moping around, miserable. Eventually, after surviving this long-term torture, it begins to dawn on them that they aren't going to give in, stopping the moping and accepting that life goes on and is enjoyable without pornography. However, there are significantly more failures than successes, because some who succeed go through their lives in a vulnerable state, left with a certain amount of brainwashing telling them that porn does in fact give them a boost. This explains why many users who've stopped for long periods end up starting again later on. In fact, many ex-users will have the occasional session as a special treat or to convince themselves how strong their self-control is. Now it does exactly that, but as soon as the session ends, the dopamine starts to leave and a little voice at the back of their mind begins driving them towards another one. If they decide to partake, it still seems to be under control. No shocks, escalation, or novelty seeking, so they say, marvelous, while I'm not really enjoying it, I won't get hooked. After Christmas, or this holiday, or this trauma, I'll stop. Little do they know that the water slides of their brain have been greased even more. Too late, they're already hooked. The trap they managed to claw themselves out of has claimed its victim again. As said previously, enjoyment doesn't come into it. It never did. If we watched because of enjoyment, nobody would stay on the tube sites for longer than it takes to finish the deed. We assume we enjoy internet pornography because we can't believe we'd be stupid enough to get addicted if we didn't enjoy it. Most users don't have any idea about supernormal stimulus, novelty, or shock seeking, and even after reading about it, they don't believe the user is motivated by evolutionary reward circuit wiring. That's why so much of pornography is subconscious. If you were aware of the neurological changes and had to justify it costing you money in the future, even the illusion of enjoyment would go. When we block our minds to the bad side, we feel stupid. If we had to face it, that would be intolerable. If you watch a user in action, you'll see they're happy only when they're unaware they're using. Once aware, they tend to be uncomfortable and apologetic. Porn feeds the little monster, so upon purging it from your body along with the brainwashing or the big monster, you'll have neither need nor desire to watch. Chapter 12. Beware of cutting down. Many users resort to cutting down as a stepping stone towards stopping, or as an attempt to control the little monster. Many recommend cutting down or a porn diet as a pick-me-up. However, using cutting down as a stepping stone to stopping is fatal. It's these attempts to cut down that keep us trapped for the remainder of our lives. Generally, cutting down follows failed attempts to stop. After a few hours or days or weeks of abstinence, the user says something like, I can't face the thought of going to sleep without visiting my online harem, so from now on, I'll just use porn once in four days or purge my collection of bad porn. If I can follow this porn diet, I can either hold it there or cut down even further. Certain terrible things now happen. Number one, they're stuck with the worst of all worlds, still addicted to internet pornography and keeping the monster alive not only in their body but in their mind by drip feeding it. Number two, they're wishing their life away waiting for the next session. Number three, prior to cutting down, whenever they wanted to visit their harem, they'd fire up their browser and at least partially relieve the withdrawal pangs. Now, in addition to their normal stresses of life, they're causing themselves to suffer the withdrawal pangs for most of their lives, which makes them even more miserable and bad-tempered. And number four, whilst indulging, they neither enjoyed most of the sessions nor realized they were using a super normal stimulus. It was automatic. The only harem visit that was enjoyed was one after a period of abstinence. Now that they wait an extra hour or extra day or four days or week for each harem visit, they enjoy each one. The longer waited, the more enjoyable each session appears to become because the enjoyment in a session isn't the session itself. It's the ending of the agitation caused by the craving.
whether slight physical craving or mental moping. The longer the suffering, the more enjoyable each session becomes. The primary difficulty in stopping is the neurological addiction, which is easy. Users will stop without difficulty on various occasions, the death of a loved one, family or work affairs, etc. They'll go, say, 10 days without access and it doesn't bother them. But if they went the same 10 days when they could have had access to pornography, they'd be tearing their hair out. Many users will get chances during their workday and abstain from it, or they'll pass through Victoria's Secret of swimming pools and so on without undue inconvenience. Many will abstain if they have to sleep on the couch temporarily to make space for a visitor, or are themselves visiting. Even in go-go bars or nudist beaches, there have been no riots. Users are almost pleased for someone or something to say they can't view pornography. In fact, users who want to quit get a secret pleasure out of going for long periods without harem visits, giving them hope that perhaps one day, they'll never want it. The real problem in stopping pornography is brainwashing an illusion of entitlement that internet pornography is some sort of prop or reward, and life will never be the same without it. Far from turning you off internet pornography, all that cutting down accomplishes is leaving you feeling insecure and miserable, convincing you that the most precious thing on this earth is the new clip you just missed, that there's no way you'll be happy again without seeing it. There is nothing more pathetic than the user who's been trying to cut down, suffering from the delusion that the less pornography they watch, the less they'll want to visit their online harem. The reverse is true. The less they watch pornography, the longer they'll suffer withdrawal pangs, and the more they enjoy the relief of relieving them. However, they'll notice their favorite genre isn't hitting the spot. But that won't stop them. If the tube sites were dedicated to only one star or one genre, no user would even go more than once. Do you find that difficult to believe? What's the worst moment of self-control one feels? Waiting for four days and then having a climax, that's right. Then, what's the most precious moment for most users on a four-day porn diet? Well, that's right, the same climax after waiting for four days. Do you really believe that you're masturbating to enjoy the orgasm, or the more rational explanation that you need to relieve withdrawal pangs under the illusion that you're entitled to? Removal of the brainwashing is essential to remove illusions about pornography before you extinguish the final session. Unless you've removed the illusion that you enjoy it before you close that window, there is no way you can prove it afterwards without getting hooked again. When hovering over bookmarks and save pictures, ask yourself where the glory in this action is. Perhaps you believe that only certain clips are of good taste, like ones on habitual or favorite themes. If so, why bother to watch other videos or themes? Because you got into the habit? Why would anyone habitually mess up their brain and waste themselves? Nothing is different after a month, so why should a porn clip be any different? You can test this yourself. Find that hot clip from last month to prove it's different. Then, set a reminder and watch the same clip after a month without pornography. It will hit almost the same spots as it did last month. The same clip will be different after a social event, where you're turned down or tested by a potential partner. The reason being that the addict can never be truly happy if the little monster remains unsatisfied. Where does satisfaction come into it? It's just that they're miserable if they can't relieve the withdrawal symptoms. The difference between watching pornography and not is the difference between being happy and miserable. That's why internet pornography appears to be better. Users who get on their sites first thing in the morning for pornography are miserable whether watching it or not. Cutting down not only doesn't work, but is the worst form of torture. It doesn't work because initially the user hopes that by getting into the habit less and less, they'll reduce their desire to watch pornography. It's not a habit, it's addiction. The nature of any addiction is wanting more and more, not less and less. Therefore, in order to cut down, the user has to exercise willpower and discipline for the rest of their lives. So cutting down means willpower and discipline forever. Stopping is far easier and less painful. There are literally tens of thousands of cases in which cutting down has failed. The problem of stopping isn't the dopamine addiction which is easy to cope with. It's the mistaken belief that pornography gives you pleasure, brought about initially by brainwashing received before we started using, further reinforced by the actual addiction. All cutting down does is reinforce the fallacy further, to the extent that pornography dominates their lives completely and convinces the user the most precious thing on earth is their addiction. The handful of cases that do succeed have been achieved by a relatively short period of cutting down, followed by going cold turkey. Now just to be clear, these users didn't stop because of their cutting down, but in spite of it. All it did was prolong the agony, failed attempts leaving users nervous wrecks and even more convinced they're hooked for life. 
This is usually enough to keep them reverting back to their online harem for pleasure and for a crutch, or at least for another stretch before the next attempt. However, cutting down does help to illustrate the futility of pornography, clearly demonstrating that visits to the harem are not enjoyable after periods of abstinence. You have to bang your head against a brick wall, which is like suffering with jaw pangs, in order to make it nice upon stopping. Therefore, the choices are, number one, cutting down for life and suffering self-imposed torture, which you'll be unable to do anyway. Number two, watching pornography and increasingly torturing yourself for life, which is pointless. And number three, being nice to yourself and cutting porn out altogether. The other aspect that cutting down demonstrates is that there's no such thing as the odd or occasional harem visit. Internet pornography is a chain reaction that will last the rest of your life unless you make a positive effort to break it. Remember, cutting down will drag you down. Chapter 13. Just One Peak Just One Peak is a myth that you must remove from your mind. It's just one peak that gets us started in the first place. It's just one peak to tide us over a difficult patch on a special occasion that defeats most of our attempts to stop. It's just one peak that after having succeeded in breaking the addiction, sends us back into the trap. Sometimes it's just to confirm to the user that they don't need porn anymore, and one harem visit does just that. The after effects of pornography will be horrible and convince the user they'll never become hooked again, but they already are. The user feels that something making them so miserable and guilty shouldn't have made them do it, yet it did. It's this illusory thought of one special session that often prevents users from stopping. The one after your long conference trip, hard day at work, fight with the kids, or incident where your wife or husband rejects you for sex. Get it firmly in your mind that there is no such thing as just one peak. It's a chain reaction that will last the rest of your life unless broken. The myth about the odd, special occasion keeps users moping after stopping. Get into the habit of never seeing the no big deal session it's a fantasy. Whenever you think about pornography, you see a filthy lifetime of spending eons behind a screen for the privilege of destroying yourself mentally and physically. A lifetime of slavery and hopelessness. It isn't a crime if your erections are unreliable. But it is when you could be happier long term, but instead choose to sacrifice that for short term pleasure. It's okay we can't always come up with something to do for the void. Doing that isn't realistically possible in every instance for our entire lives. We can plan for most of them, but sometimes it just happens. Good and bad times also happen, irrespective of pornography. But get it clear in your mind, pornography isn't it. You're stuck with either a lifetime of misery, or none at all. You wouldn't dream of taking cyanide just because you like the taste of almonds, so stop punishing yourself with the occasional no big deal session. Ask a user with issues, if you had the opportunity to go back to the time before you became hooked, would you have become a user? The answer is inevitably, You've got to be joking. Yet every user has that choice every day of their lives, so why don't they opt for it? The answer is fear. The fear they can't stop or that life won't be the same without it. Stop kidding yourself. You can do it. Anybody can. It's ridiculously easy, but in order to make it so, there are certain fundamentals to get clear in your mind. Number one, there's nothing to give up. Only marvelous positive gains to achieve. Number two, Never convince yourself of the odd, no big deal, or just one peak session. It doesn't exist. There's only a lifetime of filth and slavery. And number three, there's nothing different about you. Any user can find it easy to stop. Many users believe they're confirmed addicts or have addictive personalities. This usually happens as a result of reading excessive amounts of shocking neuroscience. Remember, there is no such thing. Nobody is born with the need to masturbate to video clips before they became hooked. It's the drug that hooks you, not the nature of your character or personality. The nature of addictive supernormal stimulus makes you believe this is the case. However, it's essential to remove this belief because if you believe you're addicted, you will be, even after the little monster in your body is long dead. It's essential to remove all of this brainwashing. Chapter 14. Casual Users Heavy users tend to envy the casual porn user. We've all met these characters. Oh, I can go all week without a session. It doesn't really bother me. We wish we were like that. Now, this might be hard to believe, but no user enjoys being a user at all. Never forget, no user ever decided to become one, casual or otherwise. Therefore, all users feel stupid internally. Therefore, all users have to lie to themselves and others in a vain attempt to justify their stupidity. 
Golf fanatics brag about how often they play and want to play. So why do users, porn fanatics, brag about how little they masturbate? If that's the true criterion, then surely the accolade is not masturbating at all, isn't it? If someone said to you, I can go all week without carrots and it doesn't bother me in the slightest, you'd think you were talking to an insane guy. If I enjoyed carrots, why would I want to go all week without them? And if I didn't enjoy them, why would I make such a statement? So when a user makes a comment about surviving a week without a session, they're trying to convince themselves, and you, that they don't have a problem. But there would be no need to make a statement if they didn't have a problem. Translated, this comment is, I managed to survive a whole week without pornography. Like every user, hoping that after this they could survive the rest of their lives. If only able to survive a week, can you imagine how precious the session must have been afterwards, having felt deprived for an entire week? This is why casual users are effectively more hooked than heavy users. Not only is the illusion of pleasure greater, because they spend more time between withdrawal pang relieval, but they have less incentive to quit because they spend less time on pornography itself and are therefore less vulnerable to health risks. Occasionally, they may experience sexual dysfunction here or there, but they're unsure about what caused it, and so it's blamed on other factors. Remember, the only pleasure users get is in the search and seek dopamine cycle and relieving the withdrawal pangs, as has already been explained. The pleasure is an illusion. Imagine the little porn monster as a near imperceptible itch that we remain unaware of most of the time. Now, if you have that permanent itch, the natural tendency is to scratch it. As reward circuits become increasingly immune to dopamine and opioids, the natural tendency is to edge, escalate, binge, novelty seek, shock seek, etc. There are four main factors that prevent users from this intensive chain viewing. First, we have time. Most literally don't have the time to do it. They can't afford the minutes. Then we have health. In order to relieve the itch, we have to consume all free material that's available and then some. Capacity to cope with that kind of binging varies from each individual and at different times at different situations in their lives. This acts as an automatic restraint. Then we have discipline. Discipline is imposed by society, by the user's work or school, friends and relatives, or perhaps even by the user themselves as a result of the natural tug of war going on in every user's mind. And finally, we have imagination. A lack of imagination plays down the shock, novelty, and other values of the clip on a subjective basis. Now, it's easy to think of non-casual users or heavy users as weak, unable to understand why others are able to limit their intake. However, heavy users should keep in mind that most casual users are simply incapable of chain viewing, which requires a very strong imagination and stamina. Some of these once-a-week users, that heavy users tend to envy, are literally physically incapable of doing more, or because their job, society, or own hatred of becoming hooked won't allow them to do more. At this point, it may be advantageous to provide a few definitions that will be used throughout the book. First, we have the non-user. This is someone who's never fallen prey to the trap, but shouldn't be complacent. They're a non-user only by luck or grace of goodness. All users were convinced they'd never become hooked, and some non-users keep trying an occasional session, but just don't get hooked yet. Then we have the casual user, of which there are two basic classifications. First, we have the user who's fallen for the trap but doesn't realize it. Don't envy such users. They're merely sampling the nectar at the mouth of the pitcher plant, and in all probability will soon be heavy users. Remember, just as all alcoholics started off as casual drinkers, so too do all users start off casually. And second of the casual user category, we have the user who was once previously a heavy user and so thinks they can't stop. These users are the saddest of all and they fall into various categories, each requiring a separate comment. And so now I'll list the categories of casual users who were previously heavy users. First, we have the once a day user. Now, if they enjoy their entitlement to orgasm, why do they use internet pornography only once daily? If they can take it or leave it, why do they bother at all? Remember, the habit is, in actuality, banging your head against a wall to make it relaxing upon stopping. The once a day user relieves their withdrawal pangs for less than an hour each day. Although unaware, the rest of their day is spent banging their head against this wall, doing so for most of their lives. They're using once a day because they literally can't risk getting caught or messing with their neurological health. It's easy to convince a heavy user that they don't enjoy it. They know. But it's significantly harder to convince a casual one. Anyone who has gone through an attempt to cut down will know it's the worst torture of all, and almost guaranteed to keep you addicted for the rest of your life. 
Then another casual user who might have formerly been a heavy user is the rejected user. Now these demand the right to orgasm every day, but their wife or husband isn't always happy to fulfill the request. Initially, they're using internet pornography to fill that void, but upon digging the exciting water slide, they're trapped in a cycle of novelty, shock, supernormal images, etc. In fact, they're happy with their wife or husband's rejection as it provides something of an excuse. If internet pornography gives so much to you, why bother to have a wife or husband at all? Set them free instead. They're not enjoying sessions where they have to carry their partner in their mind. At some point, they're looking for their real-life partner to hand them an excuse to venture into the dark valleys of the internet. Then we have the porn diet user, also known as, I can stop whenever I want to, I've done it thousands of times. Now, if they think dieting helps getting them into the mood to pick up partners, why are they even on the diet of once in every four days? Nobody can predict the future. And what if the happenstance of meeting occurred, say, an hour after your scheduled session? Also, if occasional cleaning the plumbing is good to relieve tension, why not plumb every day? It's been proven that masturbation isn't required to keep genitals healthy, and internet pornography isn't required at all. And even if that were the case, no pickup artist guru who has read about the neurological damage will ever recommend watching super stimulus pornography. The truth is, the porn diet user is still hooked. Although they're rid of the physical addiction, they're still left with the primary problem of brainwashing. They're hoping each time they'll stop for good, but soon fall for the same trap again. Most users actually envy these stoppers and starters and think about how lucky the dieter is to be able to control her or his usage. However, they overlook the fact that the dieter isn't controlling their usage. When they're using, they wish they weren't. They go through the hassle of stopping, then begin to feel deprived and fall for the trap again, wishing they hadn't. They get the worst of both worlds. If you think about it, this is true in the lives of users when allowed to have a session, taking it as entitled or wishing they didn't. It's only when deprived that pornography becomes precious. The forbidden fruit syndrome is one of the awful dilemmas for users. They can never win because they're moping for a myth, an illusion. There's only a single way they can win, stopping moping by stopping pornography. Then we have the I only watch static or tame or homemade pornography user. Yes, everyone does this to start with, but isn't it amazing how the average shock value of the clip seems to rapidly increase, and before we know it, we're feeling deprived or tolerant? The novelty lacks with static pornography, so we pay the piper for a cup of grease and ride down the water slide towards resentment and guilt. The worst thing you can do is use your wife or husband's pictures, with approval of course, for masturbation. Why? Because in this process, you're rewiring your brain for the seeking, searching, and variety-induced dopamine flushes. Chemically, the porn water slides in the brain is delta Fos B building up, so you'll find yourself having difficulties when you're with them in real time. Another trap in this category is amateur or homemade pornography. Now, most of these are fakes, and you know it. And plus, you're also not going to stop at the very first one that hits your eyes, instead continuing to seek and search, which is part of the dopamine cycle. Remember, it's not only orgasm the brain seeks, but the novelty of the hunt that gives the water slide its thrill. The porn content isn't the issue, whether amateur or professional. It's the flushes of dopamine in the brain causing buildup of tolerance and satiation. Porn destroys normal brain operation, masturbation confusing the muscle brain response. Orgasm floods the brain with opioids and makes the pathway easier to follow next time. And then we have the, I've stopped but have an occasional peak user. In a way, peaking users are the most pathetic of all. Either they go through their lives believing they're being deprived, or more often, the occasional peak becomes too, sliding downwards on the slippery slope, sooner or later falling back to being heavy users. They've again fallen for the very trap that they fell into the first place. There are two other categories of casual users. The first is the type masturbating to images or clips of the latest celebrity sex tapes hitting the news, or something that they carried home from their accidental viewing at school or work. These people are really just non-users, but they feel they're missing out. They want to be part of the action, with most of us starting off this way. Next time, notice that after a while, the celebrity of your fantasy isn't doing it for you anymore. The more unattainable the target of your fantasy, the more frustrating the withdrawal of the orgasm is. The second category is best described by outlining a case shared online. 
A professional woman had been reading internet pornography stories for many years, and had never used more or less than once each night. Incidentally, she was a very strong-willed lady. Most users would wonder why she wanted to stop in the first place, gladly pointing out that there was no risk of PIED, or PE in her case, which is actually untrue. She still risks it despite being a woman. She wasn't even using static images, the stories themselves being far tamer than any material that common users use on a daily basis. The people who were still wondering why she wanted to stop were making the mistake of assuming that casual users are happier and more in control. They might be more in control, but they certainly aren't happy. In the woman's case, she wasn't satisfied with their partner nor real sex and highly irritable when responding to her daily stresses and strains. Her nearest and dearest was unable to figure out what was bothering her. Even if she convinced herself to be unafraid of her usage through rationalization, she still found herself unable to enjoy real relationships which invariably involve ups and downs. Her brain's reward center was unable to make use of normal distressors present in life as a result of daily dopamine flooding. Subsequent downregulation of her brain's receptors had rendered her melancholic under most circumstances. Like most, she had a great fear of pornography's dark side in treatment of women, before her first time. Eventually, she fell victim to societal brainwashing and tried her first sight. Unlike most who capitulate and become chain users, upon seeing the foul clips of violence, she resisted this slide. All you ever enjoy in pornography is ending the craving that started before it, whether the almost imperceptible physical craving or the mental torture of not being allowed to scratch the itch. Internet pornography itself is poison, which is why you only suffer the illusion of enjoying it after periods of abstinence. Similar to hunger or thirst, the longer you suffer it, the greater the pleasure when finally relieved. Making the mistake of believing pornography is just a habit, users think, if I can keep it down to a certain level or only on special occasions, my brain and body will just accept it. Then I can use at that level or reduce it further should I wish to. Get it very clear in your mind. The habit doesn't exist. Porn is drug addiction, with the natural tendency being to relieve withdrawal pangs, not enduring them. To hold it at the level you're currently at would require you to exercise tremendous amounts of discipline and willpower for the rest of your life. As your brain's reward center becomes tolerant of dopamine and opioids, it wants more and more, not less and less. As porn begins to gradually destroy your nervous system, courage, confidence, and impulse controls, you become increasingly unable to resist reducing the interval between each session. This is why in the early days we can take it or leave it. If we get a sign of something amiss mentally or physically, we just stop. Don't envy this woman. When you watch only once every 24 hours, it appears to be the most precious thing on earth, turning pornography into a forbidden fruit for her. For many years, this poor woman has been at the center of a tug of war. Though unable to stop using, she was frightened to escalate to streaming clips. For 23 hours and 10 minutes of each one of those days, she had to fight the temptation and lack of feelings towards her boyfriend. It took tremendous willpower to do what she did, eventually reducing her to tears. Such cases are rare, but look at it logically. Either there's a genuine crutch or pleasure in pornography, or there isn't. If there is... Who wants to wait an hour, a day, or even a week? Why should you be deprived of the crutch or pleasure in the meantime? If there is no genuine crutch or pleasure, why bother paying a visit to your online harem? Here's another case of a once in four days man describing his life as follows. <clears throat> I'm 40 years old. I've suffered porn-induced erectile dysfunction with real women and even when using pornography, which is most of the time. It's been a while since I've had a full erection. Before going on the once and four porn diet, I used to sleep soundly through the night after my session. Now I wake up every hour of the night and it's all I can think about. Even when asleep, I dream about my favorite clips. On days after my scheduled session, I feel pretty down, the diet taking up all of my energy. My special one would leave me alone because I'm so bad tempered and if she can't leave, she won't have me in the house. I go for jogs outside, but my mind is obsessed with it. On the scheduled day, I begin planning earlier in the night, getting very irritated if something happens against my plans. I'd back out of conversations and give in, only to later regret, at work and home. I'm not an argumentative guy, but I don't want the topic or conversation to hold me down. I remember occasions where I'd pick silly fights with my girlfriend on purpose. 
I'd wait for 10 o'clock, and when it arrives, my hands are shaking uncontrollably. I don't start the deed right away as there are new videos that have been added, so I shop around. My mind tells me that since I've starved myself for four days, I deserve a special clip that has to be worth the time spent searching. Eventually, I settle for one or two, but want it to last so that I can survive through the next four days, so I take more time to finish the deed. In addition to his other troubles, this poor man has no idea that he's treating himself to poison. First, he's suffering forbidden fruit syndrome and then forcing his brain to flush dopamine. Comparatively, his dopamine receptors aren't as cut down, but he's greasing the porn water slides, seeking, searching for edging, novelty, variety, shock, and anxiety in order to survive the next four days. You probably picture this man as a pathetic imbecile, but this isn't so. As a former athlete and marine surgeon, he didn't want to become addicted to anything. However, upon returning from war, he trained as an IT technician in a veteran's rehab program. When entering the civil workforce, he was a well-paid IT professional in a bank and was given a laptop to take home. It was the year that famous socialites leaked their porn videos online, and there was much talk about it. He then got hooked, spending the rest of his life paying through the nose and rooting himself physically and mentally. If he were an animal, society would have long since put him out of his misery. Yet we still allow mentally and physically healthy young teenagers to become hooked. You may think this case and notes are exaggerated, but this case, while extreme, is far from unique. There are tens of thousands of similar stories. Can you be sure that none of his friends and acquaintances envied him for being a once-in-four man? If you think this couldn't happen to you, stop kidding yourself. It's already happening. Like other addicts, porn users are notorious liars, even to themselves. They have to be. Most casual users indulge far more times and on far more occasions than they'll admit to. Many conversations with so-called twice-a-week users will admit they've done it more than three or four times a week. Read any online forum or story from casual users and you'll find they're either counting days or waiting to fail. You don't need to envy casual users and you don't even need to use pornography at all. Life is infinitely sweeter without it. Take the following log. It started with the simple challenge not to touch my junk for a day and being unable. Now I don't think about masturbation anymore. It doesn't cross my mind. That is possible, I promise you. The riches that await to those who are able are incredible. Now, teenagers are generally more difficult to cure. Not because they find it more difficult to stop, but because they don't believe they're hooked and are at the initial stages of the trap, generally suffering from the delusion that they'll automatically have stopped before the second stage. Parents of children who loathe internet pornography shouldn't have a false sense of security either. All children loathe the dark sides of pornography before becoming hooked. At one point, you did too. Don't be fooled by scare campaigns either. The trap is the same as it always was. Children know that internet pornography is a super normal stimulus, but they also know that one visit or peak won't do it. At some stage, they may be influenced by a partner, classmate, or work colleague. Please, do not become complacent in this matter. Society's failure to prevent adolescents from becoming addicted to internet pornography and other drugs is perhaps the most disturbing facet of this addiction. Adolescent brains are significantly more plastic and it is necessary to educate and protect them. If you're unsure on where to start, good resources include the YourBrainOnPorn.com book to educate yourself on the neuroscience. Even if you suspect your teenager is already hooked, the book provides foundational understanding in helping someone to escape. Otherwise, recommend this book. Chapter 15. The YouTube, Twitch, or Instagram User This user should be grouped with casual users, but the effects are so insidious that it merits a separate chapter. This leads to the breakdown of self-control, nearly causing a split for one forum user. And here's a reading of the forum user's post. I was three weeks into one of my failed attempts to stop. The attempt had been triggered by my wife's worry about my unreliable hard-ons and lack of interest. I had told her that it wasn't her, just job pressure. She said, I know you've handled the work pressure before, but how would you feel if you were me and had to watch someone you love systematically destroying themselves? with pornography. It was an argument I found irresistible, hence the attempt to stop. 
Now, she knows I'm not cheating, but this is, in a way, worse than that. See, the attempt ended after three weeks, culminating in a heated argument with an old friend. It didn't register until years after that my devious mind had deliberately triggered off the argument. I felt justifiably aggravated at the time, but don't believe it was a coincidence as I had never argued with this particular friend before, nor have I since. It was clearly the little monster at work. Regardless, I had my excuse. I desperately needed a release, and it didn't matter how. My wife wasn't in the mood, so I had feelings of entitlement, and I convinced myself that it would be okay if I restricted myself by avoiding porn sites and staying this side of the red line by only watching suggestive YouTube videos. But my wife ended up coming around as the night unfolded and wanted to make love. However, I was tired and without my horsepower, so I invented a headache. I couldn't bear to think of the disappointment this would cause my wife. Then I gradually returned to my old ways, with YouTube becoming my new harem destination. I remember being quite pleased at the time, thinking that it was at least cutting down my consumption. Eventually, she accused me of continuing to ignore her in bed. I hadn't realized it, but she described the times I'd caused an argument and stormed out of the house. At other times, taking two hours to purchase some minor item and faking sprains. I'd make excuses to cop out of wooing her, so when I had a reliable online harem, it's even harder. The worst thing about the YouTube user is that it supports the fallacy in their mind that they're being deprived. Simultaneously, it causes major losses of self-respect. An otherwise honest person may force themselves to deceive their loved one. It probably has happened or is still happening to you in some form. Problems faced with websites like Twitch, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and most social media are primarily driven by supplementation. Driven by novelty-seeking dopaminergias, the users trick themselves into believing they're on a safe site. Remember, the thrill is in the seeking, not the killing, and the little monster doesn't care where its fix comes from. For the user, the soft content received in their various online feeds gives them fleeting relief of withdrawal pangs keeping them hooked and waiting for their next session. The model in that image or video is indeed beautiful, and if you had them on your side right now, they could surely give you pleasure, but that image can't. It simply just isn't real. Your brain is tricked like a bull running into a red cape and afterwards doesn't understand why it didn't. One could think that you could just look at those images then, without masturbating. But remember that your brain is hooked on the limitless novelty, and the little monster doesn't care where its fix comes from. It's the same trap. Now, you might have watched a TV series, Columbo. Now, the theme of each episode is similar. The villain, usually a wealthy and respected businessman, has committed what he's convinced is the perfect murder, and his confidence in his crime remaining undetected receives a boost when he discovers the rather shabby and unimpressive-looking detective Columbo is in charge of the case. But, Columbo has this frustrating practice of closing the door after finishing his interrogation, having assured the suspect that he's in the clear. Just before the satisfied look has disappeared from the murderer's face, Columbo reappears, saying, Just one small point, sir, which I'm sure you can explain. The suspect stammers, and from that point on, he knows that Columbo will gradually wear him down. No matter how heinous the crime, from that point on, the sympathies were with the murderer. These bouts are similar. The tension of not being allowed to cross the red line to get the porn fix they rightly deserved, then wondering where the pleasure was after finishing the deed. Fear of crossing the line, losing control and returning to the bed, only to be stalked by the fear of your partner wanting sex. The safe YouTube videos will no longer satisfy you due to desensitization, lack of novelty, and the certain knowledge that sooner or later you'll visit your online harem. The final humiliation and shame then being when certainty becomes a fact, followed by the immediate return to chain viewing. Oh, the joys of being a porn user. Chapter 16. A Social Habit? Health of the mind and body are the primary reasons for why we should want to stop. But then, they always have been. We don't need scientific research and knowledge in neuroscience to tell us that porn is addictive and can potentially shatter our lives. These bodies of ours are the most sophisticated objects on the planet, and any user knows from the first session that the stimulus can go to excess and turn poisonous. 
The only reason why we ever get involved with porn is the cycles overlap with our evolutionary programming. Internet pornography is highly available, free, and streaming 24 hours a day. Porn was once considered harmless, but that was when the images were static and the videos involved a trip to the local store for a VHS tape. Today, it's generally considered, even by users themselves, that porn is a supernormal stimulus and addiction for me. In the old days, the strong man didn't admit that he masturbated, with the jerk being a derogatory term. In every pub, club, or bar, the majority of men would be proudly wanting to take a woman home and have real sex. Today, the position is completely reversed for the internet porn addict. Today's man realizes that he's beginning to feel he doesn't need a woman. Banding together online, he discusses experiences, devises strategies, and explores porn options. Today's strong man, though, doesn't want to depend on drugs. Through social revolution, all users are giving serious thought to stopping internet pornography and masturbation. Today's users consider porn a useless and harmful activity. The most significant trend noticed on forums is the increasing emphasis on the anti-social aspects of pornography. The days where a man boasted of having sex and orgasms every day is slowly being replaced with realization of slavery to the porn monster. The only reason why people continue after being educated is because they fail to stop or are too frightened to try. There is a wide spectrum of interest in the subject, some abstaining from pornography, masturbation, and orgasm, with or without a wife or husband. There's practices that separate the tantric and propagative parts of sex, like semen retention, and these are discussed and adopted in drugs. Many aforementioned failures are in reality fall forwards, thus somewhat benefiting people practicing them. Once you start the no PMO route, you'll find the best fit that applies to your life. It's encouraged to devise your own plan on orgasms after understanding and practicing sexual separation. Whatever your route, you'll see value in limiting the number of times you flush your brain with chemicals through orgasm and never again seeing pornography, sex, and orgasm as a pleasure or crutch for your emotional self. Various popular online communities founded by non-users are dedicated to quitting not only pornography but also masturbation. Now, these sites are ultimately beneficial to those escaping, but most notes point them to try willpower. The consequence of obsession with abstinence streaks and other measures is self-pity and lack of elation. Most of the brainwashing remains alive and well. Eventually, someone breaks down and a domino effect takes place, other users finding out they aren't the only ones. However, their efforts aren't in vain, they're just falling forward, albeit with lots of self-torturing, as they shut down their browsers but not the desire or need inside them. Easy peasy works in the reverse, shutting down the need and desire first, before shutting down the browser. Every day, more and more users leave the sinking ship, and those left on it become terrified they'll be the last. Don't let it be you. Chapter 17. Timing. Apart from the obvious point that it's doing you no good and that now is the right time to stop, timing is important. Society treats internet pornography flippantly as a slightly distasteful habit that doesn't injure your health. Now, of course, this is untrue. It's a drug addiction, a disease, and a destroyer of relationships in society. The worst thing that happens in most users' lives is getting hooked on this awful addiction. If they stay hooked, horrendous things happen. Timing is therefore important to give yourself the right to a proper cure. Firstly, identify the times or occasions where pornography appears to be important to you. If you're a business person who uses it for the illusion of stress relief, pick a relatively slack period or a holiday. If you use pornography mainly during boring or relaxing periods, the opposite applies. Regardless, take the attempt seriously and make it the most important thing in your life. Look ahead for a period of about three weeks and try to anticipate any event that might lead to failure. Occasions like conference trips, your wife or husband being out of town, or stuff like that need not deter you, provided you anticipate them in advance and don't feel that you'll be deprived. Don't attempt to cut down in the meantime, as this will only create the illusion that being denied is enjoyable. In fact, it actually helps to force yourself to watch and have as many porn sessions as possible before quitting. While you're having the last session and your last time, be mindful of the disappointment due to satiation, unfulfilled expectations, any bodily pain, withdrawal effects, peevishness, and melancholy. Think of how marvelous it'll be when you allow yourself to stop doing it. Whatever you do, don't fall into the trap of just saying, not now, later, and putting it out of your mind. Work out your timetable now and look forward to it. Remember, you aren't giving anything up. 
On the contrary, you're about to receive marvelous positive gains. For years, the medical profession has viewed pornography as harmless, without knowing the difference between the tame static porn of yesteryear and the latest virtual reality streaming experience. The problem is that although every user consumes internet pornography purely to relieve the dopamine craving caused by it, it's not the addiction to the chemical that hooks the user, but self-brainwashing resulting from addiction. An intelligent person can fall for a confidence trick, but only a fool would continue falling for it upon realizing the trick. Fortunately, most users are not fools. They only think they are. Each individual user has their own private brainwashing. That's why there appears to be such a diverse range of types of addicts, only serving to further compound the mysteries of this addiction. While the benefit of the original book by Alan Carr was to quit nicotine, one of the quickest and most addictive drugs known to man, it was agreeably surprising to realize that the philosophy propounded in the original book is still sound when adapted. The accumulated knowledge and challenge that Carr and myself undertake is how to communicate that knowledge to each individual user. The fact I know every user can not only find it easy to stop, but can actually enjoy the process is not only pointless, but exceedingly frustrating, unless the user can be made to realize it. In his original book, Alan Carr explains his controversial advice. Many people said to me, you say, continue to smoke until you finish the book. This tends to make the smoker take ages to read the book or just not finish it, period. Therefore, you should change the instruction. Now, this sounds logical, but I know if the instruction were, stop immediately, some smokers wouldn't even start reading the book. I had a smoker consult me in the early days that said, I really resent having to seek your help. I know I'm strong-willed. In every other area of my life, I'm in control. Why is it that all these other smokers quit by using their own willpower, yet I have to come to you? And he continued, I think I could do it on my own, if only I could smoke while I was doing it. Societal beliefs dictates that stopping smoking is incredibly difficult. So what does a smoker need when something is difficult? Well, his little friend, our crutch. Escaping smoking appears to be a double blow. Not only is there a difficult task to perform, which is hard enough, but the crutch we normally rely on for such occasions isn't available. Perhaps the real beauty of this method is that you don't need to give up while going through the process. Instead, we get rid of all fears and doubts initially, so upon finishing the final session, you're already enjoying freedom. Therefore, this hack book about pornography will keep the same advice intact. No matter how much it's said that it'll be easy and enjoyable, there'll be a vast majority who won't be able to accept it due to personal brainwashing on how difficult quitting is. Now, timing is the only chapter that causes me to question Alan's original advice seriously. Above all, if triggers include office stress, then picking a holiday to make an attempt, and vice versa, you know, that advice, this isn't the easiest way, instead picking what you consider to be the most difficult time. Whether that's stress, social obligations, concentration, or boredom, once you've proven that you can cope with and enjoy life in the worst situations, every other one is enjoyable. But if that were the advice, would you even make the attempt? Here's an analogy to explain that. My sister and I intend to swim together. We arrive at the pool at the same time, but rarely end up swimming together. Why? Well, the reason being that she immerses one toe in half an hour is actually swimming. That's slow torture. I know in advance that at some stage, no matter how cold the water is, I'll have to brave it. So I've learned to do it the easy way, diving straight in. Now imagine if I were in a position to insist that if she didn't dive straight in, she couldn't swim. If that were the case, she wouldn't swim at all. Do you see the problem? From feedback, many users have used the original timing advice to delay what they think will be the evil day. My next thoughts were using a very similar technique to the advantages of pornography chapter, something like, timing is very important, and in the next chapter, you'll be advised on the best time to make the attempt. And on the next page, there's just a massive, now. Now that is in fact the best advice, but would you take it? Perhaps the most subtle aspect of the trap is that when we have genuine stress in our lives, it's not the right time to stop, but at times without stress, we have no desire to end the torture. Ask yourself the following questions. First, when you got onto pornography for the first time, did you realize that you'd continue to depend on it for the rest of your life without ever being able to stop? Well, of course you didn't. And second, are you going to continue the rest of your life without ever being able to stop? Of course you aren't. Okay, so when will you stop? Tomorrow? 
next year, the year after? Isn't that what you've been asking yourself since you first realized you were hooked? Are you hoping that one morning you'll wake up and just not want to watch anymore? Stop kidding yourself. With any addiction, you get progressively more hooked, not less. Are you going to wait until you've actually started to feel that getting out of bed is harder than just masturbating? That would be a bit pointless. The real trap here is the belief that now isn't the right time. It'll always be easier tomorrow. We believe that we live stressful lives, but in actuality we don't. Most genuine stress has been removed from our lives. While leaving home, you don't live in fear of being attacked by wild animals. Most don't wonder where their next meal will come from, or if a roof will be over their heads tonight. Think of the life of a wild animal. Every time a rabbit goes out of its little burrow, it's facing Vietnam for its entire life. But the rabbit handles it. It's got adrenaline and other hormones, and so do we. The truth is, the most stressful periods for any creature's life are early childhood and adolescence. We've been equipped to cope with stress, and many who grow up with hard childhoods lead normal lives. Now, it's cliche to say, if you haven't got your health, you've got nothing, but it's absolutely true. When you feel physically and mentally strong, you can enjoy the highs and handle the lows. Many confuse responsibility with stress. Responsibility only becomes stressful when we don't feel strong enough to handle it. What destroys most isn't stress, jobs, or old age, but the illusory, lying crutches they turn to. Look at it this way. You've already decided that you aren't staying in the trap for the rest of your life. Therefore, at some point, whether you find it easy or difficult, you'll have to go through the process of getting free. Pornography isn't a habit or pleasure. It's drug addiction and a disease. We've established that, far from being easier tomorrow, it'll get progressively worse. The time to get rid of it is now, or as near to now as you can manage. Just think of how quickly each week of our lives passes. That's all it takes. Think of how nice it'll be to enjoy the rest of your life without ever increasing shadows hanging over you, provided you follow all the instructions. You won't even have to wait five days or three weeks. You'll not only find it easy to quit, you'll enjoy it. Chapter 18. Will I miss the fun? No. Once the little porn monster is dead, after your body stops craving dopamine and the porn water slides in your brain rapidly begin to fade due to lack of greasing, any remaining brainwashing will vanish. Not only will you find yourself both physically and mentally better equipped to handle the stresses and strains of life, but you'll enjoy the good times to the fullest. There's only one danger, that being the influence of those who still use sex as their crutch and pleasure. The other man's grass is always greener is commonplace in many aspects of our lives and easily understandable. So why in the case of pornography, with disadvantages so enormous when compared to the illusionary advantages, does the ex-user tend to envy those demanding sex and pornography as a crutch? With all the brainwashing from childhood, it's quite understandable that we've fallen into the trap. Why is it then, after realizing what a mug's game porn is, and managing to kick the habit, that we walk straight back into the same trap? Well, it's the influence of the societal brainwashing conflating pornography with sex presented as normal. The ex-user has a pang. The insecure void feelings of them being single causes feelings of anxiety and drives them to ride the water slide. This is indeed a curious anomaly, particularly if this observation is considered. Not only is every non-user in the world happy to be so, but every user in the world, even with their warped, addicted, brainwashed mind, suffering the delusion of enjoyment or relaxation, wishes they'd never become hooked in the first place. So, why do some ex-users envy? Well, first, just one peek. Remember, it doesn't exist. Stop seeing the isolated occasion and start looking at it from the point of view of the porn user. You might be envying them, but they don't approve of themselves, and they envy you. If only you could somehow clinically watch another user, as they can be the most powerful boost of all to help you out of it. Notice how quickly they open many tabs and browser windows, fast forwarding to the important sections, quickly getting bored of clips and running through the gamut of genres producing novelty, shock, anxiety, etc. Notice particularly that the act appears to be automatic. Remember. They aren't enjoying it. It's that they can't enjoy themselves without it. The next morning, waking up with weakened will, lost energy, and bleary eyes, they'll have to continue choking themselves at the first appearance of stress and strain. 
they're facing a lifetime of filth, poor mental health, and stained confidence. A lifetime of destroying themselves with black shadows at the back of their mind. And all this to achieve what purpose? The illusion you're getting what you deserve? And damned pleasure? And number two, the second reason some ex users have pangs is because the porn user is doing something, like self-pleasuring, and the non-user isn't, so they tend to feel deprived of it. Get it clear in your mind, it's not the non-user who is being deprived, but the poor addict who is being deprived of health, energy, confidence, peace of mind, courage, tranquility, freedom, and self-respect. Get out of the habit of envying porn users and start seeing them as the miserable, pathetic creatures they really are. I know, I was once one of the worst. That's why you're reading this book and not the ones who can't face up to it and continue to kid themselves. You wouldn't envy a heroin addict, and like all drug addiction, yours won't get any better. Each year, it'll get exponentially worse so long as you continue being addicted. If you don't enjoy being a user today, you'll enjoy it even less tomorrow. Don't envy other users. Pity them. Believe me, they need your pity. Chapter 19. Can I compartmentalize? This myth is primarily spread by users attempting to stop on the willpower method. They perform mental gymnastics and begin a Jekyll and Hyde routine. Porn is for my alter ego, and real life romance is for my relationship side. Nothing is further from the truth. The porn water slides, Delta Foss B, and neurological changes are going to overrun the real life romance, making it less desirable. Mr. Hyde is definitely going to overrule Dr. Jekyll's instructions. If you use internet pornography, you're training yourself for the role of voyeur, or requiring the option of clicking to something more arousing at the slightest drop in dopamine levels, or the continual search for just the right scene for maximum effect. Additionally, you might be masturbating in a hunched over position or watching your smartphone in bed on the nightly, eventually desiring those cues more than real life stimuli. Sex goes against every aspect of the online harem, so it stands no chance when compared. The memories created when you're young are powerful and long lasting, so breaking down those pornographic water slides and rewiring or creating new ones takes longer. However, that's not to say it's any more difficult. Every time you ride on the porn water slides, you're greasing it, keeping the nerves fresh and ready to fire. When parking next to a fast food restaurant, the smell of the fryer floats into your nostrils and the sale is already made. Likewise, the porn water slides in your brain are ready for you to get sucked in and are open 24 hours a day. Each cue or trigger lights up your reward circuit with the promise of sex, only it isn't sex. Nevertheless, nerve cells solidify these associations with sexual arousal by sprouting new branches to strengthen the connections. The more you use pornography, the stronger the nerve connections become. The end result is that you might ultimately need to be a voyeur, needing to click to ever escalating and novel material, needing pornography to get to sleep, or needing to search for the perfect ending to get the job done. As with any substance or behavioral drug, the body builds tolerance and the drug ceases to relieve the withdrawal pangs completely. As soon as the porn user closes a session, they want another one, and quickly, their permanent hunger remaining unsatisfied. The natural inclination now is escalation to get the dopamine rush. However, most users are prevented from doing this for either or both of the following reasons. First is time. They simply don't have the time, or maybe the money, to afford paid porn sites. Then is health. There's only so much the body can take. Either the dopamine surges or orgasms. Plus, orgasms actually trigger chemicals in order to cut down the dopamine flush. It has to. That's just the way the body works. Once the little monster leaves your body, the awful feeling of insecurity ends. Your confidence returns, along with a marvelous feeling of self-respect, obtaining the assurance to take control of your life and using it as a springboard to tackle other problems. This is one of the many great advantages of breaking free from any addiction. The compartmentalization myth is one of the many tricks that the little monster plays with your mind. These tricks make it harder to stop due to the impossible satisfaction of the permanent hunger, causing many users to turn to cigarettes, heavy drinking, or even harder drugs in order to satisfy the void. Humans are rating animals, both to ourselves and others. Watching pornography with your partner is unsatisfying as you both rate each other's performance against the narrative in the pornography. Do you want Brad Pitt in your bedroom, even if he's on a poster? 
No one person can match a harem where each experience is acted, scripted, and directed by professionals, and immediately available 24 hours a day. Chapter 20. Avoid false incentives. Many users on the willpower method attempt to increase their motivation through construction of false incentives. There are many examples of this, a typical one being to reward themselves with gifts after not watching pornography for a month. Now, this appears to be a logical and sensible approach, but is in fact false, because any self-respecting user would rather continue watching pornography every day than reward themselves with a self-given gift. This generates doubt in the user's mind, because not only will they have to abstain for 30 days, they're not sure they'll even enjoy the days without pornography. Their only pleasure or crutch has been taken away. All this has done is increase the size of the sacrifice the user feels they're making, now ever more precious in their mind. Other examples include, I'll stop so that it'll force me to get a social life and more real sex. Or, I'll stop so that some magical energy will help me to leap above the competitors and get the partner I pursue. Or, I'll stop so that I can commit myself to not wasting my energy and enthusiasm with pornography in order to grow hunger in myself. Now, these are actually true, and they can be effective, and you might actually end up getting exactly what you want. But think on it for a second. If you do get what you wanted, once the novelty is gone, you'll feel deprived. And if you don't get what you wanted, you'll feel miserable. Either way, sooner or later, you'll fall for the same trap again. If you link quitting to a false incentive, you'll only increase doubt. Because if you don't get your incentive, and even if you do, you'll begin thinking doubtful thoughts like, will quitting actually make my life better? If I quit and don't get what I want, did I use the method correctly? Thoughts like these increase feelings of sacrifice and therefore create packs. Another typical example is online or form pacts. These have the advantage of eliminating temptation for certain periods. However, they generally fail for the following reasons. Number one, the incentive is false. So why would you want to stop just because other people are doing so? All this achieves is generating additional pressure and increases the feelings of sacrifice. It's fine if all users genuinely want to stop at one particular time. But you can't force them to stop, although all secretly want to. Until they're ready to do so, a pact creates additional pressure, which only increases their desire to watch. This turns them into secret viewers, further increasing the feeling of dependency. Number two is, dependency on each other using the willpower method breeds feelings of undergoing a period of penance, during which they wait for the urge to disappear. If they give in, there's a sense of failure. When using the willpower method, at least one of the participants is bound to give up, providing the other participants with the excuse they've been waiting for. Oh, it's not their fault. They would have held out, but Fred or someone like that let them down. The truth is that most of them have already been cheating. Number three, if you share the credit, that's the reverse of dependency. There's a marvelous sense of achievement in stopping pornography, and when doing it alone, the acclaim you receive from your friends and online buddies can be a tremendous boost over the first few days. However, when everybody is doing it at the same time, that credit has to be shared, and the boost is consequently reduced. Number four. Another classic example is the guru promise. Stopping will give you happiness because you're no longer engaged in the tug of war, your brain beginning rewiring and regaining impulse control. That's true. However, you must keep in mind that this will neither make you a sex god nor win you the lottery. Nobody except you cares in the slightest if you stop pornography. You aren't a weak person if you're using porn three times a day and have PIED, or a strong person if you're an addict and don't. Stop kidding yourself. If the job offer of 10 months work for 12 months salary a year, or the risks of cutting down your brain's ability to cope with day-to-day -day stress and strains, or putting yourself at odds with having a reliable erection, or the lifetime of mental and physical torture and slavery didn't stop them, the above few phony incentives won't make the slightest bit of difference, and will only succeed in making the sacrifice to users appear worse. Instead, concentrate on the other side of pornography. What am I getting out of it? Why do I need to watch pornography? Keep looking at the other side of the tug of war and ask yourself what pornography is doing for you. Absolutely nothing. Why do I need to do it? You don't. You're only punishing yourself. This is Pascal's wager. You have almost nothing to lose, which is like fading arousal and nothing else, and chances of big profits, full and reliable arousal, mental well-being and happiness. 
and you have no chances of losing big. Why not then declare your quitting to friends and family? Well, it'll make you a proud ex-addict or ex-user, not an elated and happy non-user. It might scare your wife or husband a bit since they may see this as a scheme to have more sex in a sort of new age way. They may also fear you turning into a sex machine. It's hard to explain unless they're open-minded. Any attempt to get others to help you in quitting gives more power to the little monster. Pushing it from your mind and totally ignoring it has the effect of trying not to think about it. Be mindful instead. As soon as you spot the thoughts, the cues like being home alone or absent-minded thoughts, just say to yourself, great, I'm no longer a slave to pornography. I'm free and happy to know differences in sex. This will cut the oxygen to the thought and stop it from burning towards urges and cravings. In this aspect, practicing mindfulness meditation can be helpful to assist in the depersonalization of thoughts. Chapter 21. The Easy Way to Stop This chapter contains instructions regarding the easy way to stop pornography. Provided you follow the instructions, you'll find that stopping ranges from relatively easy to enjoyable. All you have to do is two things. Number one, make the decision that you are never going to watch pornography again. And number two, don't mope about it. Rejoice. Now at this point, you're probably asking, why the need for the rest of the book? Why couldn't you have just said that in the first place? Well, the answer is that you'd have eventually moped about it and consequently changed your decision. You've probably already done that many times before. As said already, pornography is a subtle, sinister trap. The main problem of stopping isn't the dopamine addiction, which is certainly a problem, but not the primary one. It's the brainwashing. Therefore, it is necessary to destroy all the myths and delusions first. Understand your enemy, know their tactics, and you'll easily defeat them. What follows is an account of Alan Carr's experience quitting smoking and other extremely controlling addiction. Having spent large chunks of my life suffering black depression while attempting to quit, Upon finally escaping, I went straight to zero, without a bad moment. It was enjoyable even through the withdrawal period and I've never had the slightest pang since. On the contrary, it was one of the most wonderful things that's happened in my life. Now here's an account of the author who wrote this book about pornography and his attempt to quitting. My final attempt was different. Like all users nowadays, the problem had been given serious thought in my mind. Up to then, after failing, it was routine to console myself with the thought that it would be easier next time. It had never occurred to me that I'd have to go on this way for the rest of my life. That thought filled me with horror, and I began thinking very deeply about the subject. Rather than firing up the browser subconsciously, you know, without thinking about it, I instead analyzed my feelings and confirmed what I already knew. I was not enjoying pornography. I found it filthy and disgusting. I started looking at non-users living in other parts of the world or older people who never got to know these tube sites. Up until then, I had always regarded non-users of pornography as wishy-washy, unsociable, finicky people. However, examining them when they appeared, they appeared to be, if anything, stronger and more relaxed. They appeared to be able to cope with the stresses and strains of life and seemed to enjoy social functions more than porn users. They certainly had more sparkle and zest to them. I started talking to ex-users. Up to that point, I'd always regarded them as being forced to give up for health or religious reasons, and they were always secretly longing for a harem visit. Now, a few did say, you get the odd pangs, but there's so few and far between, they aren't worth bothering about. But most of them instead said, miss it? You must be joking. Life's never felt better. Even their failures were fall forwards for them. They did not condemn themselves and unconditionally accept it instead, like a coach will accept a mistake by a genuinely golden player. Talking to ex-users destroyed another myth I'd always had in my mind, that there was an inherent weakness within me, until it dawned on me that all go through this private nightmare. Basically, I said to myself, scores of people are stopping right now and leading perfectly happy lives. I didn't need to do it before I started, and I can remember having to work hard to get used to this filth. So why do I need it now? In any event, I did not enjoy pornography, hating the entire filthy ritual, and didn't want to spend the rest of my life in slavery to this disgusting addiction. I then said this to myself, whether you like it or not, you've completed your last session. I knew right from that point that I'd never have another session again. 
I wasn't expecting it to be easy, actually, just the reverse. I fully believe that I'd signed up for months of black depression and spending the rest of my life having the occasional pang. Instead, it has been absolute bliss right from the start. It took me a long time to work out why it had been so easy and why I hadn't suffered those terrifying withdrawal pangs. The reason is that they don't exist. It's the doubt and uncertainty that creates pangs. The beautiful truth is that it's easy to stop pornography. It's only indecision and moping that makes it difficult. Even while addicted, users can go for relatively long periods at certain times without it. It's only when you want it but can't have it that you suffer. Therefore, the key to making it easy is to make stopping certain and final. Not hoping, but knowing you've kicked it, having made the right decision. Never doubt or question it. In fact, just the reverse. Always rejoice the fact you quit. If you can be certain from the start, it'll be easy. Okay, but how can you be certain from the start? Well, that's why the rest of the book is necessary. There are certain essential points that are necessary to get clear in your mind before you start. Number one, you gotta realize that you can achieve it. There is nothing different about you and the only person who can make you watch is yourself. Not that porn star, never in their wildest dreams having thought of themselves as being used for reducing virility. Number two, there is absolutely nothing to give up. On the contrary, there are enormous positive gains to be made. Not only that, but you'll be healthier and have more time on your hands, and you'll enjoy the good times more and be less miserable during the bad. Number three, there is no such thing as a single peak or visit. Pornography is drug addiction and a chain reaction. By moaning about the odd visit, you'll only be needlessly punishing yourself. Number four, see pornography not as a boys will be boys habit that might injure you, but as drug addiction. Face up to the fact that whether you like it or not, you've got that disease. It won't go away because you bury your head in the sand. Remember that like all crippling diseases, it not only lasts for a lifetime, but gets exponentially worse. The easiest time to cure is now. And number five, Separate the disease, the neurological addiction to dopamine, from the mindset of being a user or not. All users, if given the opportunity to go back to the time before they became hooked, would jump at that opportunity. But you have that opportunity today. Don't even think about it as giving up. Upon making the final decision that you've had your last visit, you'll already be a non-user. A user is one of those poor wretches going through life destroying themselves with pornography. A non-user is someone who doesn't. Once you've made that final decision, you've already achieved your objective. Rejoice in the fact you've passed the test. Don't sit around moping and waiting for the chemical addiction to go. Get out and enjoy life immediately. Life is marvelous even when you're addicted, and each day will get so much better when you aren't. The key to making it easy to quit is to be certain that you'll succeed in abstaining completely during the withdrawal period, which is a maximum of about three weeks. If you're in the correct frame of mind, you'll find that ridiculously easy. By this stage, if you've opened your mind as requested at the beginning, you'll have already decided that you're going to escape. You should now have feelings of excitement, like a dog straining at the leash, unable to wait to break down the Delta Foss B porn water slides. If you instead have a feeling of doom and gloom, It'll be for one of the following reasons. Number one, something hasn't gelled in your mind. Reread the above five points and ask yourself if you believe them to be true. If you doubt any point, reread the appropriate sections of the book. Number two, you fear failure itself. Don't worry, just read on and you'll succeed. The whole business of internet pornography is a confidence trick of a gigantic scale. Intelligent people fall for confidence tricks, but only a fool, once having found out about the trick, goes on kidding themselves. And number three, you agree with everything else, but you're still miserable. Don't be. Open your eyes. Something marvelous is happening. You're about to escape from the prison. It is essential to start with the correct frame of mind. It's marvelous that I'm a non-user. All that needs to be done now is keeping you in that frame of mind during the withdrawal period, and the next few chapters deal with specific points to enable you to do so. After withdrawal period, you won't have to think that way. You'll think it automatically. The only mystery in your life will be why you didn't see it before. However, two important warnings. First, delay your plan to make your last visit until you finish the book. And second, 
A withdrawal period of up to three weeks has been mentioned many times before and in previous chapters, which can cause misunderstanding. You may subconsciously feel you have to suffer for specifically three weeks. You don't. Avoid the trap of thinking, somehow I've got to abstain for three weeks and then I'll be fine. Nothing magical will actually happen after three weeks. You won't suddenly feel like a non-user, as they don't actually feel any different from users in that regard. If you're moping about stopping during the three weeks, in all probability, you'll still be moping about it after the three weeks. Summarized, if you can start right now by saying, I'm never going to use again, isn't it marvelous? After three weeks, all the temptation will go. Whereas if you say, if only I can survive these three weeks without pornography, you'll be dying for a harem visit after the three weeks are up. Think of it this way, your brain wants to maintain that status quo, so if you're under the belief that you're losing something good when quitting, you'll obviously feel horrible. It is impossible to force yourself to feel a certain way if your brain doesn't believe it. This is why it's important to go through the trouble of removing the illusion that pornography gives you anything at all. That's how you know you're sacrificing nothing. Sexual dysfunction has a lot to do with your brain and mind frame. Internet pornography rewires your brain's reward circuit and gives your mind a doubting mindset. This self-doubt would undoubtedly cause sexual dysfunction, having all the desire in your upper part but putting up with no arousal in your lower. And that's the worst thing to happen to your mindset. Libido going hand in hand with romance is the elixir of youth, and you can have that until you die. You'll keep the probabilities high by quitting, but that isn't the only or major gain. The greatest gain is freedom from slavery. Chapter 22. The Withdrawal Period For up to three weeks after your last session, you may be subjected to withdrawal pangs. These consist of two quite separate but distinct factors. First, we have dopamine withdrawal pangs, an empty, insecure feeling similar to hunger identified as cravings or a something-I-must-do feeling. And second, we have psychological triggers of certain external stimuli, like commercials, online browsing, telephone conversations, etc. Failure to understand and differentiate between these two distinct factors makes it difficult to achieve success using the willpower method and is the reason why many who do end up falling into the trap again. Although the withdrawal pangs of dopamine don't cause physical pain, don't underestimate their power. We talk of hunger pains as if going without food for a day. There might be stomach rumbles, but there isn't any physical pain here. Even so, hunger is a powerful force, and we're likely to become very irritable when deprived of food. It's similar to when our body is craving a dopamine rush, the difference being that our body needs food, just not poison. With the right frame of mind, withdrawal pangs are easily overcome and disappear very quickly. After abstaining for a few days on the willpower method, the craving for dopamine flushes soon disappears. It's the second factor, brainwashing, that causes difficulty. The user has gotten into the habit of relieving their withdrawal pangs at certain times and certain occasions, which causes an association of ideas, like, I've got a hard on, so I must watch pornography, or I'm in bed with my laptop, and I must have a session to feel happy. The effect is best illustrated with an example. You have a car and the indicator is on the left, but on your next, it's on the right. You know it's on the left, but for a couple of weeks, you turn the windscreen wipers on when you want to indicate. Stopping is very similar. During the early days, the trigger mechanism will operate at certain times. You'll think about wanting a session, so therefore countering the brainwashing is essential right from square one and will cause the cues and triggers to quickly disappear. Under the willpower method, because the user believes they're making a sacrifice, they're moping about it and waiting for urges to leave the opposite of removing these trigger mechanisms, and actually, you end up increasing them. Similarly, under guru thinking, the user starts to wonder when they're going to become a god, and even demands that they shouldn't have those thoughts, paving the way for self-loathing and failure. A common trigger is alone time, particularly at social events with friends. The ex-user is using other methods to quit, and already miserable due to feeling deprived of their usual crutch or pleasure. Their friends are with their partners and acting intimate. The user is either single or not getting any from their partner, and now no longer enjoys what should be a pleasant social occasion. Their existing brain water slides lead them to pornography, which is easier than trying to woo their wife or husband. Because of the association of entitlement to sex with their well-being, they're now suffering a triple blow, and the brainwashing is actually increased. 
If they're resolute and can hold out long enough, they eventually accept their lot and get on with their life. However, part of the brainwashing still remains. The second most pathetic aspect of this addiction being the user having quit, but even after several years, still craving the just one last visit to the harem on certain occasions. They're pining for an illusion that exists only in their mind, and they needlessly torture themselves. Even under easy-peasy method, responding to triggers is the most common failing. The ex-user begins to regard internet pornography as a sort of placebo or sugar pill, thinking, I know porn does absolutely nothing for me, but if I think it does, on certain occasions, it'll be helpful. A sugar pill, although giving no actual physical help, can be a powerful psychological aid to relieve genuine symptoms and is therefore really beneficial. Internet pornography and habitual masturbation, however, are not sugar pills. Why? Well, because pornography creates the symptoms it relieves and it ceases to relieve them completely. You may find it easier to understand the effect when related to a non-user or a successful user who has quit for several years. Take the case of a user who loses their partner. It's quite common at such times, with the best of intentions, to say, have one RM visit. It'll help calm you down. If the offer is accepted, it won't have a calming effect because there's no dopamine addiction and therefore no withdrawal pangs to relieve. At best, all it'll do is give them a momentary psychological boost. Even after the session is completely over, the original tragedy is there. In fact, it'll be increased because the person now suffer withdrawal pangs and thus has to make a choice. Endure them or seek relief by repeating the water slide to start the chain of misery all over again. All the pornography provided was a fleeting psychological boost, the same that could have been achieved by a book or a feel-good movie, even a bad one. Many non-users and ex-users have become re-addicted as a result of such occasions. Get it quite clear in your mind, you don't need the dopamine rush and are only torturing yourself further by continuing to regard it as some sort of prop or boost. There is no need to be miserable. Orgasms don't make good relations. Most times, they ruin them. Remember, too, that it's not entirely true that those who show public displays of affection enjoy every occasion. Intimacy is best enjoyed in private, where wives or husbands can respond without embarrassment. You don't have to be an orgasm-induced dopamine addict. If it happens as a natural result of a series of life events, that's fine. But enjoy the occasion and then life without it. After abandoning the concept of pornography as pleasurable in itself, many users think, if only there were clean, pure internet pornography. Now there is clean, soft porn, and any who try it soon find out it's a waste of time. Get it clear in your mind that the only reason you've been using pornography is to get that dopamine flush. Once you're rid of the dopamine craving for pornography, you'll have no need to visit your online harem. Whether the pangs are due to actual dopamine withdrawal symptoms or trigger cue mechanisms, accept it. The physical pain is non-existent and with the right frame of mind, it won't be a problem. Don't worry about withdrawal. The feeling itself isn't bad. It's the association with wanting and then feeling denied that's the problem. Instead of moping about it, acknowledge it. I know what this is. It's the withdrawal pangs from pornography. That's what users suffer their entire lives and it keeps them addicted. Non-users don't suffer these pangs. It's another one of the many evils of this lying addiction. Is it not marvelous that I'm purging this evil from my brain? In other words, for the next three weeks, you'll have a slight trauma inside your body. But during those three weeks, and for the rest of your life, something marvelous will be happening. You'll be ridding yourself of an awful disease, with the bonuses far outweighing the slight temporary trauma, and actually enjoying withdrawal pangs. They'll become moments of pleasure, like an exciting game to starve the pornographic tapeworm living inside your stomach. You've got to starve it for three weeks while it's trying to trick you into getting into bed to keep it alive. At times, it'll try to make you miserable. At times, you'll be caught off guard. You'll receive a porn URL or stumble upon something online and forget that you've stopped, giving a slight feeling of deprivation when remembered. Be prepared for these tricks in advance, and whatever the temptation, get it into your mind that it's only there because of the monster living inside your body, and every time you resist the temptation, you've dealt another mortal blow in the battle. Whatever you do, don't try to forget about pornography. This is one of the things that causes PMOers using the willpower method hours of depression. They try and get through each day hoping that eventually they'll just forget about it. It's like not being able to sleep. The more you worry about it, the harder it becomes. In any event, 
You won't be able to forget about it. For the first few days, the little monster will keep reminding you, and you won't be able to avoid it. While there are still laptops, smartphones, and magazines around, you'll have constant reminders. The point being that you have no need to forget, since nothing bad is happening. In fact, something marvelous is happening, and even if you're thinking about it a thousand times a day, savor each moment and remind yourself of how marvelous it is to be free again. Remind yourself of the sheer joy of not having to torture yourself anymore. As said previously, you'll find that pangs become moments of pleasure, being surprised at how quickly you'll then forget about pornography. Whatever you do, do not doubt your decision. Once you start to doubt, you'll start to mope, and it'll get worse. Instead, use that moment of moping and convert it into a boost. If the cause is depression, then remind yourself that pornography was causing it. If you're forwarded a URL by a friend, take pride in saying, I'm happy to say I don't need that anymore. This will hurt them, but when they see it isn't bothering you, they'll be halfway to joining you. Remember, you have incredibly powerful reasons for stopping in the first place. Remind yourself of the costs and ask yourself if you really want to risk the malfunction of your body, mind, and the simple fact that you'll be living under a spell for the rest of your life. Be mindful of the little monster's efforts to minimize the hazards and, above all, remember the feeling is only temporary and every moment is a moment closer to your goal. Some users feel they'll have to spend the rest of their lives reversing automatic triggers. In other words, they believe they'll have to go through their lives kidding themselves that they don't need pornography through use of psychology. This isn't so. Remember that the optimist sees the bottle as half full. The pessimist sees it as half empty. But in the case of pornography, the bottle's empty and the user sees it as full. There are zero advantages to using internet pornography. It's the user who's been brainwashed to think there are. Once you start telling yourself that you don't need or want pornography, in a very short time, you won't even need to say it, seeing the beautiful truth yourself. It's the last thing you need to do. But make sure it isn't the last thing you do. Chapter 23. Just one little peek? This is the undoing of many using the willpower method. They'll go through three or four days and then have the odd peak to tide them over. They don't realize the devastating effect this has on their morale. For most users, their first peak at the tube site RM was not as good as sex with a real person. The clips that are clean are few and far between, giving their conscious mind a boost, thinking, good, that wasn't entirely all that enjoyable, I'm losing the urge, and I'm not into that shocking stuff. While in fact, the reverse is the case. Get it clear in your mind that enjoyment of orgasm was not the reason you quit pornography. If users were there for orgasm alone, they'd never watch more than one clip. The only reason why you needed porn was feeding that little monster. Just think, after being starved for four days, how precious that one peak must have been to it. Your conscious mind is unaware, but the fix your body received is communicated to your subconscious, and all your sound preparation will be undermined. There will be a little voice at the back of your mind saying that, in spite of all logic, the sessions are precious and you want another one. That little peak has two damaging effects. First, it keeps the little monster alive in your body, and second, worse, it keeps the big monster alive in your mind. If you had the last peak, it'll be easier to have the next one. Pornography is a mousetrap without cheese, only poison. Using willpower, you have to convince yourself not to grab the cheese. But with this method, you'll be able to see the poison. You don't need to avoid it. You just don't go into it. Above all, remember, just one peak is how people get into the addiction in the first place. Chapter 24. Will it be harder for me? There are infinite combinations of factors determining how easily each individual user will quit. To start with, each of us has our own character, career, personal circumstances, timing, metabolism, etc. Certain professions may make it harder than others, but providing the brainwashing is removed, this doesn't have to be so. Take the following few examples. Occasionally, it is difficult for members of the medical profession. We think it should be easier for doctors because they're more aware of the effects. But although this supplies more forceful reasons for stopping, it doesn't make it any easier to accomplish. The reasons are as follows. First, the constant awareness of the health risks creates fear, one of the conditions under which we feel we need to relieve the withdrawal pangs. Second, a doctor's work is exceedingly stressful and they're usually unable to relieve the additional stress of withdrawal pangs while working. And third, they have the additional stress of guilt, feeling that they should be setting an example for the rest of the population. 
This puts more pressure on them and increases the feeling of deprivation. After a hard day at work where their stress is momentarily relieved by pornography, that session becomes incorrectly attached to the relief experienced. Due to this misassociation of ideas, pornography gets credit for the whole situation, suddenly becoming very precious upon quitting and going through withdrawal pangs. This is a form of casual user and applies to any situation where the user is forced to abstain for lengthy periods. Under the willpower method, the user is miserable because they're being deprived and not enjoying the tiredness and sleep that comes after a session. Their sense of loss is greatly increased. However, if you can first remove the brainwashing and moping regarding porn, the break in sleep can still be enjoyed even while the body is craving the amine transmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Another difficult situation is boredom, particularly when combined with periods of stress. Typical examples are students and single parents, work being stressful yet monotonous. During an attempt to stop on the willpower method, the single person has long periods in which they mope about their loss, which in turn increases feelings of depression. Again, this can be easily overcome if your frame of mind is correct. Don't worry that you're continually reminded that you've stopped pornography. Use such moments to rejoice in the fact that you're ridding yourself of the evil monster. If you have a positive frame of mind, these pangs will become moments of pleasure. Remember, any user, regardless of age, sex, intelligence, or profession, can find it easy and enjoyable to stop, provided you follow all the instructions. Section 24.1 Primary Reasons for Failure There are two primary reasons for failure. The first is the influence of external stimuli, a commercial, online news article, internet browsing, etc. They find themselves in a weak moment, or even become jealous when seeing intimacy in social scenarios. The topic has already been discussed at length. Use the moment to remind yourself there's no such thing as one visitor peak. Rejoice in the fact that you've broken the chain of mental slavery. Remember that the user envies you, and you should feel pity for them, because they need it. The other reason is having a bad day. Get it clear in your mind before you start that whether you're a user or not, you'll have good and bad days. It rains for both the Pope and the murder. Life is relative, and you can't have ups without downs. The issue with the willpower method is that as soon as the user has a bad day, they begin moping for a visit to the harem, which further compounds the issue. The non-user is better equipped to handle stresses and strains, not only physically, but mentally. If you have a bad day during the withdrawal period, take it on the chin. Remind yourself that bad days existed when you were addicted, otherwise you wouldn't have decided to stop. Instead of moping about it, recognize it instead. Okay, so today is not so good, but porn won't cure it. Tomorrow will be better, and at least I've got a marvelous bonus. I've kicked that awful addiction. When you're a porn user, you have to block your mind to pornography's negatives. Users never have brain fog, they're just a bit down. When you're having life's inevitable troubles and you experience a thought of wanting pornography, are you happy and cheerful? Of course you aren't. Once you've stopped, the tendency is blaming everything and anything that goes wrong on the fact you've stopped. If work stresses you out, you think, at times like these, I would have had a session. Now this is true, but the important thing that's forgotten is that pornography didn't solve the problem, and you're simply punishing yourself by moping for illusory crutches. You're creating an impossible situation, miserable because you can't masturbate to porn, yet you'll be even more miserable if you do. You know you've made the correct decision by stopping pornography. So why punish yourself by doubting your decision? Remember, a positive mental approach is essential, always. Chapter 25, Substitutes. Some examples of substitutes include restricting to porn magazines, static internet images, porn diets, etc. Do not use any of them. They make it harder, not easier. If you do get a pang and use a substitute, it will just prolong the pang, making it harder. What you're really saying is that you need pornography to fill the void, which you don't. It'll be like giving in to a hijacker or a child's tantrum, just keeping the pangs coming and prolonging torture. In any event, the substitutes won't relieve the pangs. Your craving is for certain neurotransmitters in the brain, and all it'll do is keep you thinking about pornography. Remember these points. Number one, there is no substitute for true pornography. Number two, you don't need pornography. It's not food, it's poison. When the pangs come, remind yourself that it's users who suffer withdrawal pangs, not non-users. See them for what they are, another evil of the drug. They are the death of the monster. And three, internet pornography creates the void. It doesn't fill it. The quicker you teach your brain that you don't need to watch, the sooner you'll be free. 
In particular, avoid anything that resembles pornography, like men's magazines, movies, romance novels, and commercials. This isn't being closed-minded. It's okay to talk about romance and sex, but not pornography. There is always a way to find when and where to discriminate. It's true that a small proportion of users who attempt to quit using softcore pornography or porn diets do succeed, from their own perspectives, and attribute their success to such use. However, they quit in spite of their use and not because of it. It's unfortunate that many still recommend these measures. Now, this is unsurprising because if you don't fully understand the porn trap, a diet or soft substitute sounds like a very logical solution. It's based on the belief that when you attempt to quit pornography, you have two very powerful enemies to defeat. First is breaking the habit, and second is surviving those terrible physical withdrawal pangs. Now, if you have two enemies to defeat, it's sensible not to fight them simultaneously, but one at a time. So, the theory goes that when you first stop using pornography, you cut down to once a week or use safe porn. Then, once the habit is broken, gradually reduce the supply, thus tackling each enemy separately. Now, that sounds logical, but it's based on incorrect information. Pornography is not a habit, but a dopamine addiction, and the actual pain from withdrawal is almost imperceptible. What you're trying to achieve when quitting is killing both the monsters in your body and brain as quickly as possible. All substitution techniques do is prolong the little monster's life. You don't want him to live. And in turn, this prolongs the brainwashing. Easy Peasy makes it easy to quit immediately, killing the brainwashing before your final session. The little monster will soon be dead, and even while it's dying, it'll be no more of a problem than it was when you were a user. Just think. How can you possibly cure addiction to a drug through recommending the same drug? There are many stories online about those who've quit using hardcore internet pornography but are now hooked on safe alternatives, having fallen for their little monster's justifications. Don't be fooled by the fact that safe porn isn't awful. So was the first high-speed clip. All substitutes have exactly the same effects as any pornography. Some users quitting even begin eating, but although the empty feeling of wanting a session is indistinguishable from hunger for food, one won't satisfy the other. In fact, if there's anything that's designed to make you want pornography, it's stuffing yourself full of food. As previously explained, porn diets and safe porn will only put you in the middle of the tug of war, with resistance to temptation being so annoying that you'll feel relieved visiting your favorite online harem. The chief evil of substitutes is prolonging the real problem, brainwashing. Do you need a substitute for the flu when it's over? Of course you don't. By saying that you need a substitute for porn in your mind, what you're really saying is that you're making a sacrifice. The depression associated with the willpower method is caused by the fact the user believes they're making a sacrifice. All you're doing is substituting one problem for another. There is no pleasure in stuffing yourself with food, cigarettes, or alcohol. You'll just get fat, miserable, and in no time at all, you'll be back on the drug. Casual users find it difficult to dismiss the belief they're being deprived of the little reward, like those who aren't allowed to go online during a period of time during travel or a family event, etc. Some say, I wouldn't know how to unwind if it weren't for pornography. Well, that just proves the point. Often, the break is taken not because the user needs or even wants it, but because the addict, which is what they are, desperately needs to scratch the itch. Remember, the porn sessions were never genuine rewards. They were equivalent to wearing tight shoes in order to feel the pleasure of taking them off. So, if you feel that you must have a little reward, let that be your substitute. While you're working, wear shoes or underwear a size too small, and don't dare ally yourself to remove them until you have your break. Then experience the wonderful moment of relaxation and satisfaction when they're removed. Perhaps you feel that would be rather stupid, and you're absolutely right. It can be difficult to visualize while still in the trap, but that's what users effectively do. It's also hard to visualize that soon you won't need that little reward, and that you'll regard friends who are still in the trap with genuine pity and wonder why they can't see the point. However, if you continue kidding yourself the online harem was a genuine reward, or that you need a substitute, you'll feel deprived and miserable. The chances are that you'll end up falling through the disgusting trap again. If you need a genuine break, like housewives, teachers, doctors, and other workers all do, you'll soon be enjoying that break even more because you won't have to addict yourself. Remember that you don't need a substitute. The pangs are a craving for dopamine and will soon be gone. Let that be your prop for the next few days, and enjoy ridding your body and mind of slavery and dependence. Chapter 26. Should I avoid temptation situations? 
The advice has been direct so far, and has asked you to treat it as instruction rather than suggestion. There are sound, practical reasons for this advice, and those reasons have been backed up by thousands of case studies. On the question of whether or not to try and avoid temptation, this isn't the case. Each user will need to decide for themselves. However, two helpful suggestions can be made to assist you through the process. It's fear of future withdrawal pangs that keeps us using pornography for the remainder of our lives, and this fear consists of two distinct phases. Phase one is, how can I survive without porn? This fear is the panicky feeling the user gets when they're single or have an asexual, uninterested, or unavailable partner. The fear isn't caused by withdrawal pangs, but is a psychological fear of dependency, of being unable to survive without sex and orgasm. It peaks when on the verge of quitting, when your withdrawal pangs are at their lowest. It's the fear of the unknown, the sort of fear that people have when they're learning to dive. The diving board is one foot high, but it feels six feet high. The water is six feet deep, but it appears one foot deep. It takes courage to launch yourself, convinced you're going to smash your head. The launching is the hardest part, but if you find the courage to do it, the rest is easy. This explains why many strong-willed users have never attempted to stop or can survive for only a few days when they do. In fact, there are some users on porn diets who, upon deciding to stop, actually binge and escalate to harsher clips more quickly than if they hadn't decided to stop. The decision causes panic, which is stressful, and triggers a cue to take a trip to the harem. But now you can't have one, which leads to thoughts of deprivation, compounding your stress. The trigger activates quickly when the fuse blows and you fire up the browser. Don't worry, the panic is just psychological. It's the fear that you're dependent. The beautiful truth is that you aren't, even when you're still addicted. Don't panic and launch yourself. Phase 2 is longer term fear. This is long term, involving fear that certain situations in the future won't be enjoyable or you won't be able to cope with trauma without pornography. Don't worry, if you can launch yourself off the diving board, you'll find the opposite to be the case. The avoidance of temptation itself falls into two categories. Number one goes something like, I'll subscribe to a porn diet of once in four days. I'll feel confident, knowing I can go online if it gets difficult. If I fail, it's okay, I'll just add additional days to my next cycle. The failure rate with people doing this is far higher than those quitting altogether. This is mainly due to the fact that you're having a bad moment during the withdrawal period. It's easy to hop on the browser and visit the harem with the above excuses. If you have the indignity of clearly breaking your own rules like a shattered glass window, you're more likely to overcome the temptation. In any event, the pang would probably already have passed if you'd have delayed it. However, the main reason for the high failure rate in these cases is that the user didn't feel completely committed to stopping in the first place. Remember the first two essentials to succeed. Certainty and isn't it marvelous that I don't need porn anymore? In either case, why on earth do you need a session? If you still need to visit your harem, reread the book. Something hasn't quite gelled. Take the time to kill the big brainwashing monster in your mind stone dead. The second is, should I avoid stressful or social occasions during the withdrawal period? In the case of stressful situations, yes. There's no sense putting undue pressure on yourself. In the case of social events like bars or clubs, the advice is the reverse. Go out and enjoy yourself straight away. You don't need sex or the propagative side of sex when you're addicted to pornography. Go out and rejoice the fact you don't have to have sex or propagative sex. It will quickly prove to you the beautiful truth that life is much better without these pressures. Just think of how much better it'll be when the little monster has left you, together with those needy thoughts. Chapter 27 the moment of revelation. Usually within three weeks post escape, X users experience the moment of revelation. The sky appears to become brighter, and it's the moment when the brainwashing ends completely. When instead of telling yourself you don't need to watch porn, you suddenly realize that the last thread is broken and you can enjoy the rest of your life without ever needing it again. It's also from this point that you usually start looking at other users as objects of pity. Quitters using the willpower method don't normally experience this moment, because although they're glad to be ex-users, they continue moving through life believing they're making some sort of sacrifice. The more you are addicted, the more marvelous this moment is, and it lasts a lifetime. While there are many joys in life, it's often impossible to recapture the actual feeling of experiencing them. The joy of not having to watch porn anymore is different, however. 
If feeling low and needing a boost, remind yourself of how lovely it is not to be hooked on that awful addiction. Many list it as one of the greatest events of their lives. In most cases, the moment of revelation takes place not after three weeks, but after a few days of quitting. In my own case, it happened before finishing my last harem visit. I'm sure many of the readers here, before they'd even got to the end of the chapters, would say something like, You need it, say another word. I can see it all so clearly. I know I'll never need porn again. Based on the feedback received, this happens frequently. Ideally, if you follow all the instructions and understand the psychology completely, it should happen to you immediately. While it is stated that it takes around five days for noticeable physical withdrawal to go, and about three weeks for an ex-user to get completely free, such guidelines can actually cause two problems. The first being that the suggestion is implanted in people's minds that they'll have to suffer between five days and three weeks. The second is that the ex-user tends to think, if I can survive for five days or three weeks, I can expect a real boost at the end of that period. However, they may have five pleasant days or three pleasant weeks, and then they're followed by disastrous days that strike anyone, which have nothing to do with addiction, but are caused by other factors in our lives. Then, our ex-user who's been waiting for the moment of revelation experiences depression instead. It could destroy their confidence. By the same token, if there were no guidelines, the ex-user could spend the rest of their life waiting for nothing to happen. This is what happens to the vast majority of those who stop using the willpower method. People often ask about the significance of the five days in three weeks. Are they just periods drawn out of the blue? No. While they aren't definite dates, they do reflect an accumulation of feedback from over the years. About five days after stopping is when the ex-user ceases to have the addiction as the main occupation of their mind. Most ex-users experience revelation around this period, generally in stressful or social situations, that at one point they weren't able to cope with or weren't as enjoyable without a harem visit. You suddenly realize that not only are you enjoying or coping with it, but the thought of pornography has never even occurred to you. From that point on, it's usually plain sailing. That's when you know you're free. It's both mine and the experience of many others attempting to stop using the willpower method that around the three-week period is when the most serious attempts to stop fail. What usually happens is that after about three weeks, you sense you've lost the desire to watch pornography. You then need to prove this to yourself, so you hop on the browser to visit your harem. It feels weird proving you've kicked it, but in the process, you've greased the Delta Foss B water slide thanks to the fresh dopamine rush, what your body has been craving for the last three weeks. As soon as you finish the deed, the dopamine starts to leave your body, and a little voice reappears. You haven't kicked it. You want another one. You don't scurry back right away immediately because you don't want to get hooked again, allowing a safe period to pass. When you're next tempted, you're able to say in yourself, well, I didn't get hooked again, so there's no harm in having another one. You're already on your way down the slippery slope. The key to the problem isn't waiting for the moment of revelation, but to realize that once you close the browser, it's finished. You've cut off the supply of oxygen to your little monster. No force on earth can prevent you from being free, unless you mope about it or wait for revelation. Go and enjoy life. Cope with it right from the start. The moment will soon arrive. Chapter 28, The Final Visit Having decided on timing, you're now ready to visit your harem one last time. Before you do so, check on the two essentials. Number one, do you feel certain of success? And number two, do you have a feeling of doom and gloom or a sense of excitement that you're about to achieve something marvelous? If you have any doubts, reread the book first. Remember that you never decided to fall into the porn trap but the trap is designed to enslave you for life. In order to escape, you need to make the positive decision that you're about to stop and make your final visit. Remember, the only reason you've read this book so far is because you dearly love to escape. So make that positive decision now. Make a solemn vow that when you close your private browser window, whether finding it easy or difficult, you'll never visit your harem again. Perhaps you're worried that you made this vow several times in the past and are still failing, or that you'll have to go through awful trauma. Have no fear. The worst thing that can possibly happen is that you fail. So therefore, you have absolutely nothing to lose and so much to gain. But stop even thinking about failure. The beautiful truth is that it's not only ridiculously easy to quit, but you can actually enjoy the process. 
This time, you're going to use easy peasy. All you need to do is follow the simple instructions about to be given. Number one, make the solemn vow now and mean it. Number two, browse the pictures and clips on your favorite tube site consciously, looking at the desperate attempts by the site administrators, actors, and even amateurs to amplify the shock, novelty, and super normal nature of their wares and ask yourself where the pleasure is. Number three, when you finally close the browser, don't do so with the feeling of, I must never visit another online harem again, or I'm not allowed to visit another, but instead with a feeling of freedom, like, isn't it great? I'm free. I'm no longer a slave to porn. I don't ever have to visit any of these filthy sites in my life again. And four, be aware that for a few days, there will be a little porn saboteur inside your stomach. You might only be aware of the feeling of wanting a session for certain periods. The little porn monster has been referred to as the slight physical craving for dopamine. But strictly speaking, this is incorrect and it's important to understand why. Because it takes up to three weeks for that little monster to die, X users believe the little monster will continue to crave after the final harem visit, and therefore they must use willpower to resist the temptation during this period. This isn't so. The body doesn't crave porn-triggered dopamine, only the brain craves. If you do get that feeling of wanting a peak over the next few days, your brain has a simple choice. It can either interpret that feeling for what it actually is, which is an empty, insecure feeling started by the first visit to an online porn site and further perpetuated by each subsequent one, and saying to yourself, yippee, I'm a non-user. Or you can start craving for pornography and suffer the remainder of your life. Just think for a moment, wouldn't that be an incredibly stupid thing to do? To say, I never want to watch porn again, and then spending the rest of your life saying, I love a visit. That's what those using the willpower method do, and it's no wonder they feel so miserable, spending the rest of their lives desperately moping for something that they desperately hope they'll never have. No wonder that so few succeed, and the few that do never feel completely free. What follows is a quote by Maxwell Maltz. Get this mental picture clearly in your mind, for it can be quite helpful in overcoming the power of external stimuli to disturb you. See yourself sitting quietly and letting a phone ring ignoring its signal, unmoved by its command. Although you are aware of it, you no longer mind or obey it. Also, get clearly in your mind the fact that the outside signal in itself has no power over you, no power to move you. In the past, you have obeyed it, responded to it, purely out of habit. You can, if you wish, form a new habit of not responding. Also notice that your failure to respond does not consist in doing something or making an effort or resisting or fighting, but in doing nothing, in relaxation from doing. You merely relax, ignore the signal, and let its summons go unheeded. The telephone ringing is a symbolic analogy to any and every other outside stimulus you might habitually give control over to, and now choose to very intentionally alter that habit. That was from the New Psycho-Cybernetics in Chapter 12. It is only doubting and waiting that makes it difficult to quit pornography, so never doubt your decision because you know it's the correct one. If you begin to doubt it, you'll put yourself in a no-win situation, miserable while craving a visit but unable to have one. No matter what system you're using, what are you trying to achieve in quitting pornography? Never to watch again? No. Many ex-users do that, but go through the rest of their lives feeling deprived. What's the difference between users and non-users? Non-users haven't any need nor desire to watch pornography. They're without craving and don't need to exercise willpower in order to not watch it. That's what you're trying to achieve and it's completely within your power to do so. You don't have to wait to stop craving pornography or become a non-user. It's completed the moment you close that final browser window, cutting off the supply of dopamine you are already a happy non-user. You'll remain a happy non-user, provided that first, you never doubt your decision. Second, you don't wait to become a non-user. If you do wait, you'll merely be waiting for nothing to happen and creating a phobia. Third, you don't try not to think about pornography or wait for the moment of revelation to come, creating a phobia. Fourth, you don't use substitutes. And fifth, you see all the other users as they really are and pity them rather than envy them.
Whether there are good or bad days, don't change your life just because you've quit. If you do, you'll be making a genuine sacrifice when there is no need to. Remember, you haven't given up living. You haven't given up anything. On the contrary, you've cured yourself from an awful disease and escaped from an insidious prison. As days pass and your health, both physically and mentally, improves, the highs will appear higher and the lows less low than when you were a user. Whenever you think of pornography during the next few days or the rest of your life, think, yippee, I'm a non-user. Section 28.1, a final warning. No user, if given the chance of going back to the time before they became hooked, with the knowledge they have now, would opt to start. Tens of thousands who successfully kick the habit for many years lead perfectly happy lives only to get trapped once again. I trust this book will help you to find it relatively easy to stop, but be warned, users who find it easy to stop find it just as easy to start again. Do not fall for that trap. No matter how long you've stopped or how confident you are, you're never going to become hooked again. Make it a rule for life to not watch pornography for any reason. Resist the illusions and innuendos in the media, and remember how they're pushing their image of openness by bringing pornography into the mainstream, unaware that pornography and compulsive masturbation are killers of relationships and of the personal sense of well-being for a huge number of men and increasing numbers of women. Remember that the first peak or visit will do nothing for you. You have no withdrawal pangs to relieve and it will make you feel awful. What it will do is put the pleasure of the dopamine rush into your mind and brain, and the little voice at the back of your mind will be telling you that you want another one. Then you've got the choice of being miserable for a while, or starting the whole filthy chain again. Chapter 29. Feedback. The war isn't against users, but the porn industry trap and it's waged for the simple reason that I enjoy waging it. Every time I hear about a user escaping from the prison, I get a feeling of immense pleasure. But this pleasure hasn't been without considerable frustration, mainly caused by two categories of porn user. In spite of the warnings in the previous chapter, I'm continually surprised by the number of those who find it easy to stop, yet later get hooked and find they can't succeed the next time. It's like finding someone up to their neck in a swamp and about to go under. You help pull them out and they're grateful, but then, six months later, they dive straight back into the swamp. Users who find it easy to stop and start again pose a special problem. However, when you get free, please, please don't make the same mistake. They believe such people start again because they're still hooked and are missing the dopamine. In fact, they find stopping so easy that they lose their fear of pornography. They think to themselves, I can have an odd session, and even if I do get hooked again, I'll find it easy to stop. I'm afraid it just doesn't work that way, because it's easy to stop pornography, but it's impossible to control the addiction. The one thing that is essential to stopping pornography is not using it. People usually come back to pornography because they misunderstand the easy and easy peasy. Imagine someone sitting on the cold concrete floor of a freezing room. On the wall opposite to them, there's a window showing a perfect spring day outside. Trees gently swaying, birds chirping, right next to an unlocked door. Does it take any willpower getting out of that freezing room? No. Is escaping any harder than staying? Of course not. In fact, it's a little easier because of the body moving. Why would anyone in their right mind put themselves in such a situation, causing themselves months or years of frustration unless they were tricked? Easy Peasy pushes aside the curtains so the user can see outside clearly and removes delusions on how terrible outside can be and how comfortable the user is in the room. Now there's another category of frustrating users and these are those too frightened to make the attempt to stop or when they do, they find it a great struggle. The main difficulties with these users appear to be the following. First is fear of failure. There's no disgrace in failure but not trying is plain stupidity. Look at it this way, you're hiding from nothing. The worst thing that can happen is that you fail, in which case you're no worse off than you are now. Just think of how wonderful it will be to succeed. If you don't make the attempt, you're guaranteed failure. Fear of pain and being miserable. Don't worry about it. Just think what awful things could happen to you if you never watch pornography again. Absolutely nothing. Terrible things will happen if you continue. Reread the notes on Pascal's Wager. In any case, the panic is caused by dopamine and will soon be gone. The greatest gain is being rid of that fear. 
Do you really believe that users are prepared to have fading penetrations, unreliable sexual performance, or the illusory pleasure that they get from porn? If you find yourself getting panicky, deep breathing can help. If you're with other people and they're getting you down, escape from them and go to the garage or an empty office or somewhere. If you feel like crying, don't be ashamed. Crying is nature's way of relieving tension, and no one has ever had a good cry without feeling better afterwards. One of the awful things we do to young people is conditioning them not to cry. You can see them trying to fight back the tears, but watch the jaw grinding away. We teach ourselves not to show emotion, but we're not meant to bottle them up inside. Scream, shout, have a tantrum, kick something. Regard your struggle as a boxing match that you can't lose. A boxing match against the monsters in your body. Nobody can stop time. Every moment that passes, that little monster inside you is dying. Enjoy your inevitable victory. Then there's not following the instructions. Incredibly, some users say the method doesn't work, and then they describe how they ignored not one instruction, but practically all of them. For clarity, these are listed at the end of this chapter. Then there's misunderstanding the instructions. And the chief problems with this appear to be, I can't stop thinking about pornography, which of course you can't, and if you try, you'll create a phobia, becoming miserable. It's like trying to get sleep at night. The more you try, the harder it becomes. It doesn't matter if you think about pornography for 90% of your life. It's what you're thinking that's important. If you're thinking, oh, I'd love to look at it again, or when will I be free, you'll just be miserable. If you're instead thinking, yippee, I'm free, you'll be happy. Then another misunderstanding is, when will the little porn monster die? The dopamine flush leaves your body very rapidly, but it's impossible to tell when your body will cease suffering from the physical sensation of dopamine withdrawal. That empty, insecure feeling is identical to normal hunger, depression, or stress. All pornography does is increase the level of it. This is why users who stop using the willpower method are never quite sure if they've kicked it, even after the body has ceased suffering dopamine withdrawal. And if they're suffering from normal hunger or stress at a moment, their brain is telling them that is a valid reason to claim their entitled session. The point being that you don't have to wait for the craving to go, since it's so slight that we don't even know it's there, only knowing it as a feeling of wanting. When you leave the dentist, do you wait for your jaw to stop aching? Of course you don't. You get on with your life. Even though your jaw is still aching, you're elated. It's over. Don't wait for withdrawals to leave because you'll create doubt by constantly asking yourself, how long will this take? Am I even free if I don't feel any different? Fear is the actual pang. Therefore, waiting for life to get better after quitting will create doubt. Withdrawal is imperceptible unless you fear it, and the exponential improvements in neurology are slow, so if you wait to feel different, you'll feel like nothing is happening, creating doubt. Then there's, the moment of revelation hasn't arrived yet, another misunderstanding of the instructions. If you wait on it, you're just creating another phobia. I once stopped for three weeks on the willpower method. Chatting with an old friend, he asked me how I was getting on, and I replied, I've survived three weeks. And so he queried, what do you mean you've survived three weeks? And I clarified, I've gone three weeks without pornography. And he said, what are you going to do? Survive the rest of your life? What are you waiting for? You've done it. You're a non-user. I thought he's absolutely right. What am I waiting for? Unfortunately, due to lack of understanding of the trap, I was soon back in. But the point was noted. You become a non-user when closing your browser. The important thing is to be a happy non-user from the start. Another misunderstanding is, I'm still craving porn. Then you're being very stupid. How can you claim that you want to be a non-user and then say you want pornography? That's a contradiction. If you say that you want pornography, you're saying you want to be a user. Non-users don't want to visit the disgusting tube sites. You already know what you want to be, so stop punishing yourself. Some other people misunderstand and opt out of their life. Why? All you have to do is stop killing yourself and start energizing instead. You don't have to stop in the slightest. It's as simple as this. For the next couple of days, you'll have a slight trauma in your life. Your body will suffer the almost imperceptible aggravation and withdrawal from demands and claims for a dopamine surge. Now bear this in mind, you're no worse off than you were. This is what you've been suffering for the entirety of your life. Every time you've been asleep, in church, the supermarket, or library, it didn't seem to bother you while you were a user, and if you don't stop, you'll go on suffering this distress for the rest of your life. Pornography and orgasms don't make occasions, they deprive you of them. Even while your body is still craving dopamine, meals and social occasions are marvelous. 
Life is marvelous. Go to social functions, even if there are naked dancers there. Remember that you're not being deprived, they are. Every single one of them would love to be in your position, if only they knew. Enjoy being the prima donna and center of attention. Stopping pornography is a wonderful conversation point, taking a secret pleasure they cannot. Your friends and peers will be surprised to see that you, formerly shying and tired looking, are now happy and cheerful. You'll be enjoying life right from the start. There's no need to envy pickup artists at parties. They'll be envying you, if only they knew. Then some people say, I'm miserable and irritable. Well, that's a failure to follow instructions. Find out which one it is. Some people understand and believe everything written, but will start off with a feeling of doom and gloom as if something terrible was happening. You're not only doing what you'd like to do, but what every user on the planet would like as well. With any other method of stopping, the X user is trying to achieve a certain frame of mind, so every porn-related thought is punctuated by, Yippee! I'm free! If that's your objective, why wait? Start off in that frame of mind and never lose it. There is no alternative. Then some people have a good week, month, six months, but then go back into the trap. Remember, fear is the pang itself. Giving in to a pang generates more fear, feeding the weakened little monster and succeeding in spooking the non-user into thinking you're hooked for life. In reality, their conceptualization of the brainwashing hasn't changed, but they've given dopamine to the thought process. This is by definition falling forward, but is a failure to follow instructions. Understand which one it is below and rejoice. Section 29.1. The Checklist. If you follow these instructions, you cannot fail. Number 1. Make a solemn vow that you'll never, ever go online to visit your harem or settle for static pictures or make peace with erotic graphics or anything that contains supernormal stimuli and stick that vow. 2. Get this clear in your mind. There's absolutely nothing to give up. By that, it isn't meant that you will be better off as a non-PMOer because you've known that all along, nor that although there is no rational reason why you PMO, you'll get some pleasure or crutch from it since otherwise you wouldn't do it. What's meant is that there is no genuine pleasure or crutch in PMOing. It's just an illusion, like banging your head against a wall to get pleasure when you stop. 3. There is no such thing as a confirmed PMOer. You're just one of the hundreds of millions who've fallen for the subtle trap. Like the millions of other ex-PMOers who once thought they couldn't escape, you've escaped. 4. If at any time in your life you were to weigh up the pros and cons of PMOing, the overwhelming conclusion would always be, stop doing it, you're a fool. Nothing will ever change that. It's always been that way, and always will be. Having made what you know to be the correct decision, don't ever torture yourself by doubting. Pascal's wager perfectly applies to PMO, with no chance of loss, high chances of gains, and even higher chances of avoiding losses. 5. Don't try not to think about pornography, or worry that you're thinking about it constantly. Whenever you do think about it, whether today, tomorrow, or the rest of your life, think, yippee, I'm a non-PMOer. 6. Do not use any form of substitute. Do not challenge yourself by keeping your laptop next to you while you sleep. Do not avoid plays, movies, or magazines. Do not change your lifestyle in any way purely just because you've stopped. If you follow the above instructions, you'll soon experience the moment of revelation, but 7. Don't wait for the moment of revelation to come. Just get on with your life, enjoying the highs and coping with the lows. You'll find in no time at all, the moment will arrive. Chapter 30. Help those on the sinking ship. Porn users are panicking nowadays, sensing changes in the way that internet pornography is perceived by men and women. Internet porn's addictive nature is being studied increasingly often, now rightly regarded as being different from traditional pornography. Effortlessness and availability raises alarm even in the hearts of porn supporters. They've also sensed that the crusade for free speech and thought is being hijacked by various elements. The wild west of the unpoliced internet makes it near impossible to enforce age restrictions to supernormal stimuli. It's unfortunate that this won't come to an end anytime soon, but hundreds of thousands of users are stopping, with most addicts aware of studies showing similarities between pornography and substance addiction. Each time a user leaves the sinking ship, the ones left on it feel even more miserable. Every user instinctively knows that it's ridiculous to self-sabotage and spend time in front of two-dimensional pixels, supercharging their brain, and in the process, developing neural pathways that guarantee poor sexual performance. If you still don't think it's silly, try talking to a porn magazine standing at the center of your city and ask yourself what the difference is. Just one. 
you can't get the pleasure of warmth and intimacy that way. If you can stop buying alcohol and cigarettes every time you go grocery shopping, then you can definitely stop visiting your online harem. Users can't find rational reasons for watching pornography, but they don't feel quite so silly if other people do it too. Users blatantly lie about their habit, not just to researchers and those around them, but to themselves. They have to. The brainwashing is essential if they're to retain some self-respect. They feel the need to justify their habit not only to themselves, but to non-users. They're forever advertising the illusory advantages of pornography by subtler means. If a user stops by the willpower method, they still feel deprived, tending to become a moaner. All this does is to confirm to other users how right they are to continue using. If the ex-user succeeds in kicking the habit, they're even then grateful they no longer have to go through life self-sabotaging or wasting energy and have no need to justify themselves. Remember, it's fear that keeps the user's head in the sand, only questioning their behavior when stopping. Help the user by removing those fears. Tell them how marvelous it is not having to go through life living in a prison. How lovely it is to wake up in the morning feeling fit and healthy instead of lacking energy and self-loathing. How wonderful it is to be free of slavery, to be able to enjoy the whole of your life and to be rid of those black shadows. Or even still, get them to read this book. It's essential not to belittle a married user by indicating they're deliberately ruining their relationship or it's in some way cheating or unclean. There's a common misconception that the ex-user is worse in this aspect. This conception has some substance, but is generally due to the willpower method of stopping. Because the ex-user, although having kicked the habit, still retains parts of the brainwashing and still believes they've made a sacrifice, they feel vulnerable and their natural defense mechanism is to attack the porn user. This might boost the ex-user's ego, but it does nothing to help the actual user they're trying to help. All it does is put their back up against the wall, making them feel even more wretched and consequently their need for pornography becomes greater. Although the change in the medical establishment's attitude to internet pornography is the main reason why many users are quitting, it doesn't make it any easier to do so. In fact, it makes it a great deal harder. Most users nowadays believe they're stopping primarily for health reasons, but that isn't strictly true. Although the enormous health risk is obviously the chief reason for quitting, users have been self-sabotaging their virility for years and it hasn't made the slightest bit of difference. The main reason why users are stopping is because society is beginning to see pornography unmasked for what it is, drug addiction. Society's attitudes are slowly changing. Many wives or husbands would now ask questions if you're on your laptop in the middle of the night. Complete bans on pornography in some countries or the unavailability of internet are classic examples of the traveling user's dilemma. Generally, they take the attitude that it will help them cut down on their intake. The result being that instead of one or two a day, neither of which they would have enjoyed, they abstain for an entire week. During this enforced period of abstinence, however, not only will they be mentally deprived waiting for their reward, but their body is craving too. Oh, how precious that online harem visit is when they're eventually allowed. Enforced abstinences don't actually cut down the intake, because the user just indulges themselves even more when finally allowed to be alone. All it does is to ingrain in the user's mind how precious internet pornography is, and how dependent they are upon it. The most insidious aspect of this enforced abstinence is its effect on adolescents. We allow the hijackers of freedom of expression, the porn producers, to target unfortunate teenagers to get them hooked in the first place. Then, at what is probably the most stressful period in their lives, when in their deluded minds they need porn most of all, we blackmail them into giving up because of the harm they're causing themselves. Many are unable to do so and are forced, through no fault of their own, to suffer a guilt complex for the rest of their lives. Many succeed though and are pleased to do so, thinking, fine, I'll do this for now and after it's over, I'll be cured anyway. Then comes the pain and fear finding work and other adult struggles, followed by the biggest high of their lives, finding a job. The pain and fear are over, now feeling secure. And so the old trigger mechanism comes back into operation. Part of the brainwashing still being there and before the smell of the new work laptop is gone, the user is at the threshold of their favorite online harem. The elation of the occasion blocks the foul feelings from their mind, and they have no intention of becoming hooked again, but just one peek couldn't hurt. Too late. They're already hooked again. The old craving for the little monster will begin again, and even if they don't become hooked again straight away, post-high depression will probably catch them out. It's strange that although heroin addicts are criminals in law, society's response is helping these individuals. 
let's adopt the same attitude to the poor porn user. They're not doing it because they want to, but because they think they have to. Unlike the heroin addict, they usually suffer years upon years of mental and physical torture. We always say a quick death is better than a slow one, so don't envy the poor porn user. They deserve your pity. Chapter 31. Advice to Non-Users. Section 31.1. Help get your porn-using friends to read this book. First, study the contents of this book and try to put yourself in the place of the user. Don't force them to read this book by telling them they're ruining their health or playing with fire. They know this better than you do. Users don't continue viewing pornography because they enjoy it or because they want to. They only tell themselves and others this in order to retain some self-respect. They do it because they're dependent on pornography, and because they think it relaxes them, gives them courage or confidence, a pleasure or crutch, and because they feel that life will never be enjoyable without sex, or at least their version of it. If you try and force a user to stop, they'll feel like a trapped animal and want their harem even more. This may turn them into a secret user and pornography will become even more precious in their mind. Instead, concentrate on the other side of the coin. Get them into the company of ex-users, blogs, forums, etc., though beware of advocacy for the willpower method among these people. Get them to tell the user how they too thought they were hooked for life, and how much better life is as a non-user. Once you've got them into believing they can stop, their mind will start to open up. Then start explaining the delusion created by withdrawal pangs. Not only are the dopamine rushes not giving them a boost, they're destroying their confidence and making them irritable and tired. They should now be ready to read this book themselves, expecting to read pages upon pages of stories about unreliable arousal, fading penetrations, PIED, PE, etc. Explain that this approach is completely different, and references to illness are tiny fractions of the material. In short, don't let this book die in darkness. Tell your friends, but don't be weird about it. If you try to win the conversation or have a debate, you'll only succeed in alienating them and further increasing their fear. Section 31.2. Should I tell my significant other? Should I tell my wife, girlfriend, or partner about my habit, the intention being to assist you in quitting? Well, there's multiple factors at play here. If you've already been failing to quit using the willpower method and have already told your partner, tell them about your new approach and allow them to educate themselves by reading the book. They'll be able to assist and motivate you during the withdrawal period and are a stronghold when the little monster attempts to trip you up. If you've only just become aware of the existence of the porn trap and haven't attempted quitting in the past, first use Easy Peasy yourself. As explained previously, this should be an enjoyable experience. However, if you're finding it difficult, request their assistance. Be open and vulnerable with your partner and it'll strengthen your relationship. Provided you're enjoying escaping and aren't finding it difficult through indecision, there isn't much reason to let your wife or husband know. If it wasn't an issue in the past, let it die. However, be prepared that your partner might wonder why you're looking, feeling, and performing better. Section 31.3 My wife or husband is quitting porn. Pornography is a perverse destroyer of relationships, and while quitting can be done instantly, healing takes time. Many users, due to irrational beliefs spawned from their addiction, take out their anger on partners and loved ones. These behaviors manifest in gaslighting, lying, and manipulative behaviors. This isn't all users, but it's increasingly common in later stages of the disease. While these behaviors may have manifested from the underlying porn addiction, it's important to educate yourself about these behaviors and, if recognized, consider seeing a therapist specializing in sexual addictions. If your partner is within the withdrawal period, assume they're suffering whether they are or not. Don't attempt to minimize it by telling them it's easy to stop. They can do that themselves. Instead, continue telling them how proud you are, how much better they're looking, how much sweeter it is to be with them, and how much easier they are in general. It's particularly important to keep doing this because when a user makes an attempt to stop, the euphoria of the attempt and the praise they get from peers can help them along. However, they tend to forget quickly, so keep the praise coming. Because they're not talking about pornography, you may think they've forgotten and don't want you to remind them. Usually, the complete opposite is the case with the willpower method, as the ex-user tends to be obsessed with nothing else. So don't be frightened to bring the subject up and keep praising them. They'll tell you if they don't want to be reminded. Go out of your way to relieve them of the pressures during the withdrawal period, thinking of ways you can make their life interesting and enjoyable. This can also be a trying period for non-users who've never had the addiction, 
If one member of a group is irritable, it can cause general misery all around. So, anticipate this. If the X user is feeling irritable, they may well take it out on you. But don't retaliate. It's at this time they need your praise and sympathy the most. If you're feeling irritable yourself, which is understandable, try not to show it. One of the tricks an addict will play when trying to give up with the aid of the willpower method is getting in tantrums, hoping that their partner or friends would say, I can't bear to see you suffering like this. For goodness sake, just take your poison. The user, therefore, doesn't have to lose face since they aren't giving up, they've been instructed. If the X user pulls this ploy, on no account encourage them to relapse. Instead say, if this is what porn does to you, thank goodness you'll soon be free. How marvelous that you had the courage to give up. Remember, there are two healing parties with the recovery journey. When your partner is quitting pornography, it's important to have your own support network, self-care routines, and boundaries. This process doesn't happen overnight, requiring trust, communication, and accountability. Journaling, developing your own passions, and most importantly, therapy, assist this process. Section 31.4, Slipping or Relapse. The existence of this section should serve as a warning to those leaving the trap. Personally, I have never relapsed, but I will use the experiences from interviews with community members and tools from cognitive behavioral therapy to illustrate. Firstly, calling it a relapse is counterproductive. All that's happened is that you've slipped and fed the little monster, which in turn starts up the big brainwashing monster. Users who slip, which is by definition falling forward, typically spawn a whole range of irrational beliefs. For example, I'll never be free, which is catastrophizing. I should or must exercise, study, and be fruitful every single day of my life, also known as masturbating. Today, I PMO'd. So what's even the use of reading all the books and forums? My goal was not even to do M, but here I am, a failure, relapsing. And that shows low frustration tolerance. My friends or others are doing no PMO for N a number of days, but I can't, so I'm a hopeless case. It felt good yesterday since I studied well and was fruitful, but today I didn't. I'm going downhill. This is rating between self and others. Then they say stuff like, I shouldn't have sexual thoughts. Themselves, parents, or their society as a whole has installed rigid beliefs in relation to sex. Ask yourself if self-flagellation is helping you to reach your goals, and if you are, are you enjoying the journey? Factors that culminate in the user's brainwashing are seemingly infinite. You know yourself better than anyone else, but it's obviously a failure to follow instructions. You saw value in pornography, but how? What's often overlooked is that it takes time to reverse the brainwashing. This doesn't make it any harder, but nearly every industry uses sex, and actively countering brainwashing is a conscious process, at least to begin with, so it might take time to fully solidify the lessons contained within. Hence, multiple readings are recommended, and you can skip the chapters you're having difficulty with, and this shouldn't take you too long. A surprisingly common experience for religious users leaving the trap is wanting it to hurt a little bit, as a form of atonement. They find quitting so easy, they feel guilty for feeling this way. But why self-sabotage and make it hard? The little monster is very sneaky in this regard. Disassociate yourself from the little monster. It was added by the porn industry long ago. Imagine a bully having a tantrum on the school playground. What do you say to a bully? If you give in, you'll just reinforce them. Some who quit end up feeding the bully and so increase their brainwashing, but their conceptualization of the trap hasn't changed. Pick yourself up, figure out where you went wrong, and enjoy freedom. You are not your urge. You can't fight with yourself or with the little monster. You've got to unconditionally love yourself and the process. But remove failure from your mind. Here's a section from Meditations of a Porn Addict by Guliaco, linked in the resources section at the end of the book. Since watching pornography offers you zero benefits, it's something that only hurts you and it's extremely ridiculous to want to do something like that, I compare it to drinking bleach. Here you go. The hard journey of not drinking bleach. Hi, we're No Bleach, and we're hosting rebooting challenges in which participants, also known as bleached or not, abstain from drinking bleach for a period of time. Whether your goal is casual participation in a monthly challenge is a test of self-control, or whether excessive bleach drinking has become a problem in your life and you want to quit for a longer period of time, you'll find a supportive community and plenty of resources here. Here's some testimonies. Sometimes I allow myself to drink one or another glass of bleach. I know about the one drop being a lie, but I don't think a single glass will hurt. 
one cannot destroy all the hours that I have spent without doing so. I don't have a problem stopping drinking bleach, but sometimes I go down the street and I see someone drinking water, you know, in a glass, and I imagine that glass has bleach in it. Then I have a craving, and after debating with myself whether I should or not, I finally give in at night and drink a glass. Look, my problem is that sometimes when I'm alone in my kitchen, I start to see the glasses. Sometimes I tempt myself by opening the container where I keep the bleach. Sometimes I smell it and, well, I end up right back where I started. I'm so desperate to stop this, but I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to stop. Stopping bleach is impossible. I mean, I always have a mouth, you know? How am I supposed to stop if I always have a throat, which reminds me I can swallow bleach? Oh man, it was going so well, 19 whole days without doing it. The important thing is to learn from failure. Now I know what to avoid doing, looking at cleaning products in the supermarket. I will try to make it to a month. I'll reset my counter. Wish me luck. That ends the testimonies, but if you have an urge, calm down, dude. Remember what the hackbook says. Bleach is difficult to give up because of the fear of being deprived of a pleasure or prop. The fear that certain pleasant situations will never be quite the same again. The fear of being unable to cope with stressful situations. In other words, it's the effects of brainwashing deluding us into believing that buying bleach, and by extension drinking it, is a must for all human beings. Even further, it's the belief there's something inherent in affordable bleach that we need, and that when we stop using, we will be denying ourselves and creating a void. Make this clear in your mind. Bleach doesn't fill a void, it creates one. And I say, suppose you're forced to watch a glass full of bleach for five minutes. Try to remember one of those brands or smells that you like so much. Maybe it's accompanied by some sound, or you only remember selected details. The bleach is there and you can't close your eyes or turn your head, because this bleach is in your mind. It's a memory recorded in you. Alright, so do you feel any craving? Do you feel anything in your tongue or any change in your breathing? What are your feelings and what are you remembering? Get them identified. The bleach wants to cloud them, make them confusing, and make you only pay attention to that which wants to catch you. Alright, so with the above, I'm not trying to dismiss your feelings, much less say something like, Haha, I'm smart, you're dumb! But to give you perspective, so that you realize how ridiculously easy it is, and always will be, to overcome this addiction. Watching pornography is not like an on-off switch where you say, Oh well, I'm in situation X, then I'll watch pornography. These are fantasies. Lies. How often do you allow yourself to drink a glass of bleach? Never. Why? Because it's a horrible thing, that's why. How are you supposed to escape your addiction if you don't realize that PMO is a horrible thing to do to yourself? Section 31.5 What about MO? Masturbation and Orgasm well, people, health-wise, have been masturbating for eons without issues, so to be clear, pornography is the problem. But with that being said, you can still get hooked on MO for the same reasons as pornography, such as the need to have an orgasm mentality, mental escalation, forcing the body to have sex, and just plain hedonistic pleasure-seeking. It's exceedingly likely that pornography and masturbation have become deeply intertwined in your mind. Many users find they end up relapsing as a result of masturbating to porn-induced fantasies. As your brain rewires, you'll find this brainwashing eventually fades, but it's best to take a break from masturbation and orgasm. Now this isn't an instruction, but evaluated. Reported benefits from semen retention are numerous. Increased focus and energy, removal of brain fog, and increased confidence, along with a slew of other benefits. From personal experience, there's a clear difference, and it's all down to how you sublimate this increased energy. Speculating, and without strict scientific knowledge, the benefits might come down to a couple of different factors. First of all, after orgasm, the brain releases prolactin, which inhibits dopamine release. Second, depriving your brain of dopamine flushes allows more uptake from simply living life. Third, semen is reabsorbed by the bloodstream about after 78 days, and it's a very good nutrient for your body. And fourth, sublimating sexual energy into productive habits brings with it an extra layer of productivity. Section 31.6 Deviations from Standard Advice This section is new and is written somewhat apprehensively. Even still, it must be mentioned. Some people using Easy PC find their desire to watch pornography become so reduced that they can't bring themselves to have a final session. Now this is fine, but don't underestimate the power of having one. Mindfully browsing and solidifying just how much you dislike pornography, masturbation, and orgasm can be really powerful. Personally, I found it really useful and was happy to wash my hands clean of it, genuinely relieved to never have it do it again. However, your mileage may vary. 
If you've already been freed from the trap for a while and have just removed the brainwashing, there's no need to feed the little monster as it would just nag you. Enjoy freedom instead. Section 31.7. Help end this scandal. Internet pornography is one of the dangers in a free society, piggybacking on the goodwilled efforts of advocates for personal freedom. Surely the very basis of civilization, the reason why the human species has advanced so far, is because we're capable of communicating our knowledge and experiences, not only to each other, but to future generations. Even animals find it necessary to guard their offspring from life's pitfalls. Pornography producers aren't doing this in good faith, genuinely believing they help mankind, especially now as addiction to internet pornography is widely studied. Perhaps in its initial stages, people genuinely believed that pornography educated people on intimacy, but authorities know that's a fallacy. No tube site makes genuine claims about education. The only claims are made about the shock, novelty, and escalating qualities of their wares. The sheer hypocrisy is incredible. As a society, we otherwise get uptight about school bullying and objectification of the human body, but compared with internet pornography, these problems are mere pimples. Numbers of those addicted climb to new heights each year, spending quality time with imaginary and illusory pixel people at the expense of their health, virility, energy, and time. It is by far the biggest killer in relationships, and hundreds of thousands of lives are ruined every year because they get hooked. Internet pornography producers don't advertise in the mainstream publications. They don't need to. Our biological urges lead us to the thresholds of their well-stocked harems, giving out free samples like the local drug dealer. Nowadays, the tube sites don't so much stock the wares as much as they encourage visitors to post content. How clever the porn companies show 18 plus warnings as the deterrent for underage users, though some don't even bother to do that. Internet pornography affects everyone at all ages. Their attitude always boils down to, we warned you of the danger, so it's your choice. Do they take any steps to verify age? No, that would discourage their customers. Of course, if age verification is legislated, they'll just find another country to operate from. Or they'll pay some elite to write about prohibition resulting in bootlegging and the creation of the mafia. Conveniently forgetting the question of why repealing prohibition didn't result in the reduction of alcohol-related casualties and the failure of law enforcement to control the mafia's growth after it was ended. We can address this differently by educating the younger generation. If they can step around cigarettes and alcohol while shopping, they can do the same with internet pornography. We're already seeing societal shifts like No Nut November and Coomer memes becoming mainstream. Getting addicted to porn is no more a choice than getting addicted to heroin. Users don't decide to become hooked, they're lured into a subtle trap. If they had a choice, the only users tomorrow morning would be adolescents to starting out, believing they could stop at any time if they wanted to. So why the phony standards? Why are heroin addicts seen as criminals, yet can register as addicts and get methadone and proper medical treatment to assist in getting off it? Just try registering as a porn addict. If you go to your doctor for help, they'll either tell you, stop doing it so much, try moderation, which you already know won't work, or they'll prescribe some medication to address your depression. Worse is the advice to go and find real partners. Seriously? Have they never heard of users who find porn better and do it behind their wife or husband's back? Some people just don't understand. Scare campaigns don't help users to stop. They make it harder. All they do is frighten users, which makes them want to watch even more. They also don't prevent teenagers from becoming hooked. Teenagers know that pornography kills their libido, but they also know that one peak won't do it. Because the addiction is so prevalent, sooner or later the teenager, either through societal pressures or curiosity, will try just one visit. Because free pornography has awful clips, it's likely that they'll become hooked. So, why do we allow this scandal to go on? Why don't governments come out with proper campaigns? Why aren't we told that internet pornography is a drug and a killer poison, that it doesn't relax you or give you confidence, but destroys your nerves, taking just one peek to become hooked? Why can't they enforce age verification by requesting registered credit cards, perhaps with a third party? MindGeek, owner of many of the major porn sites, a monopoly, is attempting to swindle governments into using their own proprietary age verification solutions. They'll let them do it. H.G. Wells' The Time Machine describes an incident in the distant future where a man falls into a river. His companions merely sit around the bank like cattle oblivious to the cries of desperation. Inhuman and disturbing, much like society's general apathy to the porn crisis. However, there is a wind of change in this society. A snowball has begun rolling down the hill, and it's hoped this book will help turn it into an avalanche. 
you too can help by spreading the message. As such, to ask, if you see anyone struggling using willpower or attempting to quit porn, kindly point them towards this method. However, the real task at hand is changing the narrative about pornography in general. Please consider making a habit that if you see online or even experience porn's normalization firsthand, your aim is to respectfully educate and free the people doing it. Occasionally, you might get a negative reaction by doing this, but sometimes a comment is all that's needed. As many have done before you, you can expect to receive messages from grateful people thanking you for their freedom. Section 31.8, a final warning. You can now enjoy the rest of your life as a happy non-user. In order to make sure that you do it, you need to follow the following simple instructions. 1. Keep the following page in your bookmarks and refer to it as much as you need. 2. If you ever start to envy another user, realize they'll be envious of you. You aren't being deprived. They are. 3. Remember that you didn't enjoy being a user. That's why you stopped. You enjoyed being a non-user. 4. Remember there's no such thing as just one peak. And 5. Never doubt your decision never to watch pornography again. You know it's the correct one. Chapter 32. The Instructions What follows is a copy of all the instructions relayed in the book. Number 1. Follow all instructions. Number 2. Keep an open mind. Number 3. Start with a feeling of elation. Number 4. Ignore all advice and influence that conflicts with this method. Number 5. Resist any promise of a temporary fix. Number six, get it clear in your mind. Pornography provides no genuine pleasure or crutch, and you are not making a sacrifice. There is nothing to give up and no reason to feel deprived. Number seven, don't wait to quit. Do it now. Number eight, make a decision never to watch again and never question it. Number nine, remember there is no such thing as just one peak. And number 10, never watch pornography again. 32.1 Affirmations What follows is a series of positive affirmations about addiction. I am free from the slavery of pornography. It's easy to ignore my thoughts about pornography. Bye-bye thoughts, bye-bye urges. Oh, there go my cravings. I focus my subconscious mind to overcome pornography addiction. Porn steals my time, energy, and vitality. Beating pornography gets exponentially easier day by day and in every aspect. I enjoy and value my porn-free, strong, happy, light, and easier lifestyle. If I look back and think about my progress, it gives me great joy and pride in myself. Every time I see other porn users, I get more motivated to see myself break that chain. All that pent-up energy is healing my body and mind. Then I can do more productive and challenging work towards my values and goals. My brain is getting back in the correct shape, getting exercised by me not doing what I was previously doing. Now that all my pent-up willpower is being used to handle lightweight stresses and strains of life. Great. I'm free. I'm no longer a slave.